School of Ladies Annie Smith I1. On a cold September morning, Emma Durkin is sitting on the train with her parents rumbling their way towards the big city. As is always the case in the fall, the landscape appears dismal. The barren brown land was visible from the train. The whole sky was grey, and it was drizzling a bit as well. In the distance, fog has shrouded all of the more pleasant sights on green fields where cattle are grazing. Emma is sitting in an eight-person compartment in first class. The seats are covered in dark burgundy upholstery. The walls and the door frame are made of dark mahogany, which lend a very elegant feel, and perfectly matches the upholstery of the seats. Emma is seated in the middle, her mother is by the window, and her father is sitting by the door. They are all sitting in a row as none of them wanted to sit facing rearward of the train's direction. As it is, Emma always suffers from nausea when she is nervous. Just like now. She is just sitting stiffly staring at a landscape picture hanging above the seat straight across from her which shows large oak trees on a lush hill with young picnickers gathered around. She looks at the picture enviously, as at the moment, she would rather have been in their place. This reminds her of a nice memory, but she brushes it away, not wanting anything to disrupt her anxiety. That can't happen now, she can't be daydreaming, this is reality and if she wanders, she might mess things up. They were quiet because they were already quite tired. They had been traveling since that morning. The truth is that it wasn't only Emma that was nervous, her parents were as well, especially since they could see how anxious their daughter was. Though they tried, they were unable to calm her down no matter how they attempted to. They had already tried the calm down, there's nothing to be afraid of, approach several times. But these were just cliches to Emma, and it was as if they had no meaning to her. The unknown was one of the most frightening things to Emma. The train's whistle finally broke the quiet tension and the train began to slow down. The train was braking for a long while before it came to a halt at a train stop. This made Emma even more nervous as she wrings her hands. She sighs deeply, finds breathing hard, her corset is tight even though she asked that they tie it more loosely on her. Emma wore her prettiest dress for the big day. A long ankle-length dress the color of butter with dark blue flower designs, and small modest lace adorning the neck and sleeves. Her fashionable little hat is also dark blue with white ribbon which goes really well with her special coat. The coat has a fur neck collar that is very attractive and produces an extremely good impression. The fur is a rarity, it has always been exclusive to older and wealthier ladies. As an exception, she has completely pinned her hair up in a bun, even though she doesn't like wearing it like this. She prefers wearing it only half pinned up with the rest hanging down in curls on her shoulders. Or she might wear it braiding it in various forms the way other young women her age would in that period. The bun was more typical of older women. She wasn't all that good at pinning up her hair. She never did like messing with it too much, and was always waiting impatiently for the lady-in-waiting to finish with it. Emma is a natural beauty, not noticeably striking, but truly a pretty girl. Her wavy long brown hair, brown eyes, and slender figure is genuinely feminine. An oval face that is slim and a snub nose that gives her an appearance of a charming young girl. At first glance, she seems like a modest, shy, and quieter type. They have arrived at a train stop in a small rural town. The small station is built of red bricks and decorated with flowers. There are potted geraniums in every single window which are so pretty and refreshing to see in the grey drizzle. Well, this is finally Becktown. This is the last stop. It's only another half an hour. Mrs. Durkin said relieved. But rather than having this assuage Emma, it didn't have a calming effect on her at all. She became yet more tense from this comment and her heart was pounding even harder. There were so many people getting off the train, and people were swarming all over the platform, but there were some people getting on the train. A thin man laden with baggage in his hands tried to pry open the door to Emma's compartment. Mr. Durkin jumped up right away trying to help by taking one of the man's suitcases from him. Two younger girls were standing behind the man both wearing identical dark green velvet coats and similar colored dresses, 
and their hats could be described as garish as the brim of each was adorned with a complete bouquet of flowers. The last person behind them was a plump, putting it mildly, lady who was dressed in a loud and completely purple outfit. Her dress simply forced one to look at her, which was most likely her goal. Thank you for your help. Are there four available seats here, asked the man. Certainly, come in, answered Mrs. Durkin. The man politely let the women go in first and he followed in last. Oh, this compartment is so dark. And what is the stench, asked the plump woman arrogantly. Emma's parents immediately took note of who they were dealing with, so no one took the comment personally. In fact, they were smiling to themselves. One could guess by her lively purple dress that you are not dealing with an ordinary person. She was as conspicuous as a peacock. Quite the contrary to Mrs. Durkin who was very reserved in both her manner of dress, as well as in personality. She is a very kind and sensitive woman who would go to great lengths not to offend anyone. The ladies made themselves comfortable sitting across from Emma. Let me sit by the window girls, said the plump woman as she immediately squeezed her way there. The thin man, like a humble servant, diligently put the ladies' luggage in the baggage holder above the seats. One of the girls, who was about 17 years old, around the same age as Emma, resembled her mother a great deal both in her face as well as her physique. The other girl was younger, only about 14. She was prettier and more attractive than the other girl. Sitting across from each other, the two families traveled in silence for a while occasionally stealing glances at one another. Not much longer Sarah before we reach your new school, offered the plump woman. Are you registering the girls now, too, asked Mrs. Durkin. Just the older girl, the younger one still has time and she's not as talented as the older one. She takes after me and the younger one takes after her father. The older girl did indeed look like her, but that is not necessarily an advantage. The girls resembled each other in the face, and their blonde brown hair was pinned to the side in the same way. Both had greenish blue eyes with a little bit odd looking chubby faces. She looked very similar, but the younger girl was still more attractive. Oh, I'm sure she's also a very bright girl but in a different way, said Mrs. Durkin trying to put a better light on it. And which school will she be attending? St. Mary. That's the best. The others have a very low level. And you? We're at St. Helen. St. Helen? St. Mary is the best. Emma was starting to get very embarrassed that they had chosen such a poor school. It's naturally very important that you choose a good school. One judges a lady by the upbringing she had. Every girl's school tries to attain to raise the smartest and most sophisticated young ladies, who will one day be the wives of very influential men. Every girl's school has their own debutante ball, and if a school has a poor reputation and is judged to be inferior, then talented and prestigious young men won't participate in the ball. There were many schools at the time such as this, training young ladies with many debutante balls, so it was imperative to choose wisely. Emma's parents preferred not to get involved in a pointless argument like this. Mrs. Durkin ended the conversation by once again looking out the window at the dismal autumn landscape. Emma dreaded this, she didn't want to stay there, and didn't want them to make a sophisticated young lady out of her, especially now after the revelation of what a terrible school this is. She had wanted to stay at home with people she is comfortable with. Besides, she already had a love. Well before reaching their stop and before seeing the sign for the capital city, everyone started grabbing their things and taking the luggage down from the baggage holders. This caused Emma to have a repeat attack of nerves. She just sat and wished they could keep traveling on, but she knew she had to get off the train, no matter how much she didn't want to. She was barely able to gather enough strength to stand up. Her legs felt very heavy, she picked up the smaller of the suitcases in her hand, and started to walk out after Mr. Durkin. Everyone got off the train with their bags. There were so many people at the station, Emma had never even seen this many people in one place. It was a huge station, the largest in the country. 
A lot of people were waiting as not everyone was traveling. There were some who were waiting for relatives or friends. Young women and young men, older people, real aristocratic men and women with their servants, who were carrying their bags after them. Emma was impressed with all the different kinds of people, and started to feel small among them. Everyone was moving around and going about their business so confidently, and yet Emma was dealing with great fear within herself. This was her first time in the capital. Mr. Durkin was in front leading the way because people were pushing and shoving and not paying attention to one another. Mrs. Durkin brought up the rear, and like someone brought up in the old days with a real French governess, was totally shocked by the situation. How rude these people are. Just amazing. Emma just waved it off, this indecency didn't surprise her in the least since she had heard this and that about the capital from her young friends. What was most surprising was that girls here weren't required to have an escort when in men's company, and could even go to horse races. Slowly they made their way through the crowd, and finally were able to leave the station through the huge entrance. Mr. Durkin tried to get a carriage right next to the train station, but this wasn't too easy, either. Many other people had also come from different rural towns to register in the well-known girls' schools. This story took place during the end of an era when rank and a name meant something, and those who had this were deeply respected. Emma's story began around the end of the 19th century. They finally managed to find a beat-up black horse-drawn carriage that people weren't milling around, but only had a young man trying to negotiate with the driver. They started walking towards the carriage, and although Emma found this to be suspicious, her father couldn't be convinced otherwise. When they were almost there, the young man waved angrily, and left the driver. Good day. Could you take us to St. Helen's girls' dormitory, asked Mr. Durkin of the driver. The driver looked at him surprised. He seemed to be a very old man, and based on his torn and patched clothes, he must have been a very poor man. I can take you, he answered with certainty. Emma didn't understand what the driver was so surprised by. She always noticed these details as the small details always caught her interest. Mr. Durkin, however, wasn't occupied with that, he was very happy and busily packed all the luggage in the rear of the carriage. The driver never got off his perch, patiently waiting until Mr. Durkin finished with the packing. Though this was now something that Mrs. Durkin didn't like, since she was a very polite lady in these sorts of matters, and paid close attention to propriety. Don't you dare give him a tip. What kind of thing is this that he isn't helping, she whispered to her husband. This is how they started on their way to the school being pulled by a not too great and a quite worthless looking grey horse. Emma was angry and upset at the thought that she would arrive at her new school in such a rickety and tasteless carriage. She was hoping that no one would see her when she got out of the carriage. All the while, she was trying to survey the town, looking around, but couldn't really pay attention. Pretty and colorful Victorian buildings, old cobblestone streets where the hooves of the horses pulling carriages are clip-clopping in rhythm. But Emma was paying closer attention to passers-by and was looking at many young ladies. There were some she could tell were very wealthy wearing very expensive dresses that were the newest fashion from Paris, and that clung to their bodies accentuating their figures, but hung below their knees with a train that fanned out. Emma had never even seen dresses like that, she found this new fashion a little bit embarrassing. But the young lady looked very attractive in it and confident. Emma also very much wanted to be self-confident. Someone who always knows what to do, and most importantly, what to say. Although she was relaxed around people that she already knew well, she still wasn't too talkative. If she was faced with talking to someone where she wanted them to like her, especially if she met a nice gentleman, that simply rendered her speechless. They arrived in no time at all, and Emma was surprised at how close the school was to the train station. The driver dropped them off right in front of the school's gate. It was in front of a pretty but tarnished grey multi-story building that had a big brown two-winged door. Emma and her parents alighted from the carriage. Mr. Durkin once again handled all the baggage taking them down from the back. 
after he put all the luggage on the sidewalk, he paid the driver. How much will that be, sir? Five penny. How much? That's very expensive. Mr. Durkin was annoyed. Emma and Mrs. Durkin were also very disappointed that they found themselves in such an exasperating situation and that they had run into the kind of person that took advantage of their ignorance making them look like fools. Emma was imagining that the driver was hoping for a big tip thinking he could get even more money out of some naive and well-intentioned small town people. Mr. Durkin just waved it off. He was always able to move on from awkward situations like this. But not Emma. She believed this was a bad omen. How could she learn good manners here? In a town like this? Why is everyone coming here? The questions were swirling around in her head. And her aversion grew. It was apparent that Mrs. Durkin's confidence was a bit shaken, disappointed in the town, but didn't dare say anything about this so as not to discourage her daughter even more. After a short wait, a doer faced older woman opened the door. She was wearing a very drab brown dress, her corset barely tied because her waist could barely be seen, and strands of her graying hair were hanging from her bun. Before they could say a word, she said, I'm Miss Bird. I'll show the girls' room. Come this way. Emma and her parents hesitatingly started following Miss Bird. It was apparent that they were very exhausted from traveling and the shock that the driver caused. But they wordlessly followed the sullen woman. However, Emma continued to be very upset and was extremely doubtful about the whole thing. She had a hard time comprehending someone like Miss Bert could end up in a school like this where they teach sophistication to young ladies. But Emma's parents were very devoted, and who only wanted the very best for their child. Though they were sorry that their daughter was going to be so far from home, they knew it was in Emma's best interest. In a small town, there isn't as much opportunity to study, nor to find a good husband for her. They were hoping that their daughter would find a mate worthy of her and the best future for her here. As they stepped into the entryway, Emma was amazed at how high the ceilings were, and then she was admiring the banister along the stairs with its ornamental and carved oak. On the left was a big door with both of its wings open to a huge room with hardwood floors and beautiful crystal chandeliers. This would be the school's ballroom where they held the bigger events. To the right was the immense stairway leading upstairs. And so they started following Miss Bird up the big wide stairway to the attic. The walls were decorated with the pictures of famous princesses and countesses. As they got upstairs, there was a room immediately to the left. They entered the room. The room was indeed big and bright, though there was only one big round window. The white walls were decorated with rose-designed wallpaper. The floor was polished and beautiful and made of oak strip flooring. The beds were lined up in two rows across from each other three beds and then another three beds with wrought iron frames. To the right of the door stood the dressers leaned up against the wall, one of which had a bigger mirror hanging above it. In the center directly across from the door was a big table sitting under the window for reading, writing letters, but also could be used for putting on makeup in the evening as well as morning. It was a lovely and cordial room. You're in luck. You're the first to arrive so you can choose your bed, said Miss Bert and promptly left the room. Now see how nice this is, said Mrs. Durkin encouragingly. But Emma was sulking because she was afraid. She was resentful of her parents that she had to stay here. She was afraid, and she couldn't imagine what would become of her here, how she would live her everyday life here from now on. There will be five other girls here as well, how will she study, rest, where will she go to have privacy? Emma hesitated trying to decide quickly which bed to choose. She couldn't find one that appealed to her more than the one that stood out to her from the first, which happened to be the one on the right side at the far end by the window. She'll be able to get lost in her thoughts and daydream here a lot just like always. She walked over to the bed she chose, and put her bag on it. Will this be good? I don't know. As Emma stood hopelessly lost in her thoughts beside the bed. Yes, this is the one I would have chosen, too. This is the best bed, said Mrs. Durkin enthusiastically. 
I can't take this. I don't want to stay here. Please don't leave me here. Please. Emma blurted out near tears. Oh, what are you afraid of, replied Mr. Durkin. You'll see, it's going to be great here. A lot of girls would be glad if they could be in a place like this. Emma just stood stiffly staring out of the room's big round window. What she saw was indeed beautiful, Athoff it wasn't the most elite girls' school, as there certainly were better than a state institution where the poorest attend. These girls' schools didn't accept a large number of girls, therefore it was very difficult to get in. Each one had its own focus. There were those that emphasized learning foreign languages, others focused on delving into literature, and this school concentrated more on the arts, music and dance lessons, which were Emma's favorite. The view from the dormitory room right above the school was indeed beautiful. It looked down upon the pedestrian zone in the city, which was bordered on two sides by wonderfully huge Victorian houses with many windows. There were also lots of stores in the pedestrian area, as well as two churches across from one another with a big square in front of them. There was a lot of bustling with large numbers of people walking around day to day. At night, candelabras and lights filtering out of houses lit it up. She was imagining what it must be like at Christmas, which was Emma's favorite holiday, when Christmas trees are standing in the bay windows of homes and decorations, ornaments and lights strung up all around the pedestrian zone producing such a warm and cozy mood. You'll see, you'll grow to love it. Mr. Durkin started upon seeing his daughter's despair. After two weeks here, if you still don't like it, then you can come home. You can handle that much and then we'll see. And at that moment, two young girls showed up in the room's doorway smiling and chatting with each other. Good afternoon. Hello. Greeted one of the girls. Her name is Susie. She's a very pretty girl and she's so self-confident. She has long light brown hair like every young lady during that time. Her hair is hanging down partway with the remainder pinned and braided at the nape of her neck that was very flattering on her. She has big brown fawn-like eyes. Kind and friendly, the kind of person that gets along with everyone. Her dress is eccentric, even out of place the way it prominently shows her breasts, but she is attractive and fashionable, although it's clear that she comes from a poorer family like the other girl. Her name is Clara. A rather plump girl, but she has a very smiley face with a slightly pointed nose. One can tell that she comes from a well-to-do family. Her fancy dress is made of burgundy velvet, the high-necked collar is adorned with beautiful expensive lace, and a bustle on the rear of the dress padded with a small cushion making her waist look much slimmer. In contrast to Susie, she didn't have much self-confidence. She's very shy and is the kind of person who smiles a lot more from embarrassment rather than being in a good mood. She's a cute girl, too. If one looks more closely, if she weren't quite so chubby, she would be quite a beauty with her long blonde hair and sparkling blue eyes. Having stopped in the doorway, the girls hesitated as they looked around the room. Emma had almost relaxed hearing her father's comments, but when the two young girls appeared, she was scared once again. She saw that they came into the room as if they had been friends forever. After they introduced themselves to each other, Emma couldn't contain her curiosity. Do you know each other? asked Emma. We met downstairs in front of the dormitory where we were saying goodbye to our parents, and we struck up a conversation on the way up to the room, offered Susie. This made Emma a little more at ease because the last thing she wanted was for her to feel like an outsider. She would run all the way home. But fortunately, they didn't know each other that well yet, either. And as she was watching poor Clara's blushing face, she became more at ease that she wasn't the only one who was so embarrassed. I'm choosing this bed, exclaimed Susie as she placed her suitcase on the bed directly across from Emma's. That's okay, isn't it? Clara. Susie asked. Of course. She wouldn't have dared answer any other way as she continued to smile with her red face. Can I come here? Clara asked Emma. But of course. Emma was glad that such a modest and sweet girl will occupy the bed next to her. 
The girls sat on their beds and then an awkward silence followed with everyone just looking around the room. Emma sat with Mrs. Durkin on the bed while Mr. Durkin stared out the window. Emma was starting to get embarrassed that she felt so helpless, she was the only one with her parents here but she didn't want to hurt their feelings by mentioning it to them, especially not in front of others. What a nice room. And the town too. This dormitory is in a very good location. Mrs. Durkin broke the uncomfortable silence. It really is very nice. We'll take so many walks around here. I'm so curious, said Susie enthusiastically. You need to get going now, mother, Emma cut in. Yes, we need to go before it gets dark. As they started gathering their things, they took a last comforting glance at Emma. Take care of yourself. Mrs. Durkin said quickly and a bit emotionally, and they were already out the door. Emma sorrowfully watched them leave. Then there followed a few minutes of silence in the room. Where are you from? Emma asked the girls. I'm from Bradford, answered Susie. I'm from Welltown, said Clara. And you? Susie asked Emma. Milton. Well, then you came the farthest. I don't even know how one can live so far from the capital. Susie's comment took Emma by surprise and felt they were rather insulting. In fact, the comment made her feel so bad, she didn't even know what to say offhand. Just as the three girls starting talking and telling each other where they were from, another two girls walked in the room. They looked so much like each other, although one of them was thinner, she was very thin and her teeth protruded a little but it wasn't all that bad. Looking at her straight on she had a really cute face. She seemed like the restless and jumpy kind. Her name was Kate. Both of them had blonde brown hair and longish faces. The other girl who seemed to be less determined was named Dora. She had somewhat of a squarish face and a bit of a hooked nose, not the nice little snub nose, but she was a charming girl, too. She had her hair pinned up in a bun just like Emma and her style of dress was very similar to Emma's as well. So, Emma took an immediate liking to Dora. Maybe their sisters, thought Emma to herself. Must be nice, she thought enviously. Do you know each other, asked Emma again. We met on the train as we were coming from the same direction, and as it turned out, we actually live near one another, said Dora as she occupied the bed next to Susie a bit hesitatingly. Kate didn't like the bed next to Dora which was on the left near the door, so she chose the bed next to Clara on the right side. The girls put their bags on their respective beds. Kate opened her bag and was looking for something in it, then she plopped down on her bed as she noticed the others sitting calmly. Now there are five 79-year-old girls awkwardly starting to get to know each other each sitting on her own bed. Kate finally jumped up off the bed and started unpacking her bag, and then the others followed suit. It seems Kate is either a very busy girl, or she just can't sit still for very long, thought Emma to herself. I need the biggest cabinet girls, because I have a lot of clothes, if that's not a problem, exclaimed Susie. Everyone was surprised by this and no one said anything one way or the other, so without anyone opposing this, Susie claimed the largest cabinet for herself. The getting acquainted time had been going on for an hour or two and the young girls were just about finished getting settled when a short girl with dark brown wavy hair, brown eyes, and a gloomy and unfriendly face walked in. Hello. Have a seat. That's the only bed left. Said Emma who was now bolder. But there was no reply which surprised the girls. What's your name? Where are you from? Continued Emma persistently as she could be very curious. Vivian, answered the girl shortly and bluntly as she laid down on the bed with her back to the girls. This had a chilling effect on the air in the room. But at least Emma was thawing out a bit gaining some self-confidence as time passed. She was starting to get familiar with the girls. Although she was bothered by Susie, she quickly determined that the girl had a selfish nature that tended to suppress others. But, of course, she does this in such a way that no one would hold a real grudge against her. One could get a bit of a complex with her. 
somehow she always finds a way to make herself look good, while humiliating the other person. Emma had never met anyone like that before and didn't know quite how to handle her, because she sometimes was offended by Susie's comments. Clara proved to be a good listener with a kind nature. Emma wasn't exactly satisfied with her appearance as one could tell by the way the poor thing held herself that she was very inhibited. She always scrunched over. Dora and Kate appeared to be the same in personality. Both were nice with a quiet nature. Dora seemed to have a more tolerant personality, while Kate was way more certain and excitable. And when Emma glanced at Kate, it seemed to her that Kate didn't like Susie's behavior, either. Emma concluded in her own mind, although she would never say it aloud, that while Susie was the prettiest, Emma was the second most beautiful of the group. She could actually be the prettiest, but she wouldn't want to dress in a way that's so out of place. Emma was more conservative in areas like this. She wouldn't have been able to wear such a bold, if not inappropriate dress, she wouldn't have felt right in it, but it looked good on Susie and she could get away with it. She was able to carry herself well in that dress something that would never work for Emma, but it really didn't bother her. Emma thought that boys wouldn't like this, it's so transparent and ridiculous. In the middle of unpacking, Emma suddenly thought about her home, her old life, and her best friend, Anita. And her secret love, Alex. But before she could get lost any further in her thoughts, there was a knock on the door. Miss Bird came in. Young ladies. Come with me. I'll take you around and tell you the dormitory rules. You are required to strictly follow the rules, because if you do not, you can immediately go home shaming your parents, exclaimed Miss Bird. The girls began to follow Miss Bird and went all around the dormitory. There were a few other rooms on their floor with six beds, and a rest room with a tub and vanity table. There was a big library or lounge where the girls could do their needlework. And there was Miss Bert's room which was very small. Her bed barely fit in it. The rule is the following, said Miss Bert in a strict tone. Wake up time is six o'clock in the morning at the latest. Everyone gets dressed and makes their own bed. Everyone is to be seated downstairs in the dining room by 6.30. You have 20 minutes to eat breakfast. Anyone who is late will not get breakfast. Classes begin at 7 o'clock. Protocol will be your first class tomorrow with Miss Giff. You will have literature every day, French class, music and dance twice a week, as well as piano and violin. You'll know everything that is befitting to a real young lady. Lunch is exactly at noon also in the dining room. Anyone that is late will not eat. After lunch, there is reading and studying in the library room until 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Then you are free for two hours until 6 in the evening. You are strictly only allowed to go outside with an escort and forbidden to go out alone. If anyone is caught walking outside alone, you will be dismissed from school. We've had this happen. Dinner is at exactly 6 o'clock. Anyone that is late will not eat. After dinner is bath time with lights out no later than 8 o'clock. You are not allowed to wear makeup, wear provocative clothing, behave inappropriately, shout, or be loud. Anyone who brings shame upon our school will be summarily dismissed, to say the least. Our school has been here since the founding of the first girls' school, and our alumni include people with rank, noble women, and wives of counts. We take pride in our good reputation, and we can't allow girls to be students in our school that are unworthy of this. There have been many noble women who have attended this school, and we cannot allow the name of our school to be besmirched. The reason you are here is because your parents want you to become educated noble women. We will prepare you so that you are the best possibly equipped for a favorable marriage. You can prove this at the debutante ball. Now let's go have dinner. Miss Bird concluded. Emma could hardly believe what Miss Bird had told them, and she couldn't imagine that so many young women had passed through here over the years. It wasn't realistic to think that all of them ended up with husbands that were great catches. Unfortunately, that's just not possible. 
Emma was afraid that she wouldn't be able to see this whole thing through and that she would not become a real gentle lady. Maybe the problem is with her, but of course, there are always ones who are lucky and some are unlucky, regardless of whether the school has a good reputation or not. She could only hope that she was one of the lucky ones. Although Emma was much more relaxed now, she still couldn't seem to swallow a bite of food at dinner. The dining area was in a truly beautiful room, a typical Victorian dining area, with a big tarnished looking table in the center and craftsman made padded chairs all around it. There was a huge and amazingly beautiful crystal chandelier hanging above the table like the one that was in the ballroom as well. Two modestly dressed parlor maids served the girls their meals. Dinner didn't particularly look so great, but portions were generous. The bread had a strange taste to it, it was drier than Emma was used to, but the butter was delicious. There was even jam, but she couldn't determine what kind of fruit it was made of. The tea was extremely strong black tea, but Emma was so thirsty by then, she drank two glasses of it. After they finished dinner, the girls returned to their room and were milling about trying to decide who would be first to use the bathroom and bathe. Meanwhile, the maids were bringing up buckets full of hot water for bathing. Susie broke the quietness of them sitting around. I think I'll go take a bath first, or would someone else prefer to go first, asked Susie happily. Everybody just nodded that she should go ahead, they would rather wait. Emma didn't really feel at home yet sitting on her bed a bit ill at ease, trembling a little from exhaustion, and envious of Susie being so carefree. Eventually it was time for lights out, but in spite of the fact that Emma was very exhausted from the long trip and all the uneasiness, she still couldn't sleep. The place was still very unfamiliar to her, and she couldn't believe or grasp what was happening. Emma didn't sleep all night. She was homesick and all she could think about was that it would be impossible for her to get used to this place and to call it home. She determined that once the two weeks were up, she would definitely go home. Morning came. Emma had been very much waiting for it as she didn't know what to do with herself, although she was so tired that she could barely get out of bed. Good morning, exclaimed Susie enthusiastically and well rested. The other girls just groaned in reply as they probably weren't able to sleep that well in this unfamiliar place, either. The day began quickly and they had their first class with Miss Giff. The benches were in two rows in the classroom. Emma walked in last while the others had quickly sat down next to each other. Emma ended up in the front sitting next to Vivian. Emma was really not happy about this. Dora and Kate were naturally sitting next to one another, while Susie sat next to Clara. Miss Giff had a smiling face with a rather long nose, and she seemed to be middle-aged. Her upper body was fat and she had legs like matchsticks. She looked funny and was unusual looking. Good day ladies. My name is Miss Giff and I'm going to be teaching you etiquette and proper behavior. Hopefully, here you will learn how to get the best possible husband for yourselves as this is the most important thing, Miss Giff started the introductions. We will have the biggest and most meaningful ball that you could ever attend. It will be life changing. She exclaimed enthusiastically. You will have to look and behave there like a queen. You will shine in the most beautiful dresses and everyone will be watching you first with the introductory dance. You will be noticed there, asked to dance, have conversation, and if all goes well, you will get an invitation from an eligible young man. There is a short waiting time after the ball while school is still in session when young men may come calling for you, that is, for your company. The country's most influential, most upscale, and wealthiest people and their sons will be coming to look for a wife. Those who don't find a good husband here, well, ladies, she said thinking, I guess you're left with the small towns. But a magnificent and exciting thing is awaiting you. The beautiful, sparkling and huge ballroom, the music, and the gowns. If you learn how to be true young ladies, how to move, dance, eat, speak, the most seducing and sophisticated tools of enticement, then it's doubtless that you'll be successful. A lot of girls have come through our school, two became princesses, several became the wives of very influential foreign diplomats. 
and I could go on. You still have a lot to learn, you have a long and difficult road ahead of you, said Miss Giff delightedly. Miss Giff's statements totally captured the girls, and they only now truly understood why they were here. They were completely under her spell, even Emma. From this point forward, they were consumed with and gained strength from this, that there is in fact, a reason to see this through to the end. The girls were excited with anticipation wondering what the future held for them, that is to say, the biggest ball of their lives. And the waiting part is the most exciting part of the whole thing, no matter what fairy tale may happen that they hadn't even thought of. They could even become princesses, anything could happen, and it was for certain that something will happen. Of course, Emma had some apprehension hoping she wouldn't mess up with the dancing, perhaps with speaking, or choosing the wrong partner, and she would end up not finding a good husband for herself. Especially after the things Miss Giff said about this being the one opportunity and you can't fail. The next class was piano which Emma loved and she considered herself good at it, too. This was the reason her parents had chosen this school. A rather young man taught this class, but he tried to appear serious with his hair combed to the side and with his not very fashionable eyeglasses. Girls. First, I'd like to hear what level each of you play so that we can gear our lessons to that. Who would like to start? The girls hesitatingly looked at each other. I'll start, said Emma boldly, because she knew she was good at this. After she finished, Emma was waiting for a compliment, but all she got was, hmm, all right. Emma was surprised as she really did play the piece well and only made one mistake. She had played better than this, but otherwise, she was pleased with herself. As soon as Emma stood up from the piano, Susie had already taken her place. The teacher pushed his glasses down a bit watching Susie. Susie played the piece and made mistakes three different times. Excellent, said the man charmed. Emma felt terrible and didn't know what to think. She was disappointed that she was overconfident, but it was also very obvious that the piano teacher had eyes for Susie. The first two weeks went by very quickly and it didn't even occur to Emma that it might be better if she moved back home. She was feeling much better about being in the dormitory with the girls, and even Susie occasionally said some nice things, although Emma tried not to concern herself with her. Although the first week was extremely tiring and emotionally difficult, Emma quickly got into the swing of things. She got over her fear of the unknown as it was now not so unknown and unfamiliar. She was beginning to feel more at home in her room and she was also getting to know the city better. At first, it was just the pedestrian zone of the city center and its green parks. It was strictly the only kind of places that a gentle young lady could go. The girls took many walks together. Emma almost always went with Clara and Dora. Emma not only began to accept her situation and feel more at peace with being here, but she knew that in order for her to realize her dreams, she must become a prestigious young lady. Emma was secretly in love with Alex. She even kept her feelings secret from Anita, her best friend back home. Emma dreamt that if they made a smart, educated, beautiful and alluring young lady out of her, then she could conquer Alex's heart, who would fall madly in love with her and marry her. Emma's dream always ended at this point, she never thought about what would come after this, but she didn't care. She only cared that Alex would finally tell her he loved her. Emma met Alex when she was helping to organize the mayor's ball in their town for the benefit of soldiers stationed there. Anita had introduced Alex to Emma there at the ball, because they had already known each other through their families. Emma was immediately attracted to Alex who was so direct with her, as if they had always known each other. He was kind and funny, joking a lot with Anita, who always just waved him off because she was a more serious young lady. But Emma appreciated the jokes. One could see that she was attracted to Alex. But unfortunately, you couldn't say the same about Alex. He was nice to Emma, but nothing more. It's not likely that Emma raised any serious interest in her on Alex's part much to Emma's dismay. That is why Emma still kept her deep love for Alex a secret from Anita. Truth be told, 
it bothered her a bit that Alex and Anita know each other rather well. She would have felt humiliated if she had revealed her feelings toward Alex before he might have made the first advances toward her. But Alex's kindness always gave Emma hope. She was torn but looked at the situation optimistically that Alex's kindness towards her tends to show that it must mean something. A while back when the three of us went on a picnic by the lake, Alex held the sun umbrella only over me, as Anita didn't deserve it, because only gentle young ladies do. It wouldn't do to have the sun burn my pretty white skin because it wouldn't be appropriate for a gentle young lady to have brown skin like those that work in the fields all day. And I was the only one to whom his family offered some apple wine, Anita being left out once again, if you ask me. She knew that she couldn't win Alex's heart with her blushing and ungraceful answers. But this is how it is when she's around him, she just freezes up and smiles stupidly. She hasn't even been able to show that she too can be funny and how comfortable she feels reading those fantasy novels, or those crossword puzzles that Alex also enjoys. They fit together so well and Alex doesn't even know. They have actually never been able to have a serious discussion together, for some reason, it's just never happened. When the three of them are together, it seems they always pass the time playing silly little games that Alex and Anita participate in most. Emma thinks that this distracts Alex from getting to know her properly, because if he were to get to know her, he would realize that Emma is meant for him. Now she could only hope that Miss Giff's classes would help in this, and that she could win Alex's heart. Emma often dreamed about this, and many times she seemed sad to others because of this. If Emma had known this about herself, surely she would have shown more strength outwardly, as who would want a boring and reticent girl. One evening while the other girls were also dreaming of the ball, they told each other what each one truly desired in a husband. Each girl, while crouching at the foot of their bed, confided in quiet whispers what love is. With the exception of Vivian who was pretending to be asleep. I've already had a suitor. The local mayor's son was head over heels in love with me, Susie told the others bragging. Really? How nice for you said Dora surprised. I don't think I'll ever have that, she continued regretfully. And why isn't he courting you any longer? asked Emma, the curiosity driving her crazy. Because it's too. Susie started thinking. I wasn't really in love with him and his family wasn't really well to do. I met with him a few times during the summer, we walked a lot in the park, once we even went boating on the lake, and then I thought I wouldn't really like for him to be my husband, and we didn't meet any more, related Susie. Is that it? How can you brag about that? Courting never even came up between them. Emma thought to herself upset. It's one thing that he isn't well to do being the mayor's son, but they didn't even talk about things and then just didn't meet any more. Emma thought suspiciously about the story. Given this much, I could brag about Alex as well since we went on many walks and danced together at balls, but I couldn't say he was my suitor, unfortunately. Susie is exaggerating again as usual, Emma pondered and thought then that she could reveal her secret, too, or at least a part of it, so that Susie wouldn't think too much of herself. I had a similar situation with a young man in my life that I met with many times, but I wouldn't think that I could call him my suitor. Emma offered a little hesitatingly. You? Asked Susie surprised. Yes. What are you so surprised about? Replied Emma offended and angrily got in bed. Her nerves on edge had her tossing and turning for a long time as she felt humiliated by Susie's being taken aback in her disbelief. As if she was the only one who could have a suitor. Susie always manages to make the other person feel bad about themselves. Emma kept replaying Susie's tactlessness, but she wouldn't have dared get into a conflict with her as that was something Emma always avoided. She was afraid that she would be left all to herself, and the other girls would take Susie's side. Susie was good at things like this. Look at the comments she makes to poor Vivian, even though she hasn't hurt anyone. After all this, Emma didn't want to relate the whole story and reveal her feelings. It would be inappropriate and she would feel awkward, 
especially in front of Susie, for her to know that she was completely in love with a boy that she didn't even know how he felt about her. Given how the other girls could sense Emma's anxiety, they didn't dare ask further questions about her friend. Everyone quietly relaxed in dreams of their own suitor. One afternoon the girls were in their room talking when Miss Bert walked in the door. Miss Clara, Miss Vivian, you have mail. And with that, she handed the girls their letters. Clara excitedly opened her letter smiling and with a healthy blush on her face as always. Vivian read her letter by turning away from the others. No sooner had she opened the letter, but that she crumpled it up, angrily tossed it into the trash bin next to the door, and rushed out of the room. This had everybody looking up, even Clara stopped reading her letter. The girls looked at each other blankly. Vivian is so strange. Said Dora. What could have happened? Emma was very curious. Susie stood up from her bed, walked over to the trash bin, and removed the wrinkled letter. She slowly opened it up never saying a word, reading the contents of the letter with surprise. Well, what is it? What does it say? Emma's curiosity got the better of her. Tell us already. Kate was also very excited. I can't come home, I'm sorry. Susie read the quite short letter. That's all, asked Kate. I wonder who could have written it. Wondered Emma. Poor Vivian. I don't feel sorry for her at all. Noted Susie in a cool tone. I, on the other hand, have good news to share ladies. Said Clara with great joy. This weekend my family will be hosting the farewell to fall picnic that the town organizes each year and this time it's going to be on our property. My parents just wrote to tell me this and also that they are inviting all of you. You will come, won't you? But of course! exclaimed Kate. The girls were very enthusiastic. Emma not quite as much since she always felt ill at ease at someone's home, but she was very happy that she could be with the other girls as she really liked their company, with the exception, of course, of Susie. Emma didn't want to offend Clara with the fact that she wasn't as happy as the others, so she pretended to be very excited about this. When the girls arrived in Clara's hometown, there was a very elegant deep green colored carriage waiting for the girls at the train station with two beautiful black horses and the carriage driver wearing a very nice uniform. Emma already knew that Clara's family was very well off, but never imagined they were doing this well. She was very surprised by the welcome, but was very much enjoying the luxury of it all. Upon arriving at Clara's home, Emma was rendered speechless. She had never in her life seen such a huge castle, and she was so pleased that she had been invited to such a grand place. The other girls were no different. The views were amazing. The two-winged brown building highlighted on a vivid green lawn in front of which stood a round fountain the likes of which were to be found in so many places these days. How many rooms are there in your house, Clara? Asked Emma. 102, she replied modestly. When they entered through the huge doors into the castle, Clara's parents were already waiting for them. They were very nice including all of their staff. All total there were about 15. A couple of maids went over to each girl and took their suitcases upstairs going up the beautiful and spacious stairway that split into two directions halfway up. We're happy to meet our daughter's girlfriends. Make yourselves at home. Makes yourselves comfortable in your rooms and get some rest after your tiresome trip until dinner tonight because tomorrow will be a tiring day as well, said Clara's father by way of greeting. Yes and almost immediately afterwards we have to travel back to the dormitory, said Clara a bit sadly. Each girl got their own room. Emma didn't feel tense as she usually did in a new place. She was enjoying the luxury and especially being waited on. The walls in her room were decorated with bright wood paneling and light blue flowered wallpaper above, and there was a beautifully carved fireplace in the middle of the wall. There was a huge four-poster bed in the middle of the room. Emma jumped on it with joy. She admired the finely crafted furniture in the room, the cabinets, nightstands, chairs, and tables. It was clear that they were all genuinely valuable antique pieces. 
The view was beautiful as well since the castle stood on a hill. Her window looked out onto the backyard where they had a truly adorable fish pond around which they had made a walkway, and next to that was a maze which Emma really loved. Come Emma and I'll take all of you around before dinner. Clara said stepping into the room. Emma and the girls were happy and giggling as they followed Clara, who told them some very interesting things about the history of the castle. There was a very big living room area that was called the Blue Room because every carpet, rug, the curtains, the sofas, and the coverings on the armchairs were blue, and a very beautiful painting of a woman hung in the middle of the wall surrounded by smaller paintings which were just the usual landscape paintings. Clara was quiet for a short while as they stepped into the room. The woman in the painting was charcoal black with almond-shaped eyes that mirrored a deep sadness, but was so enchanting yet had something so secretive about it. She is my great-grandmother, said Clara proudly. Very beautiful! exclaimed Emma. It truly is! said Susie admiringly. Her story is very interesting, continued Clara. What was it? Tell us! Kate was also starting to get very curious. The reason she is here for the most part hidden, and apart from the others is because my great-grandfather wanted to banish even her memory, but my grandfather saved this one picture of her and it was only after my great-grandfather's death that he dared to put it up. But even he put it here as it can't be with the pictures of the other family members. But why? What happened? Asked the girls. Because she brought shame upon the family and back then this was considered a great sin. What did she do? Asked Emma excitedly. All right, I'll tell you, but don't tell anyone. Oh, tell us already. Kate exclaimed. She left my great-grandfather because she had a love affair with the stable hand's son and ran away with him. What? How did they have an affair? And where did they run off to? Asked Emma very excitedly wanting details. My great-grandmother never wanted to marry my great-grandfather. She didn't love him. She only married him because her parents forced her to. When their children were born, she became even more unhappy. But my great-grandfather was in love with her and wanted to cheer her up and that's why he bought her a stud and a stable because she loved horses. He hired a stable boy, too, who took care of the horses and they went out riding a lot together. They spent more and more time together, and when they found out that she had become pregnant by the stable boy, they ran away that very night. What? They even had a child? Asked Kate with surprise. Yes, and my great-grandmother ran away and left her other children behind here that she had with my great-grandfather, and they never saw her again. That is truly scandalous. Offered Susie rather tactlessly. This is the family's sensitive area, no one likes to talk about it, and fortunately, people have forgotten all about it. It wasn't easy back then. I'm so sorry, Clara, said Emma sympathetically. Thank you, but aside from that, whenever I come here and look at the picture, I dream of a love this grand, too, said Clara, and the girls started giggling. Emma thought about Alex upon hearing the story and it broke her heart. They had dinner that evening in an amazing huge ceiling dining room. Servants were coming and going around them bringing courses where one was more delicious than the next. Clara's parents were sitting across from each other at the end of the long carved oak table. Susie, Dora and Kate were all in a row next to one another across from Clara and Emma, and there was an empty place setting next to Clara. Everyone was very hungry and the girls were devouring the food when a very elegant looking woman, who very much resembled the woman in the painting, walked into the dining room. Esther! You're late again! cried Clara's father rebuking her. Oh, stop it, this is just a family dinner, Dad, said the lady in an offhand way. Girls, this is my older sister Esther, said Clara. Emma almost inappropriately said that Clara had not mentioned having an older sister before now, but just as she thought that, she realized that she had not talked about the fact that she has two younger sisters. Emma started to feel a bit tense in Esther's presence as she seemed to be a spoiled and confident girl, as well as having a sharp tongue. 
she was always intimidated by people like that as they could put one in awkward situations. Shocking that Clara would have a sister like this, the two girls were night and day. Clara resembled her mother more who always kept to the background smiling. So what's the school like, girls? Asked Esther in a sassy way. Esther doesn't believe in these girls' schools. You know, she had a governess that she learned from, explained Clara. A ball isn't enough to get a marriage proposal, I think that's insufficient and it's not a matter of education, but rather depends on luck. And there are balls afterwards where one can also meet other men, Esther offered her opinion which Emma agreed with and made her feel better that it wasn't just the one opportunity they had. There were still opportunities to find a good husband. I think it's possible because the point of having these balls is so that the young ladies can choose their mates, said Susie with determination which surprised Esther a bit. Or rather the gentleman, Esther corrected her. And what sort of rich young men are there these days that are husband material? Esther. That's inappropriate. Interrupted Clara's mother. What I've heard is that there isn't a single baron or count looking for a bride for himself, therefore there aren't any offerings within the aristocracy. Esther. Clara's mother again cautioned her. There are still plenty of rich young men. There are the various owners of big factories, those are even richer than the aristocrats, Esther continued. That's for sure. Said Clara's father disapprovingly. After Esther offered her opinion, she ate her dinner, and everyone continued eating in silence. Actually, uppermost in Emma's mind even now was when she would see Alex again. After dinner, everyone retired to their rooms rather quickly to rest. Although the girls were quite exhausted, they were excitedly waiting for the following day. Emma was curious as well, though her thoughts were mostly occupied by Alex. The next day at dawn, the day of the picnic, they awoke to a beautifully sunny day, but it was quite cold which Emma didn't handle too well as she was rather cold-blooded. The girls could hardly wait for the picnic to begin, but Emma was no longer that enthusiastic. She was glad that she was in such a beautiful place with servants all around. But she felt as though this meant nothing, only Alex's love would mean genuine happiness to her, and so she couldn't really enjoy the moment and be carefree in enjoying the event of the day. The servants were more nervously running about taking out copious amounts of trays full of pies to the tables outside. This was the most appropriate food to have at such a big picnic as it was just as delicious cold, if not more delicious, than freshly baked. People started gathering with picnic baskets in hand, which probably all had a bottle of wine in them since a picnic isn't really a picnic without wine. On the hill with its beautiful green lawn, there were smaller and bigger groups with their blankets spread out measuring space to see who was going to sit where, as everyone wanted to sit in the most distinguished spot. That's what the girls did as well. On Clara's advice, the girls spread their blanket on one of the hill's higher spots because one could see everyone well from there. As was usual for her, Susie was fanning herself in a most pretentious way with her fan. Even though the sun was shining brightly, it wasn't at all warm out. Nevertheless, all the girls opened their sun umbrella so as to protect themselves from the sun who are they over there, Clara? Asked Susie pointing at two young men who happened to be staring at her. Those are the doctor's sons. Doctor? Susie asked disappointed. And I believe they're not even 16 years old yet, said Clara. The girls burst out laughing. And who are those women? Asked Emma pointing at two really beautiful and elegant women. One of them is the governor's wife, and the other is the mayor's wife. They were quite beautiful and young but they conducted themselves with such self-confidence and they were cool in their manner just like true queens. This is what Emma wanted to be like, serious and cool, not a shy young girl. They could see from a distance that Esther started talking with a rather good-looking man who was appropriate in age to her. Clara also was only able to hazard a guess as to who that could be. Emma was acutely observing how easily and relaxed Esther was in the man's company. While walking she would give him a flirty smile which was easy for anyone to see that the man liked. 
Emma was pondering whether she would ever be able to behave like that in the presence of a man, but she couldn't really imagine it. The girls had a lovely time at the picnic, and Clara regaled them with more stories about her family, but to Susie's great disappointment, they didn't meet a prospective husband here. However, there was more competition with many available young girls there. They had a great time and at least they ate delicious food. The weekend at Clara's went by quickly and to the great regret of the girls, they were already on their way back to the dormitory early the following morning. Two Miss Gifts class happened to be about meals which bored the girls, as this wasn't the most interesting topic, especially when it comes to finding a husband. All Miss Gift did was keep listing the rules one after the other. A lady must not eat a lot in the company of a man. You should always leave a little bit of food on the plate. It's not appropriate to talk a lot while eating. And a true lady never drinks more than a glass of champagne. Girls. Are you listening? Asked Miss Giff irritably when she saw all the bored faces. Emma was just then thinking about the Christmas ball coming up soon where she would see Alex again after a long time. Time went by quickly as they got ever closer to the debutante ball, but first there was winter and Christmas, which Emma loved so much and was anticipating making her forget all about the ball. Emma wasn't at all interested in the ball right now. She could hardly wait to finally go home and to show Alex her new gentle lady ways which will make him see her in a new light after this. She was only hoping that she could actually put to use the things that Miss Giff had taught them in school and that she could truly shine like a queen in front of Alex. It was so beautiful this time of year, the landscape, the town, and the pedestrian zone where they held the big fair. Emma and the girls went out into town almost every day, naturally with a chaperone, and they could browse and choose among truly beautiful jewelry, shoes, hats, scarves, fabric, and many other gift items. Emma bought two snow globes, one for each of her younger sisters, as well as a music box so she wouldn't go home empty-handed. But truth be told, Emma loved these items, so she was actually buying them a bit for herself, too. She just didn't know what to get her parents, but it was a great excuse to visit and browse the fair each day. The most beautiful and cozy sight that Emma had ever seen was when the lights came on at night and the light from the star on top of the Christmas tree standing in the square in front of the church lit up. Since this happened after lights out, she could only admire the sight in secret from the window of the dormitory. And she thought of Alex. It was so amazing the way the Christmas lights filtered out of the windows of homes, as if it were a fable. If only it were always like this, Emma wished to herself. At night, the cozy quiet and during the day just the opposite with all the hustle and bustle that made things magical. Emma loved this time of the year. One day when Emma and Dora went out for a walk with Miss Bird, they stopped in at a tailor's. Miss Giff had asked Miss Bird to inquire of the tailor about the new fabrics, the newest styles, and of course, about prices with regard to the dresses for the ball. Miss Bird wasn't too thrilled about the task, but Miss Giff, who loved to be involved with these things, had already traveled home to her family for Christmas. How interesting that Miss Giff, who teaches young ladies the tricks to conquering a man, never married. She must have been quite pretty when she was younger and must have captured the hearts of many men. Emma and Dora were all the more enthusiastic about accompanying Miss Bird to the tailor, as this was another way for them to walk through all the Christmas goings on yet again. The tailor's name was Mr. Begg, who was a long-time acquaintance of Miss Gifts. It was because of this that the ball dresses for the school's girls were usually made in his workshop. There was a boy and two young girl assistants. He could use the help, especially at the beginning of the season, and most importantly, because Mr. Begg was indeed quite old and was working ever more slowly. In addition, his eyesight was very poor now, but fortunately, he was always up to date on the newest fashions. Mr. Begg's shop was almost in the city center. There was a small passageway behind the church on a cobblestone street in a central location, and yet it was a bit hidden away. His display window was a bit old-fashioned with a big plate glass, and the green paint on the wood frame was now peeling off. The big iron store sign above the entrance was quite rusty, 
and when the wind would swing the sign a little, it would squeak. Three steps led up to the entrance. As one stepped inside, a big, spacious, huge ceilinged space greeted customers. Precisely in the center across from the entrance was Mr. Beck's counter where he kept big rulers and lots of fabrics. There was a big mess on the table, but it could be that he had been measuring something. Hanging from the hooks on both sides of the walls on top of each other were fabrics in all kinds of colors, prints, and quantities. There was a big curtain behind the counter separating the workshop area from the store, and one could hear the quiet whispering of the sewing apprentices and their fiddling around. When they walked through the door, the girls were entranced by the sight of all the beautiful material. However, Miss Burt's disappointment was apparent that she was not thrilled by the huge selection, as this meant she would not be able to finish as quickly as she had hoped. Mr. Begg was speaking with two men, an older sullen man and a younger man with an unblinking and serious-looking face. He looked like he was a bit pale with very white skin and white blonde hair. He was rather eccentric-looking. As soon as Miss Burt saw them, she quickly turned to the girls and said, Dora, Emma. This is one of the textile factory owners and his son. Behave appropriately. The girls just smiled at each other and said hello respectfully. Thank you for your patience, ladies. I'm right in the middle of taking an order for some fabrics, said Mr. Beck very politely. Miss Burt just smiled and nodded as if she were embarrassed. The girls were shocked as they had never seen Miss Burt smile and that the others won't believe them when they tell them. There was no doubt that Miss Burt felt awkward since the task she got was not her cup of tea. And Miss Burt didn't pay much attention to the way she dressed, not like Miss Giff. There was a bit of tension in the air and it was totally quiet in the shop for a few minutes, almost as if Mr. Beck didn't dare speak, then he quietly said to the textile factory owner, I can't pay that much, I can't afford it, he said almost whispering. If you don't want to buy good quality material, I can give you poor quality cheaper, answered the textile factory owner loudly. Adam, take the fabric back to the car, he loudly ordered his son who just stared at him. Please wait. Let's discuss this, let me recalculate, said Mr. Beck humiliated. It seemed to Emma that the textile factory owner was very obnoxious, and she felt sorry for Mr. Beck as well as the boy. He was rough, loud, and unfriendly. Miss Burt didn't want to look their way either and stared out the window at the street instead. Because the girls didn't want to make things any more awkward either, they started looking at the fabrics without looking at each other. There were so many beautiful pieces, plush, brocade, velvet, but Emma couldn't imagine a dress for herself out of any of these since she preferred simple things, and didn't like exaggerated prints. She wasn't daring in these areas, either. A strange fabric with small cherry blossom designs caught her eye as she looked at it in wonderment as she had never seen a design like this before. That's authentic Japanese silk and design often used in the emperor's court. The price however is quite steep. I could offer a similar quality that costs less and has a younger look too, because let's face it, this design looks strange on a young lady, said Adam stepping over to Emma while his father waited for the tailor's answer. Emma was very surprised by the fact that Adam spoke to her and she felt confused as she looked to reply. Yes, the design isn't good, replied Emma curtly. Adam, we have to go, said his father gruffly. Other than the tiny blush, it really wasn't apparent at all that his father's offensive behavior bothered Adam. They left quickly. Emma, Dora, and Miss Burt just stood there in shock. My lord, what a character. What kind of people are these, remarked Dora quietly to Emma. Poor thing. That's awful, said Emma with pity. Girls, let's get back to the reason we came. Behave yourselves. Miss Bird cut in. The girls then quickly moved beyond what had just happened and continued looking at the fabrics. All the girls went home for Christmas. Everyone was excited because it was the time for festivities in the big cities which were the biggest and the most beautiful of the year. And every city had their own special Christmas ball. As Emma was sitting on the train making her way home, 
it began snowing. She couldn't have been happier and full of more hope, she was in such a good mood. After all, Christmas is here, it's snowing, and soon she will be able to see Alex at the big Christmas ball. Mr. Durkin was already waiting for Emma at the train station. By the time she arrived, there was a lot of snow on the ground and it warmed her heart when they neared her home as they rode in the horse-drawn sleigh in the snow. It wasn't a prominently big or magnificent house, rather it was simple in its style, very modest, a two-story family house where the holiday lights filtered out through its windows. Emma's sisters and her mother welcomed her warmly. When she walked through the door, they threw themselves around her neck. Go up to your room, I'll bring you some hot tea and you can rest a while. The seamstress is coming this afternoon so she can measure one of the dresses on you that you'll be wearing at the ball. We have to hurry with it so it will be done by tomorrow, said Mrs. Durkin. But mother, I thought we were buying a new dress, exclaimed Emma in total despair. This is just the Christmas ball, not your debutante ball. Emma angrily rushed up the stairs to her room, she was in total despair that her mother had cancelled out all her expectations and that she won't be as attractive on the night of the ball as she had imagined. She was afraid she wouldn't appeal to Alex this way. She had imagined that she would buy a truly feminine gown for this occasion. Well, not too provocative, but certainly not little girlish because Emma's dresses were more like this. They were attractive, but they weren't real womanly dresses since she was still too young for that. Emma liked bows on a dress, especially those that decorated dresses at the waist in the back because that accentuated her attractive figure but not in a scandalous way. But these dresses with bows won't work in sweeping Alex off his feet. So Emma was trying to figure out how any of her dresses could be magically transformed into a feminine gown. And then she remembered her dark blue dress, an old favorite of hers, because the color looked so good on her and it made her look a little bit older, too. When the seamstress arrived, Emma was waiting for her prepared. The bow needs to be removed from the waist of the dress and we need to take some in at the waist so it will look more slender. We need to raise the seat of the dress, and please cut the train shorter in the back. I don't like it when I have to carry it after myself. Please, said Emma with determination. Won't these be a lot of changes, Emma? And I'm shocked as I find this quite daring, said Mrs. Durkin perplexed. Absolutely not. It will be ready by tomorrow, won't it? I believe so, the seamstress replied with uncertainty. Oh, and we need to tailor it to be a little more tight in general, Emma further directed. Then let me quickly get the measurements and I'll get going. I hope I have enough time as this isn't a small task young lady," said the seamstress ending the conversation. Emma was anxious all evening that her dress would be ready and that everything in general would go as she had imagined. Tossing and turning in her bed she pondered what she would say to Alex. She was afraid that if Alex rejects her, or rather if he doesn't feel anything towards her, then he won't court her and won't propose to her and then the whole thing would remain a dream that had played out in Emma's head. But Emma felt more excitement than fear. Since Alex is her friend and they already know each other, if they start talking, then she'll know how to get onto this delicate topic so they can finally open up and confess their feelings to one another. Emma often daydreamed how this conversation would go. She always hoped that Alex would confess on his own how he can't go on with the feelings stirring within him and that he's crazy about her. But if Alex is shy and reserved, then how can they start to open up about his feelings, because it's certainly possible that Alex loves her, but won't tell her because of some other reason. Perhaps it's something that Emma wouldn't have even thought of. But she always got stuck at one point in her thoughts and she could never finish the scene and it was always at this point that she got scared that maybe Alex really doesn't want to say anything resembling what Emma would so much like to hear. The day of the Christmas ball arrived and much to Emma's great joy, the seamstress came by early with the virtually new dress. When she was finally able to try it on and looked in the mirror, she was very happy. It looked beautiful on her. She had become a very attractive adult woman. It was perfect and just exactly the way she had dreamed it. 
When she thought of how Alex's jaw will drop, she blushed and recoiled a bit. I wonder if I'll be able to get away with wearing this. Won't I be laughable in this? My other dresses were much more comfortable, Emma thought to herself. You're very much a woman, Emma. It looks wonderful. Very much so. Said Mrs. Durkin thoroughly delighted. As usual, Emma's parents were late in getting ready, and as a result, everyone was already there once they arrived. In fact, they had already begun the introductory dance. Emma was a bit angry and shaking from excitement when she entered the room. She felt as if everyone was watching her, and somewhere among them is Alex, so she must pay attention to her every move. She first noticed Anita and hurried over to see her girlfriend whom she had not seen in a long time. Hi Emma. You're beautiful. That dress. You look so different. I haven't seen you in so long, so much has happened I can hardly wait to tell you, but first tell me what's been going on. How is the school? Anita asked inquiringly with a broad smile. Oh, thank you, but don't exaggerate. Emma said shyly. The school is very good and it's in a nice place. But what all has happened? You've made me so curious. Guess what? I'm engaged. Guess who it is? What? Who is it? Emma asked holding her breath. Alex. She replied, and Emma froze. Oh no. But Anita never even noticed as she happily continued talking. He came to visit us this fall and we both felt there was more between us than just friendship, we had missed each other and he asked me out and then he told me how he felt and proposed to me. Isn't it wonderful? Because the last thing Emma wanted was to dampen her spirits, she forced a smile on her face all the while her whole world collapsed within her. She was in shock and her thoughts were completely jumbled. She had imagined many things including the many ways in which Alex would turn her away or reject her although in a romantic or noble way, but she was not prepared for this. And this is the worst possible thing of all. He loves Anita, this is horrible. Anita. She kept repeating to herself. This is inexplicable. Emma thought herself to be much prettier than Anita. But apparently this isn't enough. I'm prettier and more fun too, as she was trying to find an explanation. She was wondering if the problem was in fact that she was boring because she's always daydreaming and her imagination occupies much of her time and she doesn't say much. It's better being in Anita's company as she chatters away not wondering in the meanwhile about things. This is what Emma was thinking about and she hated herself for it. She was upset with herself. How could she even think that Alex or anyone else would love her like this? The other girls are much better company and she's just a little girl who dreams. Her heart was broken into pieces and she felt such pain that she wanted to scream, but she couldn't. Well. Emma finally said with difficulty searching for words. You never said. Hi Emma. Alex said in greeting suddenly stepping next to Anita and putting his arm around her. Did you hear the news? I don't even recognize you, you've changed. You look great. Said Alex while smiling at Anita. Yes, I heard. Congratulations from the bottom of my heart. I hope you'll both be very happy. Emma only just now noticed that Alex didn't really notice her, not now or even before. He was completely involved with Anita the whole time. She politely exchanged a few words with them at the party, all the while shaking from the shock. Then to her great relief, she left the ball and started for home with her parents. As far as Emma was concerned, this was the end of the world. She didn't think about anything, she was empty. For a long time, she didn't think about anything at all and nothing mattered to her. She couldn't eat, sometimes she couldn't sleep, but when she did, she then couldn't bring herself to get up. When it dawned on her that what Alex feels towards Anita is what she feels toward Alex, she became envious of her girlfriend. For the most part of each day, Emma just stiffly stared straight ahead, but this wasn't like when she used to daydream as that was something she actually enjoyed playing with her thoughts that her love will come true. 
This was now different and her sorrow showed. She looked as if she had seen something frightening and was numb. That's how Emma was. She couldn't really eat at the family Christmas dinner as she couldn't have swallowed a single bite. She didn't even care about her present and only opened it out of politeness. She didn't talk to anyone and just stared straight ahead, she didn't hear the others, and wasn't really even aware of what was going on around her. Everyone was celebrating, but as far as she was concerned, it wasn't Christmas anymore. She spent the majority of the time in her room. Her parents noticed the change in her and were worried, but didn't question her. On the way back to the train station, Mr. Durkin was alone with Emma and tried to gently pry information from her as to what was bothering her. Is the school okay? Are you getting along with everybody? There is a girl named Susie. She dominates everybody and... I don't know, I don't like her. It's so awful with her. She's always the best in everything. Don't concern yourself with her. There are always some people everywhere that are hard to get along with, Mr. Durkin said relaxing thinking this was the only reason his daughter was sad. Emma didn't want to confess the real reason because she would have been embarrassed. The return trip back to school threw Emma a little bit out of her melancholy. She started talking with a quite elderly woman on the train, or rather, the woman was talking extensively about her youth, and Emma was listening with curiosity. The woman was describing to her how she had fully believed that she was doomed to be an old maid, and that this had made her cry an awful lot. But in the end, when she had completely given up and had accepted her situation, she met a man. It had finally come to pass and she married very late in life, and she didn't believe for a minute that she would find someone where love would bind them together. It seemed strange to Emma that the woman spoke about all of this with such peace and with a smile, as if this weren't such a terrible thing. The fact that she couldn't find a husband and she was never in love, and yet she can still smile. Emma had a difficult time believing this of herself because she felt that she would never smile again. Despite this, Emma always did enjoy listening to stories such as this, as at least then, she wasn't mired in her own thoughts. She remembered when she was a little girl, her mother would tell her shocking news about young girls whose suitors had let them down, or humiliated wives whose husbands had left them. These were what fascinated Emma the most, and were most shocking. She was often afraid that she would one day be the town gossip's main character like this. She shuddered at the thought of remaining an old maid, but also dreaded marrying someone for whom she felt nothing. She was confused, although she hoped that in time, these things wouldn't bother her and she too would be able to smile just like this woman. When she returned to the dormitory, Emma was on the verge of tears. The other girls were upbeat and were recounting their experiences over Christmas. Emma tried to keep a straight face in front of them because she didn't want them to find out about anything. The girls were already used to Emma being quiet at times, so they didn't notice anything different about her. Of course, when Emma would have a particularly bad day, they sometimes would ask her if there was anything wrong, but Emma always said no, there wasn't. It did get better with the passing of some time. After a few days, she started to get back into the old grind and tried to forget this bad dream. One afternoon, Kate and Emma went for a walk, although Emma preferred going with either Dora or Clara. Clara always entertained her by talking about her family's history, so she was a little afraid that the walk would prove to be boring. But neither Clara or Dora were free. Dora had to urgently write a letter and she was very secretive about it, which made Emma all the more curious who Dora would be writing to because it was certainly not to her family. Actually, she had never been alone with Kate. But then Kate started telling her a very interesting thing about Vivian. Listen, Emma, I'm going to tell you a secret. But don't you dare tell anyone. Started Kate. My lips are sealed, swore Emma. When Dora and I went home for Christmas, my older brother came to meet me at the train station and I introduced Dora. Then this very wealthy gentleman walked over to my brother, a Mr. Cork, who was so familiar, and by the way, very good looking although a bit older. Kate started thinking, 
probably married. Oh, well, doesn't matter. My brother knows him from the chess club. Anyway, he was saying that when he heard which school I'm attending, though it's not appropriate to talk about this, but he had heard, that the daughter of a rather scandalous family is attending this school. He couldn't think of the family's last name, but he knows that the father is an alcoholic and is known to be a big gambler, that he owes money to a lot of people including himself, and that a soldier ran off with one of his two daughters, and then left her pregnant and on her own. He enrolled the other daughter in this school in the hopes that she would find a rich husband for herself, and that this would pay off all his debts and cover his expenses. Oh my lord, how embarrassing. Kate. What should we do now? My family was so stunned after hearing this story that they seriously considered withdrawing me from the school. No, tell me they won't take you out of the school. I begged them that I want to stay. I don't want to miss out on the ball since that is my biggest dream. They finally gave in and this news will probably never be made public because that would ruin the school. The letter. That letter she got was more than likely from her sister who ran away. I now understand why Vivian doesn't talk to anyone, Emma pondered on what she had heard. Well of course. I'd be embarrassed if I were in her place, too, answered Kate. When they returned to the dormitory, Emma was completely mesmerized by the story, but it at least put a little color in her painful and drab every day. No one had really spoken much at all to Vivian, but after this, everyone avoided her and ignored her as if she were invisible. Only Clara spoke to her briefly now and then, but Vivian kept to herself so much that she didn't appreciate it. With that in mind, Clara then decided that she would no longer bother her at all. Every girl was waiting for the day when they can choose their ball gown in which they can sparkle and shine. The day finally arrived and the girls started out with Miss Gift to Mr. Beck's old tailor shop. The six young ladies were fussing with so much energy among the fabrics, they didn't even know which ones to hold, to try on, or which design to choose. Even Vivian was caught up in the excitement and it showed, although she tried to hide it. Naturally, Susie looked at some very ostentatious dresses because she wanted to be the center of attention with the most striking dress. Miss Gift tried to give the girls some direction. Always pay attention to the crinoline that stiffly keeps the lower part of your dress belled out. You must not forget that your dresses are wider at the bottom. You wouldn't want the same thing happening to you as it did with the director of St. Mary's, who not forgetting about her dress, got stuck in the door, Miss Gift giggled. Or we wouldn't want a tragedy like last year that befell the Countess of Bradford that caught her dress on fire as she carelessly walked by a candle and they couldn't help her. Awful, just awful. As Susie was Miss Gift's favorite, she encouraged her to look for a dress that was a bit bold in being low-cut telling her how beautiful she would look in it, although we wouldn't want it to show too much. If I still had an amazing figure, I too would be flirting with this dress, though back then, we were only allowed to wear white. But Miss Giff, you shouldn't complain, you're very attractive. Susie said flattering her. Oh my word, Susie. Your slobbering is just awful. Kate told Susie angrily who ignored her. Susie, of course, chose from pastel colors that her age group could wear. A dress that was the most pretentious, she chose a dress that was a shade under a light red and a style that was virtually skin tight on top and that pushed her breasts up quite a bit. Emma was smiling to herself on Susie's selection, because she thought that an intelligent and honorable man wouldn't like this, and that in fact, Susie was doing herself more harm than good. If she's too conspicuous, no one will approach her. A light bluish green brocade piece caught Emma's eye. But honestly, her enthusiasm in focusing on a dress was only half of what it was when she was preparing for the Christmas ball before her meeting with Alex. So she decided on a shorter sleeved dress that at the very least reached her elbow since wearing white gloves was required. The dress was completely hugging her body from the top down to her waist with a V-cut neck. Although she found it to be too simple, there was something lacking with regard to her interest in the dress, and she didn't concern herself much with it. 
she thought that if Alex never took a second glance at her when she was wearing the most beautiful dress of her life, then this means so very little. She didn't even bother to really look at what the other girl selected, but Susie's dress was so over the top, it was hard to not take notice of it. But the other girls truly enjoyed this day. The introductory dance was a waltz. Every girl had to have a boy as a partner that they would dance the pair part with. When the six boys entered the room, the girls were very excited. Emma liked one of them at first glance and there was also a very nice looking one among them, too. Miss Giff had him stand next to Susie. To Emma's delight, her partner ended up being the boy that she had liked when she first saw him. His name was Mart. He had brown eyes and light brown wavy hair, and even though he wasn't the most handsome, he was still a good-looking boy, attractive, cocky-faced, but with a nice and smiling nature. He was always very courteous with Emma. They liked each other and they truly were sorry when the dancing came to an end though there wasn't really an opportunity to get to know the other person, and it wouldn't have been very appropriate. As soon as they exchanged a few words, the teacher warned them immediately. But there were many cute and funny moments, when Emma stepped on Mart's foot a few times, or when they started out in different directions, or when they mixed up the dance steps. Mart was always so nice and patient with Emma. But Emma was so embarrassed when she did something wrong. She later realized that she enjoyed these hours the most and would have enjoyed them even more, if she hadn't allowed herself to be so melancholy. The boy was on a lower rank in society than Emma, but Emma could tell that his kindness was more than just respect, and she was very flattered by this. She was filled with self-confidence that there is a man who regards her as a woman. She even flirted with the idea that Mart would be the best suited to her. He had a lot on the ball, he was talkative, funny, kind, but unfortunately, was below her in society ranking. And Emma wouldn't want to end up like Clara's great-grandmother. She wouldn't be able to handle the shame. Even if she fell madly in love with Mart, she might not be able to take that step even then. But these were just silly thoughts. Mart wouldn't do anything either, for all we know, he may already have a fiancé. Emma was starting to regret that when this was over, there would be no more rehearsals. Sometimes the road to the goal is more exciting than the goal itself. As the time of the ball grew closer, the girls were a bundle of nerves. They were very anxious and burdened. There were more and more dance classes, and Emma felt that the more she practiced, the worse she got. She was clumsy and awkward. She was afraid that she wouldn't remember the dance steps and would freeze in front of everyone. All the girls were envious of Susie as she danced very gracefully and was so fetching. The pace at school was getting more strained, and the excitement was apparent even on Miss Giff. Girls. We do not stand too closely to the man while dancing, not that your dress would allow it, Miss Giff giggled, and we let him lead because a real lady is never in a hurry, always graceful and dainty and leaning on the man. The waltz. The most beautiful dance in the world. If you waltz nicely on the man's side, success is a certainty. Life is like that, too. And a last piece of advice, as you already know what is appropriate, but there is one more important thing. A secret recipe, you must find the way between kindness and being unconcerned, because men desire to conquer a woman, but we have to conquer them, too. I know this is hard, but you will understand and you will be true gentle ladies if you succeed at this. Emma didn't really understand what Miss Giff was thinking about and she was a little confused, but she hoped that it wasn't too late. If this is successful, everything will work out, and she'll be able to maximize all the things she learned here. The main rehearsal was held the day before the ball. Everyone's gown was ready by this time, and everyone danced their introductory dance just the way they would have to do the following day. Miss Giff was quite anxious and tried to hold one last lesson for the girls, but wasn't able to manage it. The girls were surprised by this. Strange, that Miss Giff is anxious given she's done this many times, and it's not even her big day. Miss Giff's confusion didn't have a particularly good effect on the girls, and they looked at each other with some apprehension, 
but they only saw excitement on each other's faces that no one could conceal. Ladies. We're at the end, the time has come. Don't forget what you've learned, nor the order of the dance, either. Always keep it with you, you can always write down which dance and with whom you would like to dance, and this way there won't be any mix-up, and you won't find yourselves in an awkward situation. Pay attention to the fact that the square dance follows the waltz. Self-confidence is the most important thing, and someone who knows everything also has self-confidence. And keeping calm and cool that I spoke of yesterday. Good luck. This is what Miss Gift tried to relay as her last words of encouragement with greater or lesser success. But Emma still didn't completely understand what Miss Gift said. If she didn't have the secret recipe, then was it all for naught? Then was her learning about manners and all those many rules for nothing? None of the girls were able to sleep the night before the ball. All Emma could think of was whether she had any chance of meeting the kind of boy who might be able to make her happy and make her forget the pain that Alex caused her. She even thought that if she were able to meet the kind of boy who was good-looking, rich, and kind, then she might even be able to make Alex jealous. She could only hope that all this would come true and then she could kill two birds with one stone. Not only would she find happiness, but it would also be gratifying. If she were happy, then Alex would see and notice what she is really like. 3. The day of the ball arrived. From the morning on, the girls were feverishly getting ready, there was a tremendous hustle and bustle. All the chambermaids were helping the girls one after the other with the most fashionable hairstyles piling and pinning their curls on top of their heads. Only Emma and Kate asked that their hair be let down on the nape of their necks in a braid. All of them had buns that were truly queen-like. The dresses looked magnificent on everyone, they sparkled and shined like princesses. They had never been more beautiful. Emma truly felt like a queen, and she regretted a bit that she hadn't pinned all of her hair up. Susie's hair looked very nice all pinned together on the top of her head. Clara's dress looked really good on her too, even though it was hard to find one that looks good on her figure. Though the peach color didn't particularly suit her white skin and made her look a bit pale, but she still looked splendid in it. Even Vivian forced a bit of a friendly smile on her face on this day. The girls were very excited and Emma could barely contain herself she was so afraid. Their dance partners were awaiting the young ladies at the top of the stairs so that they could escort them all the way down to the ballroom. Mart was rendered speechless when he saw Emma. Everyone stood next to their partner and were quietly waiting for Miss Gift to signal them to start. They stood in silence. Emma was terribly anxious taking deep breaths so as not to faint. Fear overtook her once again and they had never tied her corset as tight as it was now. She was concentrating on not passing out. Mart saw how nervous she was and he was politely encouraging her that everything was going to be all right. They could see from upstairs that a lot of people had already gathered together and invitees were still continuously arriving. Among them were many people of rank and wealthy young men and their families. I heard that yesterday's St. Clarence's ball didn't go particularly well, and that many of the people invited didn't show up. Our invitations were sent to all the mayors. Perhaps they will all be here. Kate said elated. Well. Maybe your friend will be here. 2. Susie. Emma suddenly remembered. But Susie didn't respond. She was as pale as a white wall. This seemed strange to Emma since Susie was always so self-confident. It wasn't at all encouraging to see that even Susie was this nervous. Then Miss Giff appeared and was admiring the girls a bit teary-eyed. She smiled but didn't say anything. She motioned to them and they began to head down the stairs toward the ballroom. Everyone was mutely silent as they headed toward the big room. Miss Giff stopped them in front of the door. Emma was shaking a lot and her palms were sweating. Any other time she would have been embarrassed by this, but right now she didn't care that Mart could feel her shaking and her sweaty palms. They were waiting in deathly silence in front of the doors to the ballroom. Then all of a sudden, both wings of the doors opened slowly at the same time, and everyone made sure they were in their places as the pairs walked into the room. 
Susie and her partner went in front, followed by Emma, Clara, Kate, Dora and Vivian with their partners. It was dark with only a few candles giving light above the dance floor, but one could see there was a huge crowd encircling them in a semi-circle. Emma didn't dare to even look up, her heart was beating so hard she thought it would jump out of her chest. There was complete silence until the last pair walked in and they closed the doors behind them. Then the music broke the silence and on the fourth beat, fortunately everyone started dancing. As the first minute passed, Emma's heartbeat was back to its normal pace, and it only seemed a moment that she had been in the spotlight. As they were spinning around and around, she became a little dizzy as everything was spinning with her. She was enjoying herself and enjoying dancing with Mart who was holding her so firmly that the dizziness didn't even bother her. She began smiling as her dress was breezily spinning together with her. She felt so light, she thought she would float away at any moment, and only Mart's firm hold on her kept her on the ground. They successfully danced the waltz without any mistakes exactly the way they were supposed to. She let Mart lead while she was light and graceful and she didn't miss any of the steps. As soon as it was over and they bowed, Emma was very relieved. She had never felt this way in her life. It was so good to feel relief. Though it's true she had never been so afraid of anything before, but she was finally over it. That moment was wonderful. After they bowed, Mark kissed her hand, and with slightly sad eyes said goodbye to her and wished her well. Emma was also sorry that Mart will no longer be a part of her every day, and that she hadn't appreciated his company more. As everybody bowed, the lights came on, and the crowd began to applaud. The girls looked around with broad smiles, and at that moment, they were very happy. Emma was shocked to see that the crowd was filled with women, but fortunately, they were older women and not younger girls who would have been competition for the girls at the ball. It was obvious that these women were prospective mothers-in-law and curious old women. Emma and Susie stopped and stood close to one another, and almost immediately, an amazingly handsome and charming man approached them. Ladies, you are gorgeous. Which one of you should I kidnap? I'll be offended to my very core if you won't dance with me. Said the charming man who with his over-the-top style and self-confidence immediately won Emma over. Sir. Emma will dance with you. I don't dance with strangers. Said Susie boldly. You haven't even introduced yourself. Oh, how true. I am Tom Hart, pardon me. Now will you dance with me? We'll see. The night is still young. Flirted Susie changing the tone of her voice. Emma only smiled hesitatingly feeling like an outsider to the conversation, but she really liked this guy Tom. Just as she was trying to think of what to say, another young man walked over to them. He wasn't as good looking as Tom and it was apparent that he didn't have as much confidence, either, he was a more modest and quieter boy. Let me introduce, ladies my best friend, Brad. Emma liked Tom very much. But she just didn't know how to have him pay attention to her, and she was afraid that he liked Susie better. You see? I'm not a stranger anymore. Now you even know my friend. May I ask you to dance? Tom turned toward Susie. Emma was filled with despair, but only smiled. She felt very humiliated and very helpless. I don't mind, let's. Replied Susie, and with that, they started for the dance floor while smiling at each other. Emma and Brad stood there wordlessly for a moment, and then Brad finally broke the silence. The dance was really nice. Thank you. Emma didn't really know what else to say. Could I perhaps ask you for a dance? Oh, yes, of course. They then headed for the dance floor as well. Emma sensed that Brad was a really kind, nice boy, but quiet and shy like her. This isn't the type meant for her. She wants someone like Tom as conversation wouldn't be so hard with him. Sometimes she glanced over at them and saw how jovially they were conversing and wondered what they were talking about. How does Susie manage to talk this much about nothing? She tried to communicate some with Brad, and poor thing, he was struggling, 
too, but it was hard for them to open up to each other. The conversation was a bit forced. This room is so beautiful. Said Brad. I think so, too. It's the most beautiful that I've ever seen. They didn't get beyond the outskirts of propriety. Then everyone finished the dance and the two couples stood back next to each other to talk. Susie never stopped talking and Emma noticed that Brad also found Susie to be very entertaining. It was no use for Emma to think about contributing to the conversation. She would have loved to have been able to say something enthralling to get Tom's attention, but she couldn't think of anything. She could see that Brad was struggling with the same dilemma, except that his attention was toward Susie. Susie and Tom were guiding the conversation, and it always kept coming back to one thing, what a good wife is like. Emma simply didn't want to say things that were commonplace that everyone knew anyway, and Miss Giff had said, that it wasn't appropriate to voice flowery clichés, which wasn't Emma's style anyhow, but Susie could get away with it. It made her look very good. There are so many girls nowadays without morals. I don't know where this will lead. It's so depressing. Wives don't respect their husbands, and they're not involved with raising children and with running the house. There are fewer and fewer reliable women, said Susie in her spiel. She did manage though, to win the attention of the boys as they were nodding in agreement all night hours on end. So true. You took the words right out of my mouth. You are very smart, said Tom fascinated by Susie. Emma was angry that someone could be so taken by such a cliché and no originality. But it may still be better than not saying anything at all. Would you like to take a walk with me? Tom asked Susie. You mean tomorrow? I mean right now and tomorrow, too. I like walking in the yard at this time of evening. Tom stretched out his arm. It was apparent that Susie was very happy. They nodded at Emma and Brad, and started toward the open door leading out to the yard. Emma was not enjoying herself and she no longer wanted to stay in Brad's company. She somehow felt that she simply could not get into Brad. She thought she might still have a chance to find a proper gentleman, but she could tell that Tom had already stolen her heart. Brad, please forgive me, but I'm a bit tired already, so I think I won't stay much longer, said Emma. She wouldn't have known what else to say anyway. No problem. I'm glad that I met you, said Brad politely because he was very polite, but perhaps he was relieved now, too. Emma left Brad and slowly walked to the other side of the room while looking around. She saw that Vivian happened to be talking to a rather ugly-looking young man with a big nose. Kate was in the company of a young gentleman and it looked like they were enjoying being with each other as well. And then she noticed poor Clara, standing alone not far from Kate, red-faced from embarrassment as usual, and smiling as she looked around. But Emma knew that she was crying inside, the poor thing. She thinks that because of her chubbiness, no one will approach her. Emma felt very sorry for Clara because of this. However, she didn't see Dora anywhere. Emma asked the waiter for a beverage. While she was sipping her drink, she kept looking around, but no one came over to her. She was in total despair. Not just because of this, but she felt as if she fell in love with Tom, but he wanted Susie. Emma was seriously looking around and walked to the end of the room, when out of the corner of her eye, she noticed a stiff form standing almost completely leaning up against the wall and suddenly started toward her. Emma turned in that direction with curiosity, and much to her surprise, it was a familiar face. So you're here, too? Asked Emma surprised. I'm glad that we can meet again, Adam, the textile factory's son said reservedly. I haven't even asked your name. Emma. Emma Durkin. My name is Adam Devin. Are you enjoying yourself? Asked Adam inquiringly. Frankly, not really. I'd like for this whole thing to be over blurted Emma honestly. I completely understand. Emma was surprised by Adam's reply, but because Tom was still uppermost in her mind, she didn't really want to start a conversation with Adam. 
she wasn't interested in anyone else. How can a person meet someone properly at just one ball, and how can a man decide after just one dance in one evening who his wife will be? Emma blurted angrily. There's no way. It's ridiculous. Adam's reaction surprised Emma again, but at least it brought a small smile to her face. Could I perhaps ask you to dance? Or are you already taken? Asked Adam. I'm sorry for being so improper, but I don't feel like dancing anymore. I hope you understand. Of course, no problem. I don't really like to dance, either. I'm tired, I think I'll go upstairs. I'm glad we met. I'm glad, too. They said goodbye to each other, and with that, she left the ball. Emma started up the stairs to her room in the dormitory choking back the tears. This was almost as big a disappointment to her as it was when she found out that Anita and Alex were engaged. She was ashamed that everybody seemed to find their mate, except for her. And after so much preparation, this was what happened in the end. Once again, she had expected too much. How could she think that everything would come together all at once, even if it happened for others, this could never happen to her. Emma stepped into the room and with tears in her eyes, took off her beautiful dress and let her hair down. She had felt so pretty today. She blew out the candle next to her bed and sadly got into bed. She was tossing and turning and angry. She didn't understand why fate was so merciless to her. Then she heard the door opening and someone quietly entering the room. Emma peered out from beneath the blanket and saw it was Clara. She didn't want to talk so she pretended to be asleep. Clara also quietly got ready for bed. Emma continued to think for a while longer about how Tom had bewitched her so much that she didn't even want to meet anyone else. She felt that she had again made a mistake just like with Alex. Then somehow after much difficulty, she managed to fall asleep. Since it had already been done by the time she got to bed, morning came quickly. When Emma woke up, she realized that everyone was asleep in their beds. She didn't know what to do and she would have been ashamed in front of the girls, if she had to tell them that she didn't find a suitor for herself. She wasn't interested in Susie's condescending opinion. Therefore, she quietly got dressed and went for a walk in town. For hours she just walked, browsed, but couldn't really focus on anything. She was just killing time. Then she sat down on a bench in the park and spent half the day there. She didn't even care that they would reprimand her for coming out without an escort for such a long period of time. This is, after all, the big city and the ball is over, too. She started thinking about what she would say to the others when she got back to her room. She felt just horrible. She thought about her parents who were hopeful that their daughter would easily find a suitor. But this isn't so easy after all. No matter the school, everything was for naught. Miss Giff couldn't teach her this either, she couldn't make her to be like a queen. She started thinking that perhaps the problem lies with her, and that from now on, she can't be picky if she wants to get married, she can't allow that. But what was she thinking since she doesn't deserve everything all at once, love and wealth? She had expected too much. She's too insatiable. She can't have everything. But at the same time, she thought about how unfair life is, since all of this materialized for Susie. What could the problem be with her? Then suddenly she realized that it would soon be dark. She started heading back to the dormitory afraid of what awaited her. When she got back to St. Helens, Emma gathered all her courage and walked in the big brown gate, which not so long ago, she dreaded walking through, but now this was different. Now she was afraid of shame. She slowly started upstairs and opened the door to her room. To her great surprise, only Clara was there who was sorrowfully packing her suitcase. In fact, she only just now noticed that several other suitcases had been pulled out, but she didn't know which one belonged to whom and what had happened. Seeing this, she was a bit relieved. It was better than what she had expected, which was that the girls would be happily chatting about their experiences with Susie at the top. 
What happened, Clara? Vivian's father took her home. You should have seen it. I've never seen Vivian so overjoyed. She was so happy to see him. This must be why she was so sad, because you know, her father is all she has, and he just came back home from his service abroad after being away a long time. Apparently it's been years since he's been able to come home. Poor Vivian, all she has is her father, and he's an alcoholic, too. Emma said feeling sorry for her. Not at all, he's not an alcoholic. But they told me that he was. Emma was dumbfounded because she had thought all along that Vivian's problem must be that her family has a bad reputation, and that was why she didn't want to be friends with anyone, that she was ashamed they would find out. Now it turns out that it was only that she missed her father very much. And why are you packing now? I'm going home. The ball is over, and we can go home. But for a while yet. What should I wait for? I wasn't able to find a suitor and I'm not going to get an invitation, cried Clara. Oh, Clara, don't pout. I didn't find a suitor for myself, either. We'll still have opportunities. The debutante ball is only the first. The first, but the biggest opportunity. You, at least, talked to several people, while I didn't talk to a single person. You'll still have lots of opportunities. Nobody needs me. And I ruined the dance, too. Don't cry. And where are the others? Dora and Kate got into an argument, I don't know where they are. Susie is with Brad. Brad? And why did the girls argue? Well, Dora told Kate this morning that she's in love with her older brother, and that they're already engaged. What? When did this happen? You know, they always rode the same train and this is how Dora met Kate's brother. Then they wrote letters to each other, and last night, Kate's brother came to the ball and proposed to Dora. Kate was offended and rushed off while Dora packed her things and left. Well, of all things. She left? So that's who Dora was writing all those letters to. It just now dawned on Emma. And what about Brad and Susie? I don't know about that exactly, but Susie said something about how Tom isn't the best partner after all, and that Brad is more to her liking, but I didn't exactly understand why. What could have happened? That's interesting. Perhaps it was spiteful, but Emma was very relieved, that she wasn't the only one that had things turn out badly. I'm packing, too, Clara. I'm going home. And so the girls started packing their suitcases. Right about then, Kate walked into the room with a bit of a doer face, and sat down on her bed. Are you going home, too, Kate? Emma asked. No, I met a young man yesterday who's from a good family, and he is studying to be an architect like his father. I have a date with him. I hope it goes well. I really like him. I'm sure it will be good. I'm happy for you both. And you, Emma? Kate asked the question Emma had been dreading. I wasn't successful in finding a suitor. Oh, how could that be? But you're so pretty. Oh, I'm so impolite, I'm sorry. It's no problem. There wasn't anyone that was attracted to me and that I found attractive. And that's it? Emma tried to force self-confidence on herself. It's the same reason Clara is so sorrowful, but everyone still has a chance to find a suitor, said Kate. Yes, of course, said Emma. I just remembered. Have you heard the news, Emma? Kate asked. What do you mean? Vivian. The whole time we thought that poor Vivian's family had such a poor reputation. Seems that Mr. Cork must have confused it with another girl's school. Mr. Cork! exclaimed Clara. He was at the picnic and met Esther there. He already proposed to her some time ago. Well, what do you know? I didn't even recognize him as he was so far away and we didn't see his face that well. Kate was amazed. By the way, congratulations. Congratulations. What a coincidence. 
Emma said also very surprised. As everyone started to be in a better mood, Emma began to get over her feeling of shame, and then Dora walked in. You could tell that she was a little bit afraid thinking everybody was against her, when in fact, other than Kate, no one had a grudge against her. Emma and Clara didn't know what to say as they busily packed their suitcases. They were waiting for the two girls to talk things over. Kate, don't be mad at me. We love each other. I'm sorry. All this secrecy for so long behind my back. Because in the beginning we started out as just friends, and then later I didn't dare tell you. A girlfriend is always honest. You're right, please don't be mad, I don't know what to say. If you'd rather, then we'll break off the engagement. After this, there was complete silence for a few minutes. Come on, Dora. No need to do that. I forgive you. I wish you both happiness. Really? Dora became so happy and wrapped herself around Kate's neck, then Emma and Clara went over and everyone hugged each other. I couldn't have gone home without saying goodbye from all of you. Dora said. Right about then Susie opened the door with Brad by her side. Brad awkwardly stood in the doorway. Susie began to quickly pack her suitcase. Emma didn't know what to do. She was very curious as to what could have happened with Tom. Her heart started pounding. Somehow she must ask because she absolutely has to know. She can't rest until then no matter how disrespectful it may be to Brad. How is Tom? Emma asked gathering all her courage. Well. Susie became very ill at ease looking for the right words. Emma's heart was beating even harder and she felt uncomfortable that she was so dumb as to brazenly ask about it. Susie couldn't even speak as she found herself in such an inappropriate situation. Why didn't I just keep my mouth shut? Emma asked herself as she felt even more awkward because of her curiosity. My friend is a scoundrel. He's not reliable where women are concerned. Said Brad trying to ease the tension. This seemed to give Susie new life and she started describing how she finds Brad more attractive anyway, all this to Brad's great delight. Brad and I are a perfect match. We mutually like and respect each other, said Susie and with that she finished her packing. And then she said goodbye to the girls as if she was just going home for a short break. Bye. All the best. And then she left with Brad. The girls were surprised and couldn't imagine what had happened, and the way she said goodbye was strange, too, not to mention how inappropriate it was to leave with a man, and who knows where they're going. When the girls were finished with their packing, they sadly looked around the room and at each other. School was over as was their life together, the big preparations, the ball, and who knows when they would see each other again. The girls all hugged each other as they started to tear up, and they promised each other that they would stay in touch. Although Emma's spirits were much better, she was still sad not only because she couldn't have Tom, but because she would never find a decent suitor for herself. And she's going to miss the girls, too. And her parents, her poor parents. These are the things she was thinking about while she was standing in front of the dormitory with her luggage trying to hail a carriage. The other girls had already left with a carriage as they were leaving from the southern train station. Emma needed to go to the north, but not one carriage was going that way. Suddenly, a well-to-do man with his own private horse-drawn carriage drove by in front of her. He abruptly started braking and came to a stop a few meters over. A man's voice called out of the carriage. Do you need a ride, young lady? Asked the male voice from inside the carriage. Emma hesitated although the voice seemed familiar to her, but it would be indecent and could even be dangerous. But the carriage driver had already popped down from his seat and had started to pack Emma's luggage onto the carriage. When the driver opened the carriage door for Emma, she was relieved to see Tom smiling at her from inside the carriage. She was comforted to know that she wouldn't be getting into some dangerous character's carriage, and decent or not, she would soon be late for her train. And on top of everything else, it's not just anybody, it's Tom. Susie wouldn't be too concerned about appropriateness in a situation like this either, 
if the situation warranted it, and she would be right. Emma thought. Where can I take you? To the northern train station. That's very close by. Let's go then. The carriage started on their way, but Emma didn't know what to say to Tom, even though she actually had so many questions to ask. She froze up again. But Tom had no problems with communication. I assume you heard what happened. But I'm happy for Susie and Brad. Truly. Emma became more curious wondering what Tom was referring to. Well, yes, me too. Emma reacted in her usual laconic way. Brad fell head over heels in love with Susie, and in spite of things, they're engaged. But being the good friends that we are, he first asked for my blessing. I told him, Brad. You must really love this girl if you don't even care what a scandalous family she comes from. Her father has a very bad reputation. It's terrible. Emma was in complete shock. Scandalous. Emma asked surprised. How do you know that? Did she tell you? Curiosity getting the better of Emma. No, and that bothered me a bit, too. I found out by accident when one of my business partners and good friend, Mr. Cork, informed me about it when I mentioned Susie's name to him and that I wanted to propose to her. Mr. Cork. Emma was stunned, but at the same moment it became clear that they had thought this about Vivian, and that a certain Mr. Cork was talking about her. But it was Susie all along, and how well she hid this, as no one suspected a thing. That must have been why she turned pale white moments before the ball, because she was frightened she would encounter someone she knew. Someone who knew the truth about her, pondered Emma. Yes, do you know Mr. Cork? No, I don't know him. Well, here we are, Emma. I'm happy that we met. Goodbye. Tom said in farewell with great suddenness. But Emma could barely grasp all the things she had just heard and her mind was grinding away. Tom had probably thought that she already knew about it all. Goodbye. Thank you for the ride. Emma stepped off the carriage in a mild state of shock. She collected her bags from the driver and headed toward the station. She walked into the station, and after purchasing her ticket for home, she sat down on one of the benches on the platform. She became upset again and her thoughts were a mass of confusion. She still felt that she wanted Tom, but she was also angry with him. It bothered her that he hadn't even asked anything about her, he didn't even ask where she was going. And to think he almost married Susie. It's outrageous. And then he gave her up so quickly. He even let his friend have her. And Susie came out on top once again. A filthy rich young man is madly in love with her, someone who is honest, decent, with a good heart and who is every woman's dream. But apparently Susie must have suffered a great deal, too, only in a different way. Emma fluctuated from being upset to being sad. She didn't feel well at all. And she was disappointed in Tom, too. People were coming and going all around her on the platform and Emma was getting more impatient waiting for the train, when suddenly she heard someone shouting her name. Emma. Emma. She looked around agitatedly thinking it must be Tom. He's come after her to propose to her. It was so crowded on the platform that she still didn't know where the voice was coming from, no matter where she turned to look. Good day, Emma. Said the voice closer to her. Emma turned and now she saw who had shouted her name. Hello. She said a bit disappointed, because once again, it was Adam. Where are you going? Home. Home. I happen to be waiting for my father. And. You're not coming back anymore. I don't believe so. Adam sensed Emma's disinterest, so he kept quiet. They stood next to each other in silence for a few minutes. Emma considered breaking the silence, but she really wasn't interested in all this. She wanted to get home. Then Adam turned toward Emma a bit timidly. May I ask you for a rendezvous? Emma was completely caught off guard as she never suspected that Adam's intentions were going in this direction. 
but now, before she had a visceral reaction and turning him away, she started thinking about him. She felt sorry for him a little, and for some reason, felt bad about rejecting him. And this could be the one and only and final offer she will ever get in her life. Although she had completely ignored him until now, fate stepped in to bring them together once again. And then the school will not have been for nothing, and her parents won't be disappointed, either. In addition to all that, he's rather wealthy and not too bad looking. Yes, of course, Emma said to the surprise of both of them just as Emma's train rolled in. May I escort you up on the train? Of course. They quietly walked to the train car, and although they were quiet, there was a lot of noise at the train station. The train let out a loud warning with its horn, and the passengers getting off the train were swarming around them. A bit shyly, Adam took Emma's suitcases from her hands, and set them in the cabin on the baggage holder above the seat, and helped Emma up the steps. As they stopped, they were facing each other and they both became very embarrassed. I'll be calling you soon. Goodbye, Emma. Fine. Goodbye. And with that, Adam quickly stepped off the train which immediately started on its way. Emma sat down and couldn't believe what had just happened so quickly, so suddenly, but it really did happen. She broke out in laughter that she tried to hold back so the other passengers wouldn't think she was crazy. But she kept bursting out laughing, and didn't really know why. Everything had happened so quickly that she hadn't thought it through, but whatever, it didn't matter, she would give this a chance. Thoughts were jumbled in Emma's mind, but she finally felt free, and with a smile, she started to think back to the beginning where it all began. It seemed like just yesterday that Emma moved into that room at the dormitory where she ended up living with five other girls, who wished for the same things as Emma, and who were all the same age. To find the kind of man that being around makes your heart pound, and a truly good match from an economic and social standpoint. Two it's September once more, and again, there's a great deal of hustle and bustle in the capital city. People are crowding in the street, young ladies and their parents arriving one after the other. In the case of the more well-to-do, they even have their valets following them, carrying the heavier suitcases after them like slaves. The entire country is weaker after the North Indian War of the Colonies and yet, things have been stirring in this city the past year, as they are now celebrating their 1,000 years of existence. This is why there are even more than the usual balls and celebratory commemorations. Affluence is in abundance, even though these are also hard times for the girls' schools, and city officials are none too pleased with the operation of schools such as these. Most notably would be the city's most highly respected citizen, the legendary hero, the general, who is working towards closing the doors to these ladies' charm schools as soon as possible. Given his influence, he may very well soon be successful in this. At first, it was because of the high taxes spent on these institutions. The head commander gained a reputation for himself during the War of the Colonies when as a young southern bachelor, and as a genuinely brave soldier, his ethics and humaneness led him to save an entire division during the war and from certain death. He treated locals with compassion, acquired food for their children, and managed to break the resistance without a fight. Although the situation was very tense at that time in North India, so much so, that they had to send many troops to that same battlefield, and on the direct specific orders of the king, and though he was yet very young, the king found him to be the best suited. Thankfully, he was very successful. Everyone respected him, and all kinds of legends circulated about him. Because of the situation that evolved, there were those girls' schools that were joined together, but unfortunately, many closed. Fortunately, St. Helen endures. Miss Bert and Miss Giff are immovable thanks to one of the charitable students, Lady Bolton, who felt so strongly about her former school's future, that after receiving Miss Giff's letter of complaint, she immediately rushed to her aid and became the school's charitable benefactor. Since it was this institution and, of course, Miss Giff, that she owed her thanks to for her successful marriage to a very wealthy descendant of an aristocrat, 
she felt obligated to offer financial support to her former instructors. Everyone is in a hurry to get somewhere, the horse-drawn carriages galloping by one after the other at a fast pace. One of the carriages stops just then right in front of St. Helen's girl's dormitory. A young slender girl with long brown hair is the first to step down from the carriage to the sidewalk in front of the school. Her dark blue dress and coat was flattering to her skin and the color of her eyes. A striking appearance that draws attention in spite of her simplicity. Her name is Liza, an exceptional and true beauty. She scans her surroundings with curiosity as she takes some deep breaths. Her parents step down from the carriage after her. Based on their more simple style of clothes, they seem to be more middle class, no accessories or excessive train on the dress. But in no way could we say that they are poor, either. They are elegant. A distinguished and mature aged lady and gentleman. The man is holding his daughter's two pieces of luggage and hands them over to her. Everything will be fine now. Thank you. Said the girl to her parents as she took her bags from her father. Are you sure you don't want us to walk you upstairs? Her mother asked worriedly. No, you can go ahead and leave. Well, then, have a good time. Said her father. Take care of yourself. Her mother said in an emotional farewell, and with that, they got back up in the carriage. As soon as they closed the carriage door, they drove away. Liza stood in front of the door for a while longer gathering her courage. She took a long look around and at the building with the big brown door, and then she noticed servants running in and out with luggage in their hands in front of a huge house at the end of the street. Liza watched for a while at what was going on. Since they were taking baggage down from a carriage and only taking them inside, it was soon obvious that someone was just now moving in here. Liza was completely absorbed in watching. With this much clothing, it must be someone very wealthy and prestigious. Then another carriage pulled up in front of the house, and an extraordinarily beautiful woman stepped down from the carriage. Wearing a light blue dress accented with white pearls that highlighted her slender waist and that would attract attention even at the biggest state ball. Her face was like that of a porcelain doll with white skin that was cared for and silky. She received as much attention as a princess would. Everyone on the street was looking at her. There were even some pedestrians who stopped to get a better look at her and wondering who this enigmatic woman could be. But she didn't pay any attention to them as she proudly and gracefully walked up the steps to the house holding her head up high. She stopped in front of the door for a moment, and turned her head toward Liza, but when their eyes met, Liza was suddenly panic-stricken. She knew how improper it was to stare at someone like that, so she instantly started knocking on the door. After a short wait, the door opened, and Liza took a quick glance back, but the woman was no longer there. I'm Miss Bird. Are you Melissa? Asked the slightly older Miss Bird. No, I'm Liza. Oh, yes. Follow me. Liza was frightened as she followed Miss Bird up the stairs all the way to the room's door. Miss Bird stopped there and pointed to the door. This will be your room. Come and get acquainted with the others, said Miss Bird as they stepped through the doorway. Liza stopped inside the doorway behind Miss Bird with her eyes downcast, but as soon as she looked up, she saw four girls sitting on each of their beds, and they were all now watching her. Everyone was just watching her and it wasn't a particularly good feeling to be in this situation. An unfamiliar place with unfamiliar people and everyone is scared. Ladies. Your new roommate has arrived. Her name is Liza, said Miss Bird and then she walked out the door. They greeted each other with a nod. Everyone was quiet. There were only two beds left that were available, the two on either side close to the door and across from one another. Liza walked over to the bed on the left side that was a little bit farther from the door, and after putting her bags down on the floor, she sat down. She felt very uncomfortable and glanced at the girls. I'm Natalie, this is Kitty next to you. These are Anna Marie and Annette, said Natalie, from her bed that was in the same row as Liza on the other side. Kitty was on a bed between them. Across from Natalie was Anna Marie, 
and across from Kitty was Annette. The only bed still empty was across from Liza. Kitty had a friendly smile for the newly arrived Liza. Anna Murray was in the middle of leafing through a book. Annette seemed a bit antagonistic at first, as when someone has their nose in the air, and isn't disposed to get into a conversation with the others. She just looked towards the window. Kitty was a delicate, skinny girl with light brown wavy hair and a very bony face. She almost looked a bit sick, but it was more likely due to her gauntness. One can tell that Annette gives a lot of attention to her looks, as she must have spent not a little amount of time curling her blonde hair. Anna Murray's black hair and her freckled face are unique and impart an individuality on her. Natalie also has long light blonde hair and has a stockier form like the others. Where are you from? Natalie inquired. From Bertford, said Liza. Oh, that's a really nice place. My mother's aunt and her family love it so much that they always make a detour there on their way to Bath, Natalie said. Yes, Bath is nearby, replied Liza tersely. Guess what? Natalie asked suddenly remembering. I heard that they want to marry off the Count of Kent's heir. My aunt told me who is good friends with the family and she knows this firsthand. Natalie enthusiastically shared this news with the others which made all of them look up. How wonderful it would be if he came here to the debutante's ball. It wouldn't be a trifle thing to be the Count of Kent's wife, Natalie giggled. Although I would be very satisfied with the candy factory owner's son, as the girls smiled. I love chocolate. The girls laughed together at Natalie's comments. In the middle of all the gaiety, a new girl arrived with Miss Bird, who without a word, chastened the giggling girls with a serious face and stern look. This is Melissa, announced Miss Bird, and again left the room. Melissa's face showed great sadness, and it seemed as if she was trying to hold back from crying by swallowing hard. But she was having a hard time of it as she couldn't even speak and her lips were trembling. She quickly set her luggage down, plopped down on the only available bed left, and started to quietly whimper. The girls watched her with sympathy. Excuse me for being indiscreet. I'll stop in a minute. Melissa sniffled, but her whimpering grew. She really tried to hold herself together in front of the others. Since they were all strangers to one another, it wasn't appropriate to behave this way. A true sophisticated young lady doesn't publicly display her emotions. I hope you don't think I'm being pushy, but can I ask what's wrong? Natalie asked. Well. Melissa's voice quivered. I'm sorry, but I just can't stop, she sniffed. Don't despair. I know it's hard to break away from our homes. But we'll help each other, the warm-hearted Kitty said reassuringly. That's not the problem, my parents. You know, I have a suitor, actually a fiancé. This got all of the girls' attention, especially Anna Murray because she really loved secret love stories, and couldn't get enough of those kinds of books. But my parents don't want to allow me to marry him, so they sent me here, Melissa blurted out. The girls felt sorry for poor Melissa, but none of them knew what to say. Don't be sad, Natalie reassured her. Miss Bird appeared again with her usual cross face. Melissa stopped crying and was hiding her face. She quickly wiped her tears away and swallowed. The girls looked up at Miss Bird with curiosity. Ladies, Come with me. I'll show you around and I'll tell you the rules of the dormitory. You are required to strictly adhere to the rules, because if you don't, you will be asked to go home immediately shaming your parents. The girls jumped up and started to follow Miss Bird. The rule is the following, wake up time is no later than 6 o'clock in the morning. Everybody gets dressed. Everybody takes their seat downstairs in the dining room by 6.30. You have 20 minutes to eat breakfast. Anyone who is late will not get breakfast. Lessons begin at 7 o'clock. Your first class tomorrow will be protocol with Miss Giff. You will have literature and French class every day, music and dance twice a week, piano and violin. You will know everything that is appropriate for a genuine lady. 
lunch is exactly at noon also in the dining room. Anyone who is late will not get lunch. After lunch, there is reading until 4 o'clock in the afternoon with studying in the library room. Then you are free for two hours until 6 in the evening. You are strictly only allowed to go outside with an escort, and are forbidden to go out alone. If anyone is caught walking alone outside, we will expel you from school. There has been precedence for this. Dinner is at exactly 6 o'clock. Anyone who is late, will not eat dinner. After dinner, time for baths and lights out at no later than 8 o'clock. You are not allowed to wear makeup, to wear provocative clothing, to behave inappropriately, to shout or be loud. Anyone who brings shame upon the school, we will expel which is the very minimum. Our school has existed since the founding of the first girls' school, and since then there have been many students who have become wives of ranking and noble men, and counts as well. We take stock in our good reputation, and we don't allow any girls to be students in our school who are undeserving of this. We have had many famous ladies of nobility who attended this school. We cannot besmirch the school's name. You are here because your parents want you to become educated noble ladies. We will prepare you so that you will certainly find the best match for an optimal marriage. You will demonstrate this at the debutante ball. Now let's go have dinner, Miss Bert said in closing. The girls are anxious as they follow Miss Bert down the school hallway. Annette is stunned by her surroundings. She is a bit conceited and one can tell that she is not used to this. Excuse me, Miss Bert. Annette calls out to Miss Bert which surprised her. And will everyone have a maid helping them? No, young lady. There are two maids here who take care of the rooms. Annette's face shows that she is left speechless from the shock. She comes from a luxurious life where she has gotten everything, and servants to tend to her every desire. She was very spoiled, and it is why her parents thought that learning some humility would be good for her, because a true lady must know how to be humble, too. On Sunday, the girls wore their festive dresses and they all waited in an orderly line outside the room for Miss Bert so they can be on their way to church. They didn't have to walk far, as it was nearby and not far from the dormitory at the end of the pedestrian street. It was the biggest church in town. There were already crowds in the street with throngs of people. The students from the other girls' schools were rushing with their teachers as well. They were only able to tiptoe their way from the steps in front of the door in an orderly line with everyone waiting to get in. They let the most elderly and the wealthiest in first. There was some disruption inside as well keeping them from getting to their appropriate pews. The seating rule in the church dictated that only the most distinguished can sit up front, while the poorest must sit at the very back, in the seats farthest from the altar. The students from the girls' schools had seats directly behind the seats reserved for the most distinguished churchgoer. The young ladies were taking measure of each other with great curiosity. None of the girls arriving from the other school seemed particularly likable. They all had their noses in the air and glancing at the others with contempt thinking that they are the most sophisticated noble ladies in the world with whom no one can compete. Slowly but surely, everyone made their way to their seats and when everyone was settled, the murmuring quieted down and the sound of the organ filled the sanctuary. Just then, the door slammed shut again, and a very elegant and sophisticated lady walked between the two pews in the middle making her way to the front with hurried steps, and went straight toward the most prestigious seat, and finally sat down on the aisle seat in the second pew. She was alone and stayed a distance from the others sitting in that row. Those people were watching her wondering who she could be, but no one doubted that she belonged among them. The young girls couldn't take their eyes off her from the moment that she swept by them. Who is that woman? Natalie asked the others in a whisper. I don't know, but she just moved into town. I saw her when she arrived, Liza quietly replied. Girls. Behave yourselves. Miss Bert angrily snapped at them. The girls were a bit embarrassed, but continued to watch the mysterious woman who sat stiffly and stared straight ahead towards the altar, not paying attention to anyone as someone who is completely unaware of the sensation she has caused around her. 
Each girl was speculating about this woman during mass. There was something very interesting about her, something magnetic and elusive. She was more than just a beautiful and wealthy woman. She had a commanding presence about her. Every woman would like to be like her. There is not a man in the world that she couldn't seduce. When mass was over, the lady quickly stood up, made the sign of the cross across her chest, and left just as quickly as she had come in. And as she once again passed by the girls, they tried to take a good look at her as best they could in the rush and without being too obvious knowing that it isn't appropriate for a lady to stare at someone. But even Miss Burt took a serious glance at this enigmatic woman. This mysterious, rich, extraordinary woman made quite an impression on everyone. Even later that night before bedtime, she was the topic of conversation among the girls. I've never seen such a beautiful woman. Natalie gushed. And her dress. Did you see the dress she wore? It must have cost a fortune. Maybe she's a princess. Anna Murray said her thoughts wandering. But who could she be? If there was a princess visiting in town, everyone would know about that. Natalie said thinking out loud. Not necessarily. It could be that she's keeping it secret on purpose so she doesn't create a stir around her, added Kitty. Without escorts or anyone around. Natalie asked doubtfully. Or she's a princess who's looking for an adventure and that's why she's run away. Anna Murray continued. One thing is for sure. We are kindred souls, said Annette. Liza saw her moving in. What did you see? Was she alone? Natalie asked further with curiosity. I didn't see anyone with her. But she had tons of luggage and servants. Oh, servants. Sighed Annette. But that just made her more interested in the woman, except for Melissa, though she watched the woman with wonder, but she continued to be sorrowful. She must be very rich. Perhaps she's from aristocracy and she's so graceful, Natalie thought. The first morning lesson was with Miss Giff. As usual, Miss Giff was again smiling and kindly greeted the new girl students. Ladies. You have a big task ahead of you, but it will be worth it. We will begin the preparation so that on the day of the ball, everyone will find the best young man for themselves. Everyone. Melissa asked defiantly to which Miss Giff's eyes widened. Young lady. Do not be disrespectful. Miss Giff frowned. Then let's begin. One of the most basic things that a real young lady must be familiar with is literature. The great classics are the foundation of education. Let's start with ancient times. There's nothing more awkward than when someone can't contribute to a conversation because they are lacking in knowledge. Ridiculous. A man likes for his companion to be intelligent. For that matter, reading is very important in a prestigious lady's life, it refines the brain, and keeps you smart. In any event, what other form of entertainment could there be in a genuine young lady's life, if not reading? Miss Giff said. To which Anna Murray reacted by vigorously nodding her head as she loved keeping her nose in books. She ate up romance novels and sometimes imagined herself in the middle of these stories. The young ladies were exhausted after the first day, and they all fell into bed at night. When they awoke the next morning and were looking around the room sluggishly from still being sleepy, they were alarmed to see that Melissa was not in her bed. Her bed was empty. The girls helplessly looked at each other. Where could she have gone? Natalie asked while she got out of bed and hurried to the door with quiet footsteps. She cracked the door open and peeped out. The other girls all sat up in their beds and they were no longer sleepy. Let's tell Miss Bird, said Annette. I think we should tell, too. I hope nothing has happened, worried Kitty. But I wouldn't want to get in trouble because of this, added Natalie. It will become apparent anyway that Melissa isn't here but we would only be adding to the problem, if we wait until they notice it themselves, said Liza. I wonder where she could be. How exciting. Anna Murray said drifting off into her own world again. And then Miss Burt opened the door to the room. Young ladies, 
What is all this loud noise? Why aren't you getting ready? Miss Bird asked them. Miss Bird, I think. Melissa has disappeared, Kitty said awkwardly. What? Disappeared. Where would she have disappeared to? Asked Miss Bird in consternation. We don't know, Kitty said quickly and apologetically while the others just sat mutely with their eyes cast down. What do you mean you don't know? Answer me immediately. If you hide something, you could get in very big trouble. You'll bring shame upon the name of the school. Miss Bird, we really don't know where she could be, said Natalie. She was still here last night. She was here last night? And her bags. Miss Bird thought quickly while she walked over to Melissa's bureau. She pulled out the drawer, but it was empty. The girls also looked in stunned disbelief at the empty drawer. Miss Bird was quiet for a few seconds thinking about what she should do. Get dressed and stay here. Nobody can leave to go anywhere. Understand. Miss Bird issued her instructions as she angrily stormed out of the room. The girls did as Miss Bird ordered them to. No one would have dared do otherwise with her as everyone was a bit afraid of her, and now that she was angry, she was even more frightening. Therefore, the girls ended up spending almost the whole day in their room. Even breakfast was served to them by a maid in their room. I think she must have run back home, said Annette. I completely understand. I'd like to be at home some, too, as she thought back on her luxurious home. Certainly she didn't go home because her parents are very strict with her. They would even punish her if she did something like that, said Natalie. I think she ran away with her love to a far-off island, said Anna Murray fascinated by the story. Oh no. That would be terrible. She can't do something that stupid. That would stigmatize not only herself, but her family as well, and everyone would hold them in disdain and ostracize them, noted Liza. Miss Bert and Miss Giff finally showed up that afternoon with Melissa. They were both very nervous. Melissa just stood ashamed with her head bowed quietly weeping. The girls all jumped up and waited in amazement to see what would happen. No one can go anywhere from now on. Miss Bert said. You will continue with your studies tomorrow. You are forbidden to mention even one word about this matter to anyone, to inform anyone, or to write letters. From now on we will monitor your mail, Miss Bert said in closing, while Miss Giff nodded in agreement. After their teachers left the room, the girls just stood quietly for a while as no one dared say anything. The girls were watching Melissa who was obviously not wanting to talk. She walked over to her bed, sat down with her back to the others, and continued to cry. Melissa. What happened with you? Kitty asked worried. I can't talk about it, said Melissa curtly. With this, Natalie turned her back to her offended. She was filled with indignation that she can't find out what happened, even though the curiosity was killing her. Annette and Anna Murray read a book, while Liza and Kitty started on their embroidery. Liza was very good at crochet and it was going well. Early the next morning there was a knock on the door. Melissa. Get ready as quickly as possible and come downstairs immediately. Miss Bert said. The girls were once again in the grips of curiosity. On the other hand, Melissa was getting ready without a word. You could certainly tell us what happened. I think we deserve to know, too, Natalie said longingly. You'll know soon enough, replied Melissa. I hope nothing bad happened, asked Kitty sympathetically, but Melissa walked out the door without saying a word. Slowly the rest of the girls got ready and went downstairs towards the studying room. As they reached the bottom of the stairs, they saw Melissa standing there with her parents in front of Miss Bert and Miss Giff. Everyone seemed upset, especially Melissa's father. His head turning red from anger gave away everything. Despite the fact that the girls would like to have known what was happening around them, they didn't stop to stare. Instead they nicely and quietly took their seats and waited for class to begin. After a short wait, Miss Giff arrived who stood in front of the girls and took a few seconds before speaking. 
Ladies, Melissa is no longer a student at our school. She is moving home today, said Miss Giff. But what happened, Miss Giff? Natalie asked for the umpteenth time. It was clear that Miss Giff didn't know what to say as she hesitated for some time. You can never speak to anyone about what happened to Melissa, explained Miss Giff. Melissa did something that a real lady would never do, not just in appropriateness, but she went against her parents' wishes as well. Miss Giff felt very awkward at this point. She ran away with a man, but fortunately, she was found in time. I knew it. Anna Murray blurted out. We spoke about this here for the last time. We will forget what happened. And with that, Miss Giff ended the discussion. By the time class was over, Melissa was long gone from their room. Everyone was still in shock. No one believed that something like this could take place around them as things such as this only happened in novels. Poor Melissa. I'm going to miss her, Kitty said bitterly as she looked at Melissa's empty bed. What she's going to get from her parents now, mused Natalie. But how did it happen? How was she able to run away? And where would they have gone? Unfortunately, we're not going to know now, said Anna Murray. Before the girls could even come to grips with the events surrounding Melissa, it was Sunday once again, and time for Sunday Mass. The girls quietly entered the town's tallest building whose tower and bell tower could be seen from several kilometers away by anyone coming in the direction of the capital city. Inside, in the center of the church and along the pews, there are columns on both sides. The church's huge gothic windows and white walls brighten the room, but in spite of the light spilling in, the place gives off a gloominess. Saints' pictures can be found everywhere, and the ceilings are decorated in a gold fresco, but the one thing that is emphasized most, as if it were the only one of its kind and which adorns the church, is the gigantic painting at the main altar which demands that every eye should look at, a depiction of Christ nailed to the cross. It is frighteningly realistic as the torture comes to life, but there's peace reflected on the tortured, and no sign of suffering. On the table in front of the picture is a burgundy-colored tablecloth with gold borders and lots of gold colors everywhere. On both ends of the altar are two stout lit wax candles. The bishop is already standing in the center with his hands raised and waiting for his worshippers to quiet down. Almost everyone is sitting in their place and only a few are murmuring, when the church door opens again, and the mysterious lady hurries toward the first row yet again to take her seat. The girls turn their heads again and follow the lady's every move with curiosity. One could see some older women giving the lady scornful looks as their flawlessness cannot be overshadowed by anything, and that's why they can get away with this. Perhaps they are jealous since they always clung by tooth and nail to the adherence of all forms of strict etiquette afraid that society would exclude and ostracize them, and God forbid they would be judged. And after all that, if they see someone handling propriety a bit casually, and it's now the second time they have arrived late for Sunday Mass without any negative consequence, well then, this is more than aggravating. But the young girls felt some sort of amazement toward this woman, and she had quite an effect on them. It's possible that each girl was interested in the lady for different reasons. Perhaps for Annette it was more that the woman was so awe-inspiring and the extravagance is what attracted her to this person. For Anna Murray it was the mysteriousness that belonged in a novel and the princess-like qualities. For Kitty it was her determination and boldness that was so impressive. It must have been strange for Liza to be facing a woman who detracts attention from her looks in spite of her maturity in age. And for Natalie simply everything is interesting that is mysterious and that she can't know. At the end of the service, the girls could hardly wait for the woman to stand up and walk by them again so that they can get a better look at her. They didn't even care at this point, how obvious they were about it. It was because of this, when the lady started in their direction and neared the girl's pew, she had to slow down because of other people in front holding her up, and it was then that she noticed the five young ladies watching her. She was surprised when she glanced at them, and the girls were very embarrassed, especially Liza, as this was the second time she was caught staring at her. 
They all looked down as they were very flustered and they didn't even dare look at each other. It wasn't a pleasant experience for any of them, but the woman quickly continued on her way. On the way from church back to the dormitory, on some steps leading up to the front of a house, even from a distance Kitty spied a little girl about five years old standing in a torn and dirty dress quietly crying, and occasionally putting up her little hands in the hopes that someone coming from the huge church crowd would have pity on her and give her a few pennies so she could fill her growling stomach. As soon as they neared her, Kitty left the girls and Miss Bert so that she could give the poor little girl some change. Kitty. Come back here immediately. What sort of behavior is this? A proper lady doesn't run around aimlessly, and doesn't stop to converse with just anyone, snapped Miss Bert mumbling under her nose so that no one else would hear. Kitty quickly pressed a few pennies she had found in her wallet into the little girl's hands, and then ran back to her place. Even so, Kitty was extremely sad that day. She felt so sorry for the little girl. She thought about her many times and wondered if she has a family, if she has anyone, if they treat her well, if she has anything to eat, if she has some place to sleep, if she's cold. These thoughts kept swirling in her head. Annette asked Kitty before bedtime if she would help comb out her hair, and since Kitty loves to help, she didn't need to be asked twice. Kitty, why did you give money to that shabby-looking child? Annette asked. Because I feel sorry for her. You feel sorry for her? Annette asked in amazement. She doesn't have anything to eat, she may not have anywhere to sleep, she's cold, and it's also possible that the poor thing doesn't have a family, either, said Kitty as she started to cry. Annette didn't know what to say about this as sympathy towards the poor wasn't a noble thing. Have you read Oliver Twist? Kitty asked. I don't read things like that. Annette said affronted. It's about an orphan boy. Not only is someone poor, but he's an orphan as well and he has no one, and can't find anyone to whom it would even occur to help. A child doesn't only need handouts, but also needs kindness and love. Unfortunately, people's hearts are made of stone. But that's what orphanages are for, said Annette as if solving the problem. I'm really suffering here, too. I'm tired and I miss my afternoon rest time. A proper lady should always rest in the afternoon. And why do we need to know about so many things? A true lady knows how to effectively control her servants, and she can solve everything this way. Annette mused. Kitty preferred to just keep quiet and continued to mope to herself. Unfortunately, she was completely helpless in this matter. It wouldn't matter if she tried to help in every way she could. She can't change the world alone as long as people don't change their way of thinking and their indifferent attitude. If every person really gave it serious thought and tried to imagine, even just a little bit, what it must be like for a poor orphan child in a situation like this, then they would see that if we do just a little, at least for the well-being of children, the world would suddenly be totally different. If we pay attention to the children, that doesn't hurt anyone, but if we don't, Offering help to a starving child isn't a big burden to anyone. Yet many people don't do this shirking responsibility, moving on, because everyone is consumed with their own problems, but if that child has no one, then who should that child get love and attention from? There's no greater problem in the world than a hungry child. This is the most important and solvable problem to mankind. The next day, Natalie and Liza went to see the seamstress with Miss Giff as the big city jubilee ball was close at hand to which all the girls' schools in the city were invited and that would see many at the introductory dance. There had never been an event this big in the country. Now Miss Giff would like to have a dress made for herself for the noted occasion, and the girls are enthusiastically accompanying her. When they enter, Mr. Beck's son-in-law, Mr. Flim, is already waiting for them with the newly arrived fabrics. After Mr. Beck's death, his daughter and son-in-law inherited the shop, and they moved back to the capital city. But everything else remained the same. While Natalie and Liza were admiring the beautiful upon even more beautiful fabrics with huge smiles on their faces, 
Mr. Flim starts to quietly whisper to Miss Giff. As soon as Natalie notices, she is straining to hear. Yes. Can you imagine? She was here yesterday, but she wasn't very communicative. Naturally, she chose a beautiful fabric, but she didn't reply as to where she would be wearing it, said Mr. Flim. Well. This stays between us, and far be it from me, but this woman seems very strange to me. I'm sure she'll be at the ball, too, Miss Giff pondered. Natalie can hardly wait for them to get back to the dormitory, so she can tell the other girls what she heard about the mysterious woman. The young ladies were already bored as they went to their usual Tuesday piano class because they had all had enough of constantly practicing Brahms on and on. The teacher took this very seriously as this was his favorite. Liza hated this class the most because she was so embarrassed that the teacher never took his eyes off her. He was older but he was a grouchy fanatic and if he liked something, he didn't budge. The girls could barely wait for the day to end. They were all anxious for the Jubilee Ball. At night after lights out, and when they were lying in their beds, the ball was the topic of discussion. Maybe we can find ourselves suitors even sooner, if we're lucky, said Anna Murray dreamily. Liza for sure. Natalie noted. That's not fair. You already have the teacher. Anna Murray said, to which the girls all laughed. But Liza just blushed profusely. She didn't like it when the girls brought up the subject. She was too shy in matters like that. Miss Giff added an important class for the girls before the ball which was sophisticated walking. Every girl lined up one after the other wearing the required high-soled shoes. Stomachs in. Chest out. Head slightly up. Miss Giff gave the instructions while the girls followed each other with unsteady steps trying to follow the instructions. Gracefully. No rushing. A lady never rushes. When they were better at the walk, Miss Giff placed a book on their heads. Now walk so that you don't hold the book, but don't let it drop. Miss Giff said. This was now a bigger task. Natalie lost her balance and bumped into Annette who was in front of her and unaware, and whose book now flew off her head as well. She angrily looked back at Natalie while the others tried to keep from laughing. Excuse me. I haven't gotten used to these shoes. They're so uncomfortable. Natalie apologized. A genuine sophisticated lady must not dress for comfort, because a lady must never do work. That's the maid's job, they can dress for comfort. You would bring shame upon your husband with people assuming that your husbands can't support you and you have to go to work. Horrible. It's more than enough handling the direction of the maids. There's no need to dress comfortably for that. A lady is always dressed like a lady in every situation including at home. The big procession took place the day before the ball. This was when the high-ranked officials who were coming from far away arrived in the city with the governing military heads leading the way. At the head of the line was a wind instrument band that could be heard from far away gathered around which were the big and small of the city, and they escorted the procession all the way to the city center, to City Hall, where the big Jubilee Ball will get started tomorrow. Upon hearing the celebrations, the girls could hardly wait to go outside with Miss Bert and see the festival. Calvary men on horses, army officers, members of the honor guards, flag bearers, all in uniform in red coats decorated with gold buttons. The horses were also dressed with crafted and decorated saddles under which they were covered with red blankets trimmed with gold. The high-ranked officials came one after another in open carriages with the crown prince leading the way. Two white steeds led his fine gold carriage that had seats of burgundy velvet. Behind him was the governor general, the mayor of the city, and following them was the head commander. When people saw him, everyone started cheering with the crowd admiring him the most. He even caught the attention of the girls as they joined the crowd of cheering people and when the procession stopped in front of them. He's so handsome. Natalie said in amazement. And he's not even 40 years old yet. Oh, Natalie. Kitty replied in embarrassment. I heard that he didn't marry because he lost the love of his life. It was during the war, 
and by the time he got back home, the girl had died of tuberculosis. And he hasn't married since, Anna Murray explained. But what I heard was that he was engaged to a girl, but then she just broke off their engagement, and yes, he has never gotten over it, and hasn't married, said Annette. Where did you hear this? Natalie asked. My father was a high-ranking military officer, too, and they know each other from the army from the colony wars time. He's 35 years old because he's exactly 10 years younger than my father, replied Annette. She left him. Just like that. A handsome man like this. Natalie wondered while noticing that Liza and a young soldier had caught each other's eye, and he was none other than a member of the honor guard. Well, Liza. Natalie reprimanded her with surprise. When the good-looking young soldier winked at her, Liza blushed profusely and cast her eyes down, but glanced back at him giggling, and cautiously waved her hand at him. She tried to be discreet in reciprocating the gesture, but Miss Bert noticed anyway, and came down on her immediately for the impropriety. It could be because of this or because there were too many drunk people in the crowd, and of course, it's not proper for a noble young lady to be standing in the street for a long time, so for this reason, and to the great dismay of the girls, Miss Bert quickly ordered them home. But the girls were quite unyielding and very worked up, and watched the people being celebrated from the dormitory windows for a while. Though the higher-ranked men soon left the place where the procession ended, there were still things to watch, and there were many young soldiers who lingered there. And they once again saw the mysterious woman, too, who just happened to be hurrying home and never even glanced at the celebrations going on. As was their usual habit in the mornings, so it was that the girls all helped each other in the preparation for the city ball putting on their dresses. While the maid was braiding one girl's hair, the rest were fiddling with their corsets and pulling on their undergarments. Everyone put on their formal dresses. Although this wasn't the big debutante ball yet, and they will only be able to see the significant event for as long as the introductory dance lasts, still the girls were very excited, especially Anna Murray. She was really hoping that she would find a gentleman for herself, someone with which they could steal each other's hearts that would be fitting in a huge romantic novel, and she could finally be a part of a love story. Not that the others weren't hopeful also. The start of the ball began at exactly six o'clock in the evening which the mayor opened with a speech about the history of the city. It was exceedingly boring to the girls, and that was then followed by the head commander's speech as well. They could hardly wait to see the opening dance. As the young and wealthy girls of rank and their chosen partners danced by, the older group of girls also by rank joined in. The young girl students from the girls' schools, the spinsters without partners, widows, honor guard soldiers, and other ordinary citizens were just observers. The girls noticed with excitement that the mysterious woman was also in the crowd. As always, she was once again absolutely beautiful, fashionable, and elegant in an extremely expensive dress. She was the most beautiful there. Although one can tell that she doesn't want to deliberately call attention to herself, still she always succeeds in doing so. It seemed that everyone was watching her, but then something happened because she suddenly turned very white and pale. As soon as Natalie noticed it, she immediately told the others. What happened? Natalie asked, and the girls watched the woman with fear. She's not going to be ill, is she? Kitty worried. It must be about some big secret, said Anna Murray. And when the girls looked her way again, she was gone without a trace. Where did she go? Natalie asked the others, but none of them saw her, no matter where they looked. Liza, however, paid no attention to this matter, because she once again noticed the good-looking soldier from the procession that she found so attractive. The head commander quickly finished his short and pithy speech, after which they could now start with the introductory dance. Despite the fact that he's still young, the head commander is so somber. He's too serious and very strict, he's a little bit frightening, said Natalie while she was eyeing him. He must have gone through a lot of things during the war, poor thing, replied Kitty. Look Natalie. 
looks like your future husband is there. In person, the heir of the Count of Kent himself, said Anna Murray with a big smile on her face to which the other girls looked over and then could barely keep from laughing. Despite the heir to the Count of Kent's young age, he had a hefty stomach the size of two beer barrels. Ladies. Miss Burt admonished them. During the introductory dance, the beautiful dresses worn by the wealthiest dazzled the girls. What dresses and hair accessories? Each of them could only hope that someday they could afford these things for themselves, too. At the end of the half-hour introductory dance, Miss Burt signaled for the girls to retreat. It's not appropriate yet for you to stay late. Let's go girls. Miss Burt directed them, and the girls sadly started to follow her. As soon as they stepped outside of City Hall's gate, the mysterious woman was just getting into the carriage standing in front of the gate. And now that the girls were standing in the gate entryway, the woman looked at them as she was looking out the window of the horse-drawn carriage. She took a long look directly at them. The girls bowed their heads appropriately and nodded at her, but she didn't react, she had an empty look as if she didn't even see them and as if she weren't really even there. Then after a few seconds, she turned her head to face ahead, knocked to the carriage driver signaling they could leave, and he immediately left with her. The girls just stood there frozen not knowing what to do, while Miss Bird, who had not noticed any of this, was already several steps ahead of them, didn't say anything to them. That night before going to sleep, the girls talked about the mysterious woman. None of them could imagine what had happened, why she turned white as a sheet, and why she left the ball even before the introductory dance. Maybe she saw the love of her life and they couldn't be together for some reason, and now it opened old wounds and that's why she rushed off, Anna Murray continued weaving the story. Tomorrow is Sunday. Maybe we'll know more then, said Kitty. Oh sure, and how? Natalie blurted out as she could hardly deal with the curiosity of the whole thing. Maybe she won't even come. The next day in church, sure as rain, and to the great surprise of the girls, the mysterious woman was already sitting in her place while the crowd was only beginning to saunter into the church. She was sitting there reverently looking at the altar. Well. I wonder how long she has been here. Kitty asked with surprise. I think she has a dark secret that she has come to confess, said Anna Murray. During Mass, they became aware of the mysterious woman bowing her head down, and drying her face with a handkerchief. She's not crying, is she? Natalie asked. I knew it. Said Anna Murray. This must be some very dark secret. At the end of Mass, the mysterious woman once again tried to leave quickly as she headed toward the door with quick and determined steps, but then an unexpected thing happened. The girls only dared to watch out of the corner of their eyes. Ever since they were caught being curious and watching her, they were embarrassed in front of her, and they also thought the chance meeting last night odd. But the woman now stopped next to the girls' pew, and looked at them with kindness. I'd like to invite the ladies to an afternoon tea with Miss Burt's permission, was the invitation extended by the beautiful woman which left Miss Burt completely stunned and speechless. I'll allow it, answered shortly Miss Burt. Thank you. What a great honor. Natalie blurted out with great joy. The woman just smiled and went on her way. The girls could barely contain themselves they were so happy. I'm sure she must have a beautiful house. Annette wondered. And now we can finally find out who she is. Anna Murray said elated. When they got back to the dormitory, the girls could hardly wait to tell Miss Giff what had happened. In the meantime, Miss Burt was quite uncertain about her decision, but she just didn't want to refuse the prestigious woman's invitation out of propriety. Miss Giff. Miss Giff. Natalie called out as she entered the study room. Ladies. What is all this loud noise? The woman, the prestigious lady that just moved here, said Anna Murray panting. Yes. Asked Miss Giff intrigued. She invited us to tea tomorrow. Annette cut in. All of you. Asked Miss Giff in reply. That's very interesting. 
make sure you behave as is expected of true young ladies. Do not bring shame upon the school. She said a bit nervously. Do you know at all how to behave as guests? Be sure not to arrive too early. That afternoon, Lady Bolton, St. Helen's mentor arrived at the school. She wanted to see the new students and since her husband was a high-ranking individual, he was also expected at the Jubilee events. Lady Bolton is very kind and smiling by nature and quite plump. She is like Miss Giff, inside and out, except that she is a little bit younger. As she stood in the room in front of the girls and next to Miss Giff, she was touched as she thought back to her years as a student. Ladies. This is Lady Bolton who once used to be a student at this school and is now a supporter. We have her to thank that our school is still operational, Miss Giff said as she introduced Lady Bolton to the girls. This waiting period can be very nice indeed. I know you don't think so right now. But finding a good husband, if that's what you want, requires waiting, and that takes a lot of patience. And if we have to wait, then let's wait patiently. Isn't that right? Because it won't happen any sooner if we are impatient. We only make things harder for ourselves. The time that I spent here with the girls was so wonderful. We became good friends. I wonder what happened to them. Wondered Lady Bolton as she reflected back to the old times. I hope that the head commander will put aside his old grievances and will never close this school. The girls were shocked as they listened to Lady Bolton's words. They want to close it? Natalie blurted. Oh, don't be concerned with this ladies. It's just a rumor, Miss Bolton immediately reassured them while smiling at Natalie. You almost look just like I did at that age. I dieted so much, but I finally succeeded. And now, why? Soon I'll be 40, Lady Bolton carried on. Natalie was very offended by the comparison and blushed. I don't like this Lady Bolton, whispered Natalie to Kitty who was sitting next to her with a friendly smile on her face. Ladies, I'm glad to have met you. I'll be in town for a while, so we'll see each other often. It's been the rare occasion that I've been able to come visit my old school, but it's always a great feeling to be here, said Lady Bolton with a big smile on her face. I wonder what old grievances Lady Bolton was talking about with relation to the head commander, asked Anna Murray of the others. Annette knows the head commander. Natalie said boldly. I can't imagine what connection the head commander would have with a girl's school, said Annette as the other girls laughed at her comment. The following day, the girls were excitedly waiting for their meeting with the mysterious woman. They were on pins and needles by the time the woman's servant arrived to escort the girls. It was a very attentive gesture on her part, as she knew that young ladies cannot wander the streets alone, and that this way Miss Burt didn't have to go to any special effort. So she sent her faithful servant, although Miss Burt wasn't at all pleased with this act of consideration. When they stepped inside the woman's amazing home, it was just as they had expected. Beautiful antique furniture, the most expensive tapestry enveloped the walls and the furniture. The parlor opened immediately to the right. The velvet sofa and armchair covers were a pleasant green color, the curtains were a slight shade lighter green, and there was a huge green Persian rug which was the room's most special decoration. The lady of the house was already waiting for the girls in the room, and when they entered, she was in the process of filling the gold-edged porcelain cups with hot tea herself for her young guests. Please have a seat ladies. She greeted them in her home. The girls were completely fascinated by what they had seen so far. They all sat down on the beautiful sofa. Two of them, Natalie and Annette, sat in the armchairs that had wood carved legs and armrests and were true masterpieces. The woman placed the cups of tea on a large round tray which the maid held and took around to the girls. Each of them took a cup from the tray. It's genuine Indian black tea. Drink it to your health. Have you been to India? Natalie asked. Yes, I've been to many places already, and I've brought a small antique item from everywhere I've been. I have an antique from each country, a decoration, or a piece of furniture, which isn't really a small item, the woman said laughing, 
but I think it would be polite for me to introduce myself first. My name is Lady Montmorency. My husband was the late Eugene Montmorency, descendant of the ancient and noble French family. I took over all his beloved antique items. He acquired many pieces of treasured antique through his family, but also on his own. The girls were speechless as they drank in the woman's words, and now it was proven to all of them, that they had indeed met a very influential and prestigious lady. She is a member of an authentic ancient noble French family, and she is as grand as the queen herself. Lady Montmorency wasn't surprised at all by the quietness of the girls. So you are the students at St. Helen? Lady Montmorency asked them. Yes, we learn many useful things so that we will be able to marry well, replied Natalie, to which the lady started laughing. Yes, I'm familiar with these girls' schools, but I believe that in order for us to find good husbands, we have to learn to seduce and win their affections, said Lady Montmorency knowingly, but the girls didn't know how to respond to this. They were all quiet and very embarrassed, except for Annette, who was only concerned with the fact that she was finally in surroundings worthy of her. Precisely what is it that you learn? Lady Montmorency inquired. Aside from basic education, what is appropriate for a true lady, said Kitty. Last time Miss Gift taught us how to walk, Anna Murray interjected. Oh, walking is indeed very, very important. Show me, asked the lady which floored the girls. Should I stand up and show you? Asked Anna Murray in reply, scared as she looked at the others, but Natalie nodded to her in encouragement. I think Natalie should try, Anna Murray said trying to get out from having to do the task, while Natalie cast an angry look at her. Then you. Or both of you. Lady Montmorency said. Come on, don't be afraid. Anna Murray finally stood up and showed what she had recently learned. Lady Montmorency watched with a kind smile on her face. Very good. But if you will allow me, could I add a few things, the lady asked. Of course. Anna Murray said a little bit frightened. Lift your head up a bit, but not too much, and have your mouth show a slight smile but don't let your teeth show. And your look should remain cool, as she showed them. See? The face is the most important tool of expression. Keep the walk light, as if you were rocking in a boat. The girls just stared as they listened to the very knowledgeable lady while drinking their tea. If you think, although I believe you are still too young and innocent for this, I would be happy to also teach you a few things to practice, Lady Montmorency offered by way of help. Oh, definitely. I would be very pleased. Exclaimed Natalie. Then we'll meet again soon, if your teachers agree to it. I'll be expecting you after school. The girls left the lady's wonderful home completely enchanted and were hoping that Miss Bert and Miss Giff will let them visit the lady again. The next day they were in the middle of practicing the steps to the waltz with Miss Giff, who could barely contain her curiosity, waiting for the girls to tell her about the mysterious woman. Natalie. Your back should be straight and keep your head straight, too. Miss Giff stressed. But Natalie could hardly wait to ask if Miss Giff would let them visit Lady Montmorency again. Miss Giff. Lady Montmorency invited us again to her home. You will let us go, won't you? Lady Montmorency. Miss Giff stepped back amazed. Well, it wouldn't be appropriate to refuse Lady Montmorency's invitation. Frankly, it wasn't just the propriety, but it was also because of curiosity that Miss Giff agreed to the new invitation. But it's not right to abuse someone's hospitality, Miss Giff cautioned the girls. You know, it's possible that Lady Montmorency invited you again, because it's polite at a time like this to extend another invitation to the guest for them to come again. She didn't necessarily invite us back again out of propriety, but because she'd like to teach us. Anna Murray let slip, but the others were waving at her right away to keep quiet. What? Teach. And what would she be teaching you? Asked Miss Giff. Well, she has already traveled to many places, for example India, and she would tell us about these places, 
Natalie corrected. I understand, said Miss Gibb, but it was clear that this didn't calm her suspicion. Insomuch as it was a lady of such high rank in society, she didn't forbid accepting the new invitation, and she walked out the door at the end of class. As they had previously discussed, the girls returned to Lady Montmorency's after class and longingly waited for the more than engaging things to learn about seduction and conquering. Lady Montmorency was already waiting for the girls in the drawing room. When they arrived and as soon as they sat down, she handed each of the girls a fan and immediately started tutoring. Ladies. In the matter of seduction, you must always focus on one man after you have picked one out, choosing who you would like to attract, and if he isn't opposed to this from basic signs we have picked up, from then on, the enticement can only be seen by him. You have to do it in such a way that no one else can notice. Lady Montmorency said and which had the girls blushing and giggling. But what would the basic signs be that a man isn't opposed? Natalie asked prying. Eye contact. A man is virtually incapable of taking his eyes off a woman that he has picked out for himself. Of course, there are those whose thoughts are quite evident, but they pick up on it, as to why the person is looking for their attention. But for us, it's strictly forbidden. We have to avoid eye contact in the beginning, and have to pretend, as if we haven't even noticed them and completely ignore them. We stir up their interest even more this way. Then the second step is the secret, the hidden message that only the desired man should see. We take out our fans and touch the closed fan with our fingertip. What this will convey to him is that we are willing to converse with him, said Lady Montmorency, as the girls listened in amazement. I can message him with my fan. Anna Murray asked astonished. That's right. There is more, but that's enough for now, said Lady Montmorency. What other messages are there? Please show us, inquired Natalie who was completely fascinated by the secret fan language. All right. But don't tell anyone about this, allowed Lady Montmorency and continued to show more. If I hold the open fan with my right hand in front of my face, it means, follow me. The girls giggled together. If I slide the fan across in front of my face with my right hand, it means, I love you. Sliding our hand down the closed fan means, I hate you. Touching the closed fan to the right side of your face with your right hand means, yes. Touching the closed fan to the left side of your face with your right hand means, no. Dropping the fan, let's just be friends. At the end, the girls broke out in laughter along with Lady Montmorency. This was wonderful. Thank you, Lady Montmorency. Natalie said with gratitude. You're welcome. Although I find you too young and innocent yet for seduction, but if you don't know about this, as I didn't at one time, it will be much harder for you right from the start. Though the first sign with the fan is the most important, because that's how I call the person in question over to me, I haven't committed any improprieties with this, and if I change my mind, there is still a way out, because after all, he came over on his own, Lady Montmorency said as she thought about it all. And the truth is, I've come across an awful lot of hypocrisy in my life, but the seduction of a man is the biggest in the world. The girls were in shock as they listened to the lady's opinion, although they didn't exactly understand it, but they just listened quietly to her teachings. Have you heard yet of the fainting trick? We can blame it on the corset and the gas lamps too, of course. But always try to be near that man, to swoon gracefully, near the one that you have picked out for yourselves, continued Lady Montmorency, to which the girls smiled at each other. Touch is very important to a man, it's the most serious thing in raising awareness, but we must always do it discreetly, as if we only happen to touch the back of his hand by accident, or his forearm, possibly his shoulder, gently and with graceful hand movements sliding all the way down, while she showed them by smoothing down Kitty's back which made Kitty blush profusely. But we can manipulate the way they look at us. For instance, if we take our hand and slowly stroke the length of our neck with it, then his eyes will be drawn to my neck. If I very gently bite my lower lip, not only because it will make it nice and red, 
but because his eyes will be glued to my lips, which compels it to be kissed. The girls were stunned as they listened to Lady Montmorency's advice on seduction, who talked to them about these things with such self-confidence and ease, because she didn't want to be hypocritical and it was clear that she was different than the others. Her being a noblewoman aside, her honesty was shocking. While many women know about these secrets, none of them learned these from the other. They all learned it on their own, and they would never admit the truth to one another. But this lady, in spite of the fact that it's not appropriate, and definitely not proper for a lady of aristocracy, still and all is helping these nice young girls to know their way around the ins and outs of seduction. Although she was so direct and informal and gave away so many secrets, yet they still don't know who she is. How did she end up in France? How did she manage to marry so well? And what happened to have her come back? Not to mention, what happened at the ball? You know so many practical things for women, can you recommend an effective diet? Natalie asked and which made the lady smile. Everyone is very different. For instance, an old girlfriend of mine was a bit overweight while still in school, and not long after, she managed to lose weight. She did it by wrapping herself tightly in damp silk as she believes that if you have to starve yourself, then it's probably not a good diet, said Lady Montmorency. Which school did you attend? Natalie inquired. That school is no longer there, Lady Montmorency frowned. The girls were once again sitting quietly in Miss Giff's class the next day, because a whole host of interesting things were going around in their heads that Lady Montmorency had taught them. Compared to that, Miss Giff's instructions about propriety didn't seem to be much of a serious challenge. Gloves are mandatory. If the gloves aren't white, that's considered an unforgivable sin, and wearing gloves that are yellowed is enough reason to never be welcomed again as a guest in the community. It's extremely shameful. Extraordinarily so. Miss Giff exclaimed getting very worked up, but it wasn't half as interesting as Lady Montmorency's lecture on seduction. The girls were bored as they listened. In any event, the highest ranking events happen in Almax. If you want to get tickets to the ball in London held at Almax, it's through the upper circle of older lady members of a committee, who gather together at the first of every month to discuss who they think has the most appropriate background of those on the list to buy tickets. Or rather, who they should exclude from the Almax event because of unsuitable behavior. And another thing that is very important is that the statement of required rules of propriety for these gatherings belongs and should stay only within the group of ladies. Miss Giff had just finished a statement when Miss Bird rushed into the room with a nervous face and out of breath from hurrying. My goodness, Miss Bird. What happened? Asked Miss Giff in shock. I came as quickly as I could. I almost ran, said Miss Bird. Oh my! Running. Miss Giff asked in consternation. They heard about Melissa in town. The matter somehow got out. Miss Bird informed them of the bad news to the shock of the girls. I happened to be standing in line at the post office when I heard two men behind me talking about the closing of the girls' schools, and they brought up Melissa's case as a terrible example. Well, if the head commander finds out about this too, then that's the end for us, Miss Giff moaned. I'll tell Lady Bolton right away. Perhaps she's still here in town, said Miss Giff. The girls anxiously waited in their room to see what would happen. They were very sad because they knew that all this would reflect on them poorly. Miss Bird stepped into the room to see them with a letter in her hand. Ladies. This is a letter Melissa wrote to all of you a few months ago. Because we had ordered complete silence on the matter, we were not able to give you this letter. Now that everything has come out, it doesn't matter anymore, said Miss Bird handing the letter to Liza as she was standing near her, and then walked out the door. Liza looked at the others and with slightly shaking hands, opened the envelope. Read it already. Natalie said impatiently. This is unheard of. I'm going home. Annette said. Dear Annette, Anna Marie, Natalie, Kitty, and Liza, Melissa's letter began. I'm so sorry that I couldn't say goodbye to all of you. I hope you're not angry with me. 
I think I've owed you an explanation for my behavior for some time. I no longer wanted to obey what my parents wanted, because my happiness was not in the forefront of their minds. This is why Tom and I decided to elope, get married in the chapel by the port, and take the noon ship to America where no one knows us and there is no prejudice. But it just so happened, that a director from one of the girls' schools recognized me as she was on the road going toward the chapel. She quickly took matters into her hands so that no one would see us until she took me back to school and turned me over to Miss Bert and Miss Giff, because she knew that this would endanger the reputation of all the other girls' schools still around. Please forgive me. I didn't want to put all of you at risk. But I think before they found me, an official who was on the street saw us since Tom was wearing his military uniform and they may have recognized us. I hope there isn't any trouble stemming from this. But since then, I do have good news and that is that at the end of the day, Tom came for me and I am now his wife, although my parents have disowned me. But don't worry. I am happy like this now. Although we don't have much, we're happy. I wish you much success in the future. Your friend, Melissa. Liza read the letter which made Kitty cry. They saw them. Who could that official have been? Anna Murray asked. How could she do such a thing? Annette asked indignantly. They couldn't do anything other than wait for the newest developments, and wonder if there would be any consequences to this. The girls were just getting back from their afternoon walk in the park with Miss Bert when they ran into the smiling and friendly Lady Bolton, who was also hurrying on her way to St. Helen. Oh Miss Bert. Guess what? I come with very good news. Try and guess who I was fortunate enough to talk with. Started Lady Bolton. In person and with none other than Adam Devon, head commander. Well. Lady Bolton exclaimed Miss Bird surprised. Wait, I'll get to the point in a moment. Thanks to an old mutual acquaintance of ours, he will show his mercy on the girls' schools and won't close them. Lady Bolton informed them enthusiastically as they had just about arrived at the dormitory. As they turned into the pedestrian street, they noticed that two carriages were standing in front of Lady Montmorency's house, and the servants were packing heavy suitcases up into one of them. They were very near the house when they started to slow down. Is Lady Montmorency moving? Asked Natalie. Miss Bert and Lady Bolton were also watching the events take place, but true to proper form for ladies, they didn't stop to stare, but only slowed down their walk a bit. When they had packed the last suitcase into the carriage, Lady Montmorency appeared in front of the door and made her way down the steps straight toward the carriage. When Lady Bolton saw the woman, she grabbed her chest and was speechless, just gasping for air. Emma. Emma Durkin. Said Lady Bolton addressing Lady Montmorency. Lady Montmorency completely froze, and as she turned, the shock was apparent on her face. She couldn't imagine who was calling to her and who was addressing her this way. Clara. Lady Montmorency smiled and started toward Lady Bolton. Oh, Clara. I haven't seen you in so long. The two women were hugging each other. Miss Bert and the girls just stood and watched them. She's Emma. Emma Durkin. Natalie said excitedly to the others. The famous Emma Durkin. Anna Murray asked in amazement. Greetings ladies. Lady Montmorency looked back at them. Unfortunately, I have to leave again, but perhaps I'll come back soon. Until then, one last good piece of advice, if the ladies will allow me. Lady Montmorency said in farewell to them. Always take a good look at who you really want to seduce. And never ever want it too much. Pay attention to that. This is how she made her farewell from the girls. Be sure to write, Emma. Lady Bolton said to her. Yes, Clara. I have so many things yet to tell you about said Lady Montmorency to Lady Bolton as she climbed up into the carriage and it took off at lightning speed. The mysterious woman left as quickly as she came, someone that it turns out, many people now know. Three after Emma finished her studies at St. Helen and returned home, she felt very strange. 
she felt out of place and couldn't imagine how to move forward. Mrs. Durkin was overjoyed that her daughter met such a well-to-do and sophisticated young gentleman, and she was glad that the school wasn't for naught, that it was worth the trouble. But that's not how Emma felt. This wasn't what she had counted on. When she thought about Adam, she became very sad. How she had wished for a suitor, and now that she had one, she still wasn't satisfied. This wasn't how she imagined it. She should be feeling like the happiest person in the world, but that isn't the case. She reflected on the intense feeling of love and desire that she had kept alive for Alex, and perhaps still feels now. She was choking back the tears all day. She was confused when she thought about Alex because she knew that this great love can never be consummated. When she thought about Adam, she was sad because she felt so sorry for him, but mostly the fact that she didn't feel for him what she should. She feels no fire and flame burning as was the case with Alex. Emma only knows that Adam is a good person who loves her very much, but she won't be able to reciprocate that love. She's afraid that this feeling is never going to happen. She'll never be able to feel true love toward Adam. One morning while sorrowfully sitting at her vanity table in front of the mirror, Mrs. Durkin stepped in the room holding a tray with Emma's favorite morning cocoa. Would you like to tell me what's wrong, Emma? Mrs. Durkin asked while she put the cocoa on the nightstand and sat on the end of the bed. Nothing. Emma tried to hide the truth, but she erupted into tears. I can't do it. Emma said sobbing. I can't marry Adam. But why not? What happened? A worried Mrs. Durkin asked. Because I don't love him, I can't do it. Oh, is that all? That's no problem. You'll grow to love him, Mrs. Durkin encouragingly told her. Really? Emma asked amazed. Yes, it's the same with everyone. The feeling comes later and works itself out during the marriage. But. What if we already love someone before marriage? That's the best if we love someone before marrying them. That's not what I mean. I mean, what if we love someone else before marriage? Who? Emma was quiet and didn't want to answer. She didn't want to tell even her mother about her heartache. I only loved your father. This is true love and the years have proven that I'm right. The others are just fleeting infatuations that quickly dissipate. That's not serious. Seriously. Of course. These are just brief little infatuations that you can't base a marriage on. The strong bond will take shape between you and Adam. Love. Love. Well. Yes. Should I marry Adam? Of course. Why shouldn't you? Because I'm not in love. You will be. Don't be sad. Mrs. Durkin encouraged Emma. But Mrs. Durkin didn't sense Emma's sorrow and couldn't even imagine the deep-seated feelings she still had for Alex, and that this made it impossible for her to feel this kind of strong love toward Adam. Emma couldn't imagine that she would ever be able to love Adam like that. But this is her only wish, for this great love. The burning flame and love that sweeps away everything else, one that is destined and from another world written in the stars. Though it's very rare and even if it doesn't happen for others, she truly hopes that she would succeed in attaining it. She doesn't want to give up on it. Emma believes that many people can never experience this feeling because they settle for what they have and don't make the effort to find their true mate. It's possible that it's just a matter of giving it time, and patience is also needed, but this is the most difficult. Just waiting and not doing anything or taking advantage of the possibility at hand. But she doesn't want to be like that and doesn't want to end up that way. She can only live being in love and can't imagine a marriage any other way. This was always the one thing she desired, and it was always the one thing lacking to achieve happiness. A man who is smart, kind, good-hearted, successful, and even fun. The kind every woman desires. A noble and fine man who is acknowledged and appreciated, someone everybody looks up to, and is loved with such devotion as he loves, if not more so, and does everything he can for his beloved like a true knight. 
everyone would be envious of their love suited for a fairy tale. Emma feels in the depth of her heart that this is not just a dream, that this can come true, and that one day it will become a reality. She has to wait yet for someone or something and perhaps it will happen. Maybe. But with Adam, it's certain that this miracle would not happen, though she'd really like for it to bow she doesn't want to hurt him. She dreads the moment they will meet again and unfortunately, she will have to turn him down. Although she's unsure about the whole thing, this is what she feels deep in her heart. The following day Emma, along with her mother Mrs. Durkin and her younger sisters, Mary and Cassie, went to visit Mrs. Durkin's cousin, Emma's godmother who was widowed at an early age. Emma didn't like her as she was so crabby and hard to talk to. She almost never replied to anything, she just listened. But if anyone made her talk, then she snarled at them in an ugly way. It wasn't an accident that she had been living alone for a long time. Mrs. Durkin was telling her relative with great joy how fortunate Emma was to have found such an affluent young gentleman. But Emma just sat wordlessly. Somehow she just couldn't be happy about this and her stomach was doing somersaults. The subject of Mary, who is two years younger than Emma, also came up and how she would be starting her studies at St. Helen next year. Emma didn't think it was a great idea, but didn't say anything, as this really didn't interest her at all right now, but Mary almost jumped for joy. Poor Cassie who is just a little over 13 years old started whimpering because she would really like to be a real lady too, and is sorry that Mary is leaving, although right at the moment she was envious and mad at her. As they were walking home, you still couldn't wipe the smile off of Mary's face. She was so excited that next year she would be starting school and she will become a real lady. As they were walking, a top-covered horse-drawn carriage passed by them. Emma. Emma. A familiar voice yelled out of the carriage and the carriage immediately came to a halt. Anita! exclaimed Emma in amazement, as Anita alighted from the carriage. What's going on with you Emma? Anita inquired. I was about to come visit you tomorrow. I would like to invite you to our wedding. It's not quite a month away, and I'm so excited. Anita shared the good news with Emma. Oh, thank you for the invitation. Emma said searching for words, but Anita broke in. Oh, forgive me, but I have to go. You know, my mother's French girlfriend that I told you about is just now arriving with her daughter from France. We're hurrying to the station to pick them up. We'll talk. And I'll be sending the invitations this week, too. Exclaimed Anita and she was already climbing back into the carriage. Emma barely gathered her wits after the meeting. She felt as if she had met with Alex himself. She can't decide whether it's better if she meets with him, or rather if she never sees him again. Though truth be told, she would really love to see him. But it would crush her even more to see him, and she can't have him because he loves Anita and is marrying her soon. No matter how much she hopes otherwise, nothing is going to happen now, he's going to marry Anita, and that will be the end of that. She can't hold out hope any longer. But no matter that Emma knows all this, her heart still hopes. Later that evening before bedtime, she found herself dreaming that Alex would not marry Anita. And now that she met with Anita, she is only now facing the fact that unfortunately, her dreams and reality are very far apart from one another. The realization always seems to come as a surprise to her that reality is completely different from her own little world, and this endlessly saddens her. Emma didn't know for sure and hesitated with regard to the wedding invitation. She was sad and uncertain. But she didn't want to miss an opportunity either to see Alex. She's also not sure if she's capable of doing this, watching Alex marry one of her best girlfriends. As the days went by, Emma felt more and more that she didn't care, and that she had to see Alex. Her fantasy took wings once again. She was hoping that when Alex sees her after such a long time, he'll realize he feels something towards her after all, and maybe the wedding might be called off. She really doesn't want to chase dreams in vain, but she is simply unable to control her thoughts and to halt her curiosity and impatience. 
Every single thought ends up being about Alex again and again. With the wedding soon approaching, Emma was more and more confused. She was completely unable at this point to think of Adam as her future husband. She felt sorry for him, but she knew, that she must turn him down and she will have no choice but to tell him that he should no longer have serious feelings towards her. But first, she definitely wanted to see Alex. She could hardly wait to see him again. One afternoon Mrs. Durkin and Emma were sitting in the little gazebo in the yard sipping their tea. Emma in silence as usual with her thoughts far away swirling around Alex. Their servant approaches with a letter in his hand and offers it on a small round tray to the lost in thought Emma. Emma's heart was beating hard as she opened the letter, although she knew quite well what it contained. But anything related to Alex somehow always had this kind of big impact on her. What is it, Emma? Mrs. Durkin inquired. It's just Anita's wedding invitation, replied Emma. Oh, I thought it was Adam's letter, said Mrs. Durkin disappointed. Emma wouldn't have been happy at this particular moment for a letter from Adam. She has other plans that don't include Adam, and she wouldn't have the patience to get involved with that right now. Though the thought did cross her mind that Alex's feelings might be stronger towards her if he knew that she has a serious suitor who is, by the way, a very well-to-do gentleman. But on the other hand, that wouldn't become him. Games and tactics are not suited to her and she is far removed from them. And in the end, it all might turn out wrong because what if Alex didn't approach her for this very reason? Emma's feelings for Alex grew day by day. She left for the wedding with high hopes and she's ecstatic that today she can finally see Alex again, but as soon as she realizes that this is her great love's wedding with her girlfriend, she chokes up with tears. She hates Anita and is angry with the whole world. She's embarrassed but the truth is that she is extremely envious of Anita. The morning of the nuptials Emma's stomach was completely tied in knots. She couldn't swallow a thing. She felt very strange and besides being sad, she was optimistic as well. After breakfast she hurried to her room so that the maid could start fixing her hair as quickly as possible as well as getting dressed on the big day, or rather, Anita and Alex's big day. Just as the maid pulled her corset tightly on Emma's waist, MRS. Durkin stepped into the room with a big smile holding a letter in her hand. Emma could not imagine what her mother could be so happy about. Adam's letter. Mrs. Durkin shared with great joy. Just leave it on the table please. I'll read it later, said Emma with complete disinterest. What? Why don't you open it? Aren't you even curious? Mrs. Durkin was amazed. Not now. I have to get ready for the wedding before we end up being late. Emma said impatiently as she could hardly wait at this point to see Alex, and she wasn't interested in the least in Alex's letter. Emma started out for the ceremony with Mrs. Durkin and Mary accompanying her. In the carriage, she was already chewing her nails. As was the custom, after the morning church wedding ceremony, everyone gathered at the bride's parents' home for a short celebratory reception, which customarily was supposed to finish before lunchtime. It was generally for a small group of people and a reserved reception. Everything was proceeding according to tradition. The groom waited for people at the door to the church in order to guide everyone to their proper place, separate places for guests of the groom as well as for guests of the bride. Altogether there were about thirty. Certainly there were a little more than the usual number of people. Inside the church, the pews and the altar were decorated with freshly cut flowers. There were some colored ones but the majority of the flowers were white and no yellow whatsoever because it was thought that the color yellow was a bad omen at a wedding, and that it signaled jealousy in a marriage. But Emma didn't care about the decorations, and in fact, she didn't even care about Anita's dress. As soon as they arrived, her dreams dissolved as reality became the sad fact that Alex is getting married and is taking Anita as his wife. She didn't even want to be there anymore. She didn't feel she had enough strength for this and regretted that she had come. She would rather just go home. She didn't want to see Alex, not under these circumstances. She can't go through with this. What was she thinking? 
it was sheer folly, and now she will have no choice but to be witness to their happiness. This is agony. These were the thoughts warring within Emma when the sound of the organ reverberated and the church door opened. Emma could barely breathe. She knew that at any moment she would see Alex for the last time as a bachelor. Walking in front was the best man and the bridesmaids who were Anita's cousins. Behind them, after a long while, Emma finally spotted Alex. He was more good-looking than ever, and Emma's heart was beating harder. She wished so much that Alex would look at her, too, and that he would notice her, but Alex didn't care about her. He didn't even think about Emma. He walked toward the altar with determined steps with his mother at his side. Behind them was Anita in her white-laced bridal gown arm in arm with her father. When everyone took their places around the altar, it occurred to Emma how lucky she was that Anita didn't ask her to be a bridesmaid notwithstanding their friendship. She wouldn't have wanted to be concealing her emotions and helping in a wedding where the man she loved happened to be the groom. However much aversion there would have been, she wouldn't have known how to refuse doing this if Anita had asked her to do this, because she wouldn't have been able to offer any good reason to turn her down. In the end, they would have figured out her feelings for Alex and she would have been very embarrassed if that had become known. At the end of the day, it's better this way for everyone. If she tries to look at the bright side of this, then at least she escaped a very unpleasant situation. But Emma couldn't think of anything positive right now. In fact, she felt as if it was the end of the world. Now that she was watching Alex walk in front of the altar, she realized the painful truth that there is no more to this. Somehow she has to accept and understand that it's over, all the dreams were in vain, and those dreams she dreamed will never become a reality. Even though she imagined so many things and so many happy moments, these will never come true and never come to pass. But after all this, what will happen without these dreams and what will bring her joy? Emma felt terrible and was deeply embarrassed that even now, up to the last minute, she was capable of believing that there was a chance that her love would be fulfilled. But certainly now the end was at hand and there can be nothing more. The time had come for her to let go of the thought that she and Alex could ever be together romantically, as this can never happen now. This is what it's like when you have to face reality and she has to forget all of her dreams about Alex once and for all. If they do reappear sparking new hope, then she must dismiss those thoughts quickly, no matter how hard it may be. It has to be nipped in the bud, and then she isn't stuck in this unrealistic dream world. She decided that from now on she will have her feet firmly planted on the ground and that she is going to pay attention to what is happening in the present. No matter how unimaginative and rigid reality is, she must escape from these foolish dreams. These were the thoughts swirling around in Emma's head as she watched her love standing in front of the altar. And then she came to a determination. She felt ridiculously dumb. It was a good thing she had not told anyone about this. What was she hoping for? At least she doesn't have to be embarrassed in front of others about this. It was quite enough feeling this way and dealing with it herself. It was hard for Emma but she contained herself, and not even a single tear slid down her face. Even her mother, Mrs. Durkin, didn't notice anything. After the church wedding ceremony, the reception celebration was held at Anita's parents' house. Anita comes from a very well-to-do family. Her father was one of the owners of the nearby steel factory. Emma always felt a bit inferior because of this knowing that Anita came from a better family than her. The spacious dining room was also beautifully decorated with flowers, mostly with roses. The long antique table was covered for the festivities with a snow-white lace tablecloth and beautiful Chinese porcelain dishes. The most special item in the room standing in the left corner was a huge marble fireplace that had gold borders, and had two lion heads on either side at the top bulging out. The oak table's legs and the chairs had elaborate carvings. After Emma and her mother were seated at the table, Anita's mother's French friend and her 18-year-old daughter Hubertine, who was a bit strange, sat next to them. Her rust-brown colored dress with tiny white flower designs was very simple and not really appropriate for her age, besides the fact that it wasn't suitable for a festive occasion. 
the one and only brooch at her neck accented her appearance. It was surprising for being French that she didn't seem to pay much attention to fashion. It was as if she deliberately was hiding her charms in a dress such as this. Anita's mother comes from a true artistic family. There were many authors among her relatives, and one of her half-siblings became a quite popular writer. They traveled to France quite a bit back then and have maintained the friendships since then with friends who live there. Their friendship stretches back many years. Emma curiously observed the French ladies sitting next to her, but she wouldn't have dared speak to them. Though she spoke French, she was very shy and didn't like it if she had to speak in a different language. She had a hard enough time as it was speaking with a stranger, let alone in a foreign language. She was always afraid that she wouldn't think of the appropriate word, that they wouldn't understand her pronunciation, or that she might not understand what they are saying to her. It was clear that Mrs. Durkin was interested in them as well, and she wouldn't for the world want to seem pushy, but she noted with some sympathy and could tell by looking at them that the poor dears had a hard time finding their place now among so many strangers and far from their home. Did you also come to vacation in our little country? Mrs. Durkin began to make acquaintances. Yes. We thought that as long as we had an invitation from our friends, we would take a look around the area. It's been so long since I've been here, and now I'll also show Hubertine these amazing green hills that always impress me so, replied the French lady with her hard-to-understand accent. And how much longer are you staying? Unfortunately, we're heading back soon because Hubertine is returning to study. Oh, I see. And in what kind of school is she studying? Mrs. Durkin inquired further. In a Catholic sisterhood school, answered the French woman while she lowered her gaze. Emma and Mrs. Durkin were also surprised and didn't say anything. Though she would prefer to study elsewhere, continued the woman. It's just that my father died, and now my older brothers tell me what to do, because naturally a woman can't decide by herself. We're not capable of this, said Hubertine cynically. Hubertine. Her mother scolded her angrily. But Emma completely agreed with her. She did not understand this exaggerated male domination in the world at all. Yes, the men are the masters and they can do anything. They can get these poor women pregnant against their will, and then afterwards, they can leave them if they feel like it. Or, what's even worse, they can beat their wives without being punished, they can drink and gamble the woman's dowry away, but if a woman commits the smallest mistake, she will have to be embarrassed over it for the rest of her life. They look down on women because they perceive them to be dumber than men, but they deny them a university education. Actually, the only reason they can keep the weaker sex down so much is because otherwise they wouldn't be able to make their own way. In light of this, Hubertin's grumpy behavior is all the more understandable, as is her not particularly attractive appearance. She is representing all of this given that she must now give in to her older brothers, and can't do what she would like. Does the young lady already have a suitor? The French lady asked Mrs. Durkin while looking at Emma. Oh, yes. Hopefully the engagement will be soon, too, replied Mrs. Durkin proudly and happily. Mother. Emma said quietly. She felt very awkward. Really? Congratulations. Unfortunately, getting married is the farthest thing from my Hubertin's mind. Oh no. I've never heard of such a thing. But she's still so young and pretty, too. She'll probably warm to the idea in time, Mrs. Durkin encouraged the woman. I don't want a man to tell me what to do and what I can do for the rest of my life, have authority over my own wealth, and for him to have the final decision over everything in my life. Always asking permission like a servant, Hubertine continued her thoughts with determination. It was apparent by looking at her poor mother though, that she felt awkward because of her daughter's behavior. Mrs. Durkin was also astounded by Hubertin's rude behavior. Emma, however, listened to Hubertin's words in rapt astonishment. She wouldn't have thought that anyone could speak and stand by their opinions with such determination not caring what others thought about them. Emma could never be like that. 
the fear that people would ridicule and talk about her was stronger. But Hubertine wasn't concerned with things like that. Emma was so jealous of her. Though she did think it was strange that Hubertine didn't long for love, Emma could think of nothing else. Mrs. Durkin couldn't find anything else to say after all this, and since they had finished their celebratory meal, they didn't plan to stay much longer. Even though they had cod with horseradish which Emma loved, her stomach was in knots from all the nerves and she was only able to eat a few bites of it. It wouldn't have been polite to overstay their welcome, so Mrs. Durkin motioned for the girls to leave. Emma hesitated not being able to decide whether she should go over and talk a while with her girlfriend, as this would have been the appropriate thing to do, but she didn't think she was capable of it. Although, if she were to brag about Adam to her, then perhaps she would feel better. But it would have been wrong since she wanted to turn poor Adam down, so the fewer people who knew about this, the better. As soon as Mrs. Durkin started to leave, she halted. Mrs. Durkin. The French lady called after her. Your daughter is truly a beauty and not only that, but very well mannered. I heard she's educated, too. Have you ever thought about sending her to Paris to see a bit of the world? She quickly asked. Oh, thank you. You're so kind, you truly are. It never occurred to me before this, but now that she has a serious suitor. I don't know, replied Mrs. Durkin. If you change your mind, I would be happy to recommend her at a few places. There are many distinguished families in Paris looking specifically for governesses. Although she could come over to our place as well and she could teach my Hubertine proper decorum. The idea was very appealing to Emma, but to her great relief, they had to leave. They quickly left. She was glad that she didn't have the opportunity to talk with Anita. Truthfully, she didn't have anything to say and she couldn't bear to look at Alex the whole time, either. It's better this way that she left, and that this horrible affair is over. Their friendship wasn't the same chummy and intimate friendship as it had been long ago before she fell in love with Alex. Anita started to neglect her once she moved to St. Helen, though the reason for this quickly became apparent later. Alex was more important to her by then, and it was very painful for Emma to witness their love for each other. They grew apart for good. Emma was sorrowful for days and was constantly battling against her dreams as they would pop up as she was trying to banish them. She tried to stop them completely. But apart from this, she didn't know what to do. Up until now, this is what gave her joy and strength. Now she didn't know how to live and make her everyday colorful without them. What was she supposed to do with herself after all this? She can't give up on love. Up until now in her life, this is what she longed for and without it, she could never be happy. But she needs something. Something to distract her thoughts, something in which to find her joy. Although it's always necessary to have a goal, a source of joy, but for her it's only a great love. Moving forward it's still the most important thing. Emma was looking out from her bedroom window looking out into the distance, and didn't even notice, that Mrs. Durkin had walked into the room. What did Adam write? Asked Mrs. Durkin. I don't know, Emma said coming to. She had forgotten all about the letter and now the weight of it was heavy on her shoulder. A very unpleasant task awaits her, and that is rejecting Adam's offer. Then open it right away. What are you waiting for? Mrs. Durkin said as she grabbed the letter and handed it to Emma who, with a great deal of difficulty, made herself read Adam's letter. Meanwhile, Mrs. Durkin waited with curiosity. Tell me already. What did he write? Mrs. Durkin asked impatiently. He apologizes for not contacting me before now. His father was ill and he had to take over running the company. Oh, what a nice boy. Mrs. Durkin cut in and who was quite impressed with Adam. And he would like to come visit next week, Emma said with despair. Next week already? Oh, Emma, I told you to read it. Then answer as quickly as possible. Mrs. Durkin said hurrying her. 
What Emma really wanted to do was to tell Adam in her letter of reply to forget her and not to come visit her anymore, but she couldn't be so merciless with the poor thing. It's going to be hard to do this in person as well, but it's the gentlest solution. The thought was still fumbling around in her mind that perhaps she would do better if she could be satisfied with Adam. But no matter how many times she toyed with the idea, she wouldn't be able to do it in reality. There was just no way she could ever bring herself to become Adam's wife. She dreaded the day Adam would arrive and she would finally clear things up with him. What bothered Emma even more was that her parents had gotten themselves all hyped up about the engagement. Emma was pacing in her room while she was waiting during which she would peer out the window from time to time. She listened each time a carriage passed by in front of their house. Mrs. Durkin was doing the same thing downstairs in the sitting room. She was very anxious for her daughter. Her greatest desire was to marry off her daughter's well, and it would now seem that this was going to come true. When Adam's carriage pulled up in front of the house, Emma happened to catch sight of him as he got down from the carriage with a bouquet of flowers in his hand. Red chrysanthemums with leaves of ivy indicating the most serious of intentions, marriage. Every girl would have jumped for joy if they were to get a bouquet like that from their suitor. Except for Emma. She was looking at Adam with his dowie skin that was so strange, and while nice looking, he was a far cry from Alex's charm. And no matter how much she doesn't want to, she has to now go downstairs to the sitting room. It's very hard to do, but unfortunately, what she cannot do, is not go downstairs though she doesn't even know what to say. How will she come up with the words that will spare him while her mother is going to hear this whole awkward conversation? She and Mrs. Durkin were anxiously waiting for Adam to walk into the sitting room. Emma Amzat fainted and her mother's presence bothered her a great deal as well. But she certainly couldn't be in the room alone with Alex because that would be very inappropriate behavior. Mrs. Durkin. Emma. Adam greeted them as he walked through the door. He seemed just a little bit nervous, but it was rare being able to tell what he was thinking about by looking at him. Welcome Adam. I'm happy to see you. Mrs. Durkin kindly greeted him. Emma. I brought this for you, as Adam reached out to give the bouquet of flowers to Emma who was standing in front of the couch. When Mrs. Durkin saw the flowers, she was overcome with emotion since she knew as well what these beautiful flowers symbolize. Please have a seat, Mrs. Durkin offered, and with that, Adam sat down next to Emma on the couch. Mrs. Durkin then got comfortable in the armchair sitting across from them. How is your family? Adam. Inquired Mrs. Durkin. Thank you for asking. My father arrived home from abroad not too long ago and caught a cold during his trip, but aside from that, we're fine, Adam answered politely. Do you have siblings? Mrs. Durkin quizzed him further while Emma just sat ill at ease looking at the bouquet she just received. She didn't even dare look at Adam, although she did glance at him from time to time, but the more she saw him, the more awkward she felt. She liked Adam's determined and smart manner, but he also terrified her. I don't have any siblings. My mother died a long time ago when I was ten years old, Adam offered in a British cold-blooded way. Oh, I'm so sorry, said Mrs. Durkin with sympathy. A few minutes of pained silence followed Mrs. Durkin's inquiry. Adam was watching Emma who really didn't want to make eye contact with him because she felt this would make things even more unpleasant. She just continued to cast her eyes down and hold her hands. I hope there's nothing wrong, Emma. Adam asked her, which made Emma's heart almost leap from its place. She had never felt this awkward before. No, there isn't. It's just. I'm a little tired lately. She tried to find a reason for her not speaking much. Well, I'm going to check to see why our tea is late, said Mrs. Durkin as she walked out the door to Emma's great surprise as her mother just committed something exceedingly inappropriate with this. If anyone were to find out that she had left her daughter alone with her suitor even for a brief time, she would be scandalized for it. Emma felt extremely uncomfortable now, but she knew that the opportunity was now here, 
and she must tell Adam what she feels, and the sooner the better. Adam, Emma began. I don't want to hurt you, but I don't want to foster unrealistic dreams in you. Emma was searching for the right words, but at least she had started. Emma. Adam said surprised and didn't understand what Emma was trying to say. I'm sorry, but. I can't do this. Don't court me anymore, Emma said relieved as she said this with honesty as to how she feels, but was also afraid of Adam's reaction. But why Emma? Adam sat still not understanding. This is so hard to explain, but, please don't be upset with me. I'm not ready for a marriage like this, Emma shared, but what she didn't want to say was that the reason for it was love. That's the reason for everything because this is the most important thing in Emma's life. In the end, Adam would just laugh at her or be very offended that Emma didn't feel love towards him. I understand, sighed Adam sadly. Please don't be upset with me, as Emma waited for his forgiveness and pleading in desperation because it was such a terrible feeling to hurt someone like this. I'm not upset, Adam answered quietly as he stood up from the couch just as Mrs. Durkin arrived back in the room. The tea will be here shortly. Are you getting ready to leave already? Mrs. Durkin asked in amazement. Mrs. Durkin, thank you for your hospitality, but unfortunately, I have to leave now, said Adam as he walked out the door. Oh, all right, I'm so sorry, Mrs. Durkin acknowledged Adam's determined reply though confused. Emma lapsed into shock and immediately regretted what she had said. She would have preferred to take her words back. She could barely hold back crying in front of her mother. She wouldn't have wanted for her to find out that it was Emma in reality who sent him away but she couldn't seem to hold it in any longer and now felt that she had made a big mistake. She needed some consolation to know that all is not lost, and this won't ruin her life because at the moment, that is unfortunately how she felt. What happened Emma? A worried Mrs. Durkin asked. I sent him away, said Emma while tears were rolling down her face. You did what? Mrs. Durkin was very disappointed and ran out of the room crying. The fact was that what Emma really needed right now was someone to give her some strength because things are working out worse for her. But her mother doesn't understand her either, in fact, she looks at her in an accusatory way not caring about her desires and would never support her in the way she imagined things. Maybe Mrs. Durkin is right, and now she ruined everything. She can't fix this now. She's destroyed everything. No Alex, no Adam. And no matter that she's thought it through a hundred times, she wasn't at all certain that even if she were to apologize to Adam and Adam were to forgive her, that she would be capable of marrying without love. And so, this is how days, weeks, and months passed. She wondered if she made the right decision. What will happen now? But nothing happened. Emma almost went crazy from all the thoughts swirling around in her head. She was still debating whether she would regret what she did or if it would be worthwhile to remedy what she ruined. What should she do? Should she move forward, but how? Time went by so slowly. Emptiness, loneliness, boredom, these were Emma's alternative emotions. She was bitter. She was completely weary of all this nothingness, and all she did was grumble all day. With the nearing of fall, Mary was feverishly getting ready for St. Helens and was packing her suitcases. Emma watched her with envy as Mary could barely contain herself for being so happy while she was trying on her new dresses. What are you so happy about, Mary? Once you see Miss Bird, you won't feel so joyful. Emma said mischievously. What's the matter, Emma? Are you perhaps jealous that I might meet a good-looking and rich man at the ball who will ask me to marry him, and I will get married before you do. Mary said mocking her. Don't be ridiculous. Emma shot back arrogantly. Girls! exclaimed Mrs. Durkin. Emma! I don't even recognize you. You should be ashamed of yourself. A true lady never behaves this way, continued Mrs. Durkin, but Emma was already leaving the room. That's right, Emma. 
Mary cried out after her brazenly, which made Emma all the more upset, and loudly slammed the door to her room behind her. These were difficult days and Emma couldn't find joy in anything. She always thought that the one thing that brought joy could only be true love. But until that day comes, she didn't really know how she would be able to bear it. She was also afraid that true love would never come her way, and then how would she ever be happy? She didn't know what to do, and how to occupy her time. With the arrival of an unexpected letter, it seemed as if it may change everything. Mrs. Durkin rushed to Emma's room with the envelope in her hand. Emma! Can you believe it? Mrs. Durkin came in excitedly. Do you remember that French woman at Anita's wedding? Yes, replied Emma as she became quite curious. Anita's parents just wrote saying they were in Paris last month, and their acquaintances asked if you would like to be a governess. A quite wealthy and noble family is looking for a foreign governess for their daughters. As Mrs. Durkin is glancing exasperatedly at the letter she continues. She writes that Charlotte and Anne are 14 and 15 years old. Aren't you glad? But me. Emma was at once excited, but as always, she was scared. She dreaded jumping into the unknown. I can't teach. And my French. So far away. She listed all the cons Mrs. Durkin was very irritated by Emma's uncertainty and that she was hesitating. Emma. This is a good opportunity. You would be around aristocrats, you could build relationships, make friends, and attend luxurious balls. Mrs. Durkin said encouraging Emma. But, I'm scared. Emma said getting cold feet. Fine. Then don't go. Mrs. Durkin said as she angrily left the room. Emma was very surprised that her mother gave up so quickly. It wasn't like her in matters this important. She usually prodded her until Emma would give in. She was very embarrassed by her cowardliness. Here is the opportunity. Something has finally happened that she has been waiting for so long. Up until now, she wished if only something would happen and if only her life weren't so boring. Now she wishes instead that everything would remain as it was. But she knew, that this really can't go on, that she has to find the strength from within and take advantage of the opportunity if she wants this awful monotony to change. If she won't do anything, nothing will change and that would be even harder for her to take. Although she had no idea how this will make her happier, she knew that she can't sit and do nothing any longer. She can't fathom how this will bring her closer to finding love, and this is certainly not how she imagined her life, but she now believed that she must go. Yes, she's made the decision and has determined that she will go to Paris to be a governess. The new year holds new opportunities. After the holidays, Emma is fearful as she begins her journey to Paris, and her fear is as great as long ago when she arrived at St. Helens. She didn't know now what was waiting for her and why she is even going as her longings aren't driving her in this direction. Love is the only thing that could make her happy. After a long trip, Emma arrived in her new home where a very cold atmosphere greeted her. Emma was very dizzy from the endless train ride and she was quite exhausted as well. As she walked in the door, her drowsiness made her trip on the threshold and she almost fell flat on her face. What an entrance! The gentlemen and lady of the house were already there waiting for her. The girls were watching from the gallery upstairs. Unblinking, unfriendly faces greeted her and after the cool and measured welcome they gave her, they left which really amazed Emma. The servant escorted her up to her room and helped carry her bags up. But she didn't get any more kindness from the servant, either. The interior appointments of the palace sitting on the banks of the Seine were awe-inspiring. It was full of antique furniture, but lacking in the feeling of a home. It was like a museum. That notwithstanding, Emma liked these old pieces of furniture very much and her thoughts always wandered if she saw one of these pieces wondering what its history was and who used it. One of the bureaus was made during the Sun King, Louis XIV of France's time. Emma just admired and marveled. What she liked best was looking at the family picture gallery and she took a long time looking particularly at the women's pictures. 
she was very interested in the family's history, too, and the legends told about them, as it looks back on an important past, namely this last family tree branch of the famous Montmorency family whose first French baron coat of arms dates back to 1327. Emma was completely spellbound by the family's past, and she was starting to feel she was first class. She realized that this must be how a servant feels when they're around the master of the house. She was impressed that she ended up around a family like this who were the most influential people in France after the emperor, but on the other hand, she couldn't really find her place. She wasn't really able to carve an informal human relationship with anyone among them. It seemed impossible, like a subject to a king. Not only that, but they seemed like such strange, closed off and cold people. The master of the house never had a word to say all day, and when he came home, he shut himself in his study where there were mass amounts of books, even on the floor. He would light a cigar and the smoke emanating out of the room was so great even reaching the hallway, that Emma always knew from this when the master of the house was home. But he never spoke to anyone all day. Emma had never met anyone with a cooler disposition than the lady of the house. She had a governess also that escorted her everywhere, but they never exchanged more than a couple of words, and those were only instructions rather than conversation. She wasn't particularly interested in anything whether she was sitting in the sitting room, staring out the window, reading a book or doing embroidery on something which she didn't have much patience for and did that more infrequently. A very unfriendly and gloomy air ruled the house. Never a kind word, smile, and never any laughter. Emma often cried herself to sleep. She was so unaccustomed to a place like this, and these people, who cared nothing about her being there. It troubled her greatly that she would not be able to forge an intimate friendship with anyone which would have made her being here somewhat easier. She was completely on her own and she was alone, like someone they had excluded. And on top of all that, she didn't get along with the girls very well, either. They were spoiled, conceited and in addition to that, they were merciless girls who didn't particularly want to listen to her and often laughed at her lack of French which made Emma feel terrible. She knew her French needed more work and this made her even more lacking in courage. She didn't get along with them and actually didn't really feel much like teaching. The only time she really felt a bit more alive and cheerful was when she would accompany the lady of the house and the girls to the newly opened department store to buy dresses. She liked browsing through dresses where one was more beautiful than the next, and admiring them, but it pained her to know that she could not afford these. Emma was very excitedly waiting for one of the biggest events of the spring, when the family organizes a luxurious ball for some of France's most influential people, especially given that for months on end, her days were filled with nothing but emptiness and despair. Every day she thought of escaping back home from here, but then she always came to the realization that if she were to go home, she would only run away claiming defeat. Nothing can happen for her at home, just the passing of time, and her youthful years would fly by without anything happening in her life. After a long time, she finally received a letter. Hurrying to her room, she cried as she opened the letter from her younger sister Mary. She was so homesick and her home seemed so very far away, and she so longed for closeness with people, the warmth of family, friends, to finally be able to talk with someone because at the moment, she is surrounded by people who are very distant and are light years from her world. It was as if she were on another planet, as if her home and her old friends were just an imaginary dream. By the time she got to the end of Mary's letter, she was sobbing. Things that had been so far away from her and so unreachable, were now once again real. In her letter, Mary complained a lot about how strict Miss Bert was which made Emma smile. After all this time that has passed, even that looks better now in retrospect. She read in amazement that her silly sister now envies her being here in the fashion capital and in the company of the sophisticated French. But Emma only shook her head, because her sister can't really know yet what it's like to be alone and so far from home in a foreign country and in such a cold environment. She can't possibly imagine. She's just quizzing her about fashion, dresses, and everything that is French. 
Emma was pacing back and forth in her room with Mary's letter pressed close to her chest. She was very upset by it and she wanted nothing more than to run home, but then she would be very embarrassed in front of everyone at home, and her sister wouldn't be as impressed with her as she is now. Instead, she will draw strength from it for the hard times in coming days, and if she has a bad day, she'll take the letter out. Preparations for the ball helped her to be less upset and made her forget her homesickness for a little while although she found it exhausting as the girls were very picky, and she had to take them loads of dresses and help them try on the dresses until they found the right ones. The balls here started a little bit later. Instead of 9 o'clock, they started at 10 o'clock. The servant guided guests to their places, escorted them into the ballroom after taking their coats, and gave the ladies the dance cards. Following the end of the first dance round was a seven-course dinner. In line with French customs, there were cold hors d'oeuvres, soup, after which there were delicious baked meats, poultry and game. Frankly, it wasn't appropriate for a lady to get full and the tight corset wouldn't have allowed it. Emma was also nervous about the fact that she didn't know anyone, and she couldn't just introduce herself because it was also the custom here that either an acquaintance or the ball's organizers introduce you. She actually had heard that the French use all sorts of tricks to get around these strict rules, and the girls are able to flirt and dazzle in a way that isn't readily apparent. Even though Emma took time to rest in the afternoon so she wouldn't be tired and would be able to stay up at the ball, she was already exhausted by the time the first guests arrived. First among the guests to arrive was the much respected and very influential uncle, Eugene Montmorency. If Emma understood correctly, he was Monsieur Montmorency's father's brother. He was older, around 45 years old. Emma found him to be old although he wasn't at all old looking, in fact, quite the opposite. Other than this, he was known to be quite the skirt chaser since he became widowed five years earlier. Emma was just escorting the girls down the stairs into the sitting room when he walked in the door, and she caught a glimpse of this older prestigious man. He seemed old to Emma, and that's why she didn't pay him much attention, but there was no way around an introduction, especially since this older Monsieur Montmorency seemed to be a very open and inquisitive personality. Let me introduce the girl's governess, said Madame Montmorency as Emma reached the bottom of the stairs with the girls. You didn't even mention that such a young and pretty girl is your guest. Eugene joked. Actually she's been here for some time now. This just shows that you travel too much and neglect your family, said Madame Montmorency reproachfully. Well, I won't from now on. Eugene said deliberately. But Emma didn't like this compliment at all, and she couldn't even muster a smile. It seems she has been here far too long as too much of this French indifference has rubbed off on her, and in any event, she didn't want to be nice to him. She would have liked to escape from the conversation as quickly as possible, and was waiting for the ball to begin. She was hoping that perhaps she would find herself a French gentleman who would finally rescue her from this horrible place. An hour later, the ballroom was teeming with guests. Emma didn't even know where to look. The ladies' dresses and hair accessories were simply stunning. Emma found it shocking what a hit this Eugene was around women. As he passed by a table, she heard them whispering about him. Emma was very much hoping she could meet a young man, but as more time passed, she had to admit that she wasn't being noticed by anyone, given the reason she was here was to keep an eye on Charlotte and Anne who could hardly wait to be asked to dance. She was just beginning to feel quite sad when Eugene Montmorency walked over to her and very politely asked how she was doing. Emma was quite frightened, but very much appreciated the gesture. Their conversation was short as Emma's French was still not perfect, and in any case, she wasn't one for words. But this wasn't just because Emma was so shy, but because she didn't really want to be in the company of such an older man. Eugene's presence was rather awkward for her. He was already a wiser and experienced person, while she was still a shy and silly girl, and she didn't want him laughing at her. Suddenly, Emma noticed a beautiful young girl in the crowd on the dance floor. She had very pretty porcelain-like white skin, a pretty narrow nose, thick red lips, 
and shining long brown hair. An amazing beauty. She was the most beautiful girl that Emma had ever seen in her life. Charlotte, Emma said quietly. Who is that girl over there? She asked while looking at the girl. She's Carmen Montmorency, our cousin, and as Charlotte replied, Carmen was already making her way towards them smiling. Charlotte. Anne. I'm happy to see you. How you've grown. You're already young ladies. Carmen greeted them. Thank you, Carmen. You're so beautiful, said Charlotte who was completely awed by Carmen. And the lady. Carmen looked at Emma. Oh, yes, she's our governess, Emma. She came from very far away. I'm so happy. Do you like Paris? Carmen asked. Yes, it's a beautiful place, Emma answered with only a few words. Generally this is what happens when she meets strangers. She has a hard time opening up particularly if she has to talk to a good-looking young man, but in this case she feels that Carmen is so beautiful, that it's simply such an honor that she noticed Emma and is talking with her. Emma didn't know what this feeling was, but Carmen was to her like a celebrated actress was to others. Yes, it's beautiful to a point, but it's gotten rather boring. And there are more elderly people everywhere. I'm so happy to have met a girl my age. As a married woman, my place is among respected wives. Terrible. You've made me curious. You could tell me about how things are going in your country. I'd like to invite you to my house. I hope you'll come, Carmen said by way of invitation. Oh, of course. I'd love to. Emma said immediately. She was very happy for the invitation because she found herself facing the same problem. It was hard finding company and she could hardly wait to get to know Carmen better. The ball lasted a long time, but Emma was anxious for it to end. As usual, she started to get dizzy from exhaustion and almost spilled wine on herself. She didn't find the French men attractive, either. Even the younger ones had such a serious nature about them which Emma always found unattractive, and she found it uncomfortable being around these kind of people. It was as if she was too young for them. She had a difficult time finding things in common with them, as was the case with most strangers, too. After the ball, Emma thought a great deal about her future, how hard it was for her to open up and to find new friends. Carmen is just as young and she's already married. Emma, on the other hand, couldn't even imagine herself finding someone. She was getting more afraid that she was going to end up alone and that there wouldn't be anyone who would truly get to know her hidden true worth and that would want to marry her. The other side of the coin was whether she would be able to marry anyone without love. It's possible that she will never receive any more marriage proposals. She wasn't only afraid now that what she longed for the most she would never have, but also that she would end up being completely alone. If she stays as shy as she is, she will be unable to meet anyone. One day, Madame Montmorency stepped into Emma's room, which she had never done before. Emma was very curious as to what she wanted. Get packed Emma. You're leaving today to go visit Carmen de Montmorency as she has invited you, Madame shared the news with her. Emma was happy that finally there was something to snap her out of this melancholy and something is changing, and she hoped it was a change for the better. She did think Carmen's curiosity towards her it a bit odd. She didn't understand what was so interesting about her other than they were both the same age and that she had come from abroad. Emma thought of herself as a quiet girl who wasn't much fun, but she was a good listener. Actually, she was quite curious about Carmen who could behave like a real mature woman in spite of her young age. Next to her, Emma was just a shy little girl. Fortunately, Carmen's mansion was only half a day's trip from Paris during which she was able to admire the landscape. When she arrived, Emma noticed that Carmen had indeed succeeded in marrying well. The garden was gorgeous as was the building. Carmen was already waiting for Emma in the drawing room who awkwardly sat across from her. Your home is beautiful. Thank you for the invitation, Emma started. Yes, it is beautiful. I was fortunate. 
My husband inherited quite a lot, Carmen revealed. Wouldn't you like to get married yet, Emma? She asked the dumbfounding question. I would like to at some point, replied Emma feeling scared. I was 18 when they led me to the altar. And have you had a suitor? Carmen asked further. There was, but I didn't want to marry him, Emma answered honestly. Why? Wasn't he wealthy enough? No, it was just that I wasn't ready for it. I was in love with someone else. Oh, love. Carmen giggled at which Emma became embarrassed. I understand. Love isn't easy. I did it the other way around, as she continued to laugh. How is that? Emma inquired. First, I got married, then came love. My husband is ten years older. He's very influential and well-regarded. The best that a woman could want. I resigned myself to it, I got used to marriage, and then two years later, love entered my life, Carmen said while thinking. We can only meet in secret and very rarely. But what more could I want? I can never be his wife, but that's all right. It's fine this way. This is what everyone does. My husband has had so many lovers, even before me. Now he's older and he doesn't care about love, but I do, smiled Carmen. Emma was speechless. Sitting in an armchair, she listened to Carmen's scandalous speech. The problem wasn't that Carmen thought this way, but that she actually told her about it. Emma didn't think this was right. She would never reveal something like this. At the most, maybe to a very close friend, but not to a virtual stranger who she wasn't sure she could trust. I heard your country is in the middle of some dangerous battles in the colonies, as Carmen changed the subject. I don't really follow events like that too closely. I don't like war, replied Emma shyly, and it embarrassed her a bit that she wasn't more informed on the subject. Oh, I loathe it, too. It's just that my husband, who is a high-ranked officer, is always talking about this. Honestly, he talks of nothing else. Although Emma was a bit shocked at what she had heard, but at the same time, she was utterly impressed by Carmen's self-confidence and brazenness, and she was envious of it. They were the same age, and yet, she felt like a naive little girl and felt insignificant next to her. Somehow she would like to find the way between the shy and meek virgin girl, and the secretive destined woman. If only she knew how, how does she do it? She'll watch Carmen or she'll ask her, if only she'll be brave enough to do it. Emma tossed and turned all night not having slept a wink, and so she was very tired when she got up in the morning. She could already tell at breakfast that it wasn't going to go well, as she became dizzy and not feeling well again from being so tired. What made things worse was that she found herself in a completely strange place and couldn't just go rest. That was why Emma was even more quiet than usual during breakfast, and was concentrating hard on not spilling anything. But Carmen was in very good spirits and upbeat as always. Emma, we're leaving right after breakfast. I have to buy a dress because we're going to the opera tonight. You do like the opera, don't you? Oh, yes. Definitely. Emma exclaimed in her own reserved way. I'm curious about this Wagner, though to be honest, I haven't heard much that is good about his music more about his love life. Last time when he was staying at the Montmorency estate, he got involved in an affair with Eugene Lossot's wife of Bordeaux. They almost divorced because of it. There was a huge scandal and the gendarmerie had to get involved, Carmen enthusiastically related the gossip. Well, this is Paris. Emma was amazed as she reflected on what she heard. Emma felt so different and distant from this world. She longed for nothing in her life other than love, but neither before Alex nor after Alex, not including the brief infatuation she felt for Tom Hart, she had not met anyone she could have such a passionate relationship with. Others fall from one love to another, and people don't even care if they are ridiculed for it. Emma felt as if she were in another galaxy where she is the only one different from the rest, and she couldn't be like that. She can't get used to the new situation. 
She felt bad because of this and was certain that the fault lay within her, but still, she didn't know what to do. She wouldn't be true to herself. Carmen was shopping the whole day in all of Paris's stores in the pedestrian zone. She went in every shop and found something in every place that she just had to buy. Emma was shopping for herself now as well. She found an attractive hat that she really liked and that looked good on her. She enjoyed the shopping, but she got more and more tired and could hardly wait for the day to end. In addition, since the servants' hands were full with all of Carmen's newly purchased dresses, Emma ended up having to carry things. Although Emma offered to help out of courtesy, she felt the situation was a bit humiliating, and was beginning to think that Carmen was taking advantage of her respectfulness. And she was putting a bit of pressure on her, too. Truthfully, she ended up having to buy a certain dress because Carmen was being so adamant and Emma didn't know how to handle her pompousness. She didn't like situations like this. People think that just because someone doesn't say much and is quiet, that they don't necessarily have a definite way of thinking or have an opinion. She simply didn't know how to make Carmen understand that she didn't want to buy the dress because the word no was just not enough. She didn't have the nerve to address her in a more rough tone, not just because she was a lady of nobility, but because Emma would never be capable of talking to someone in that way, nor in an abrasive manner. So, Emma gave in by buying the dress, which actually accentuated her attractive figure very well, though she was squirming a bit in it as it was so uncomfortable that she couldn't wait to take it off. On top of all that, she has to wear this dress to the opera later in the evening. Emma enjoyed Carmen's company, but also didn't. Sometimes she felt like she used to next to Susie so long ago, but just like in the past, she wasn't able to overcome the problem. She didn't know how to handle her oppressors. Somehow they always seemed to find her. As soon as they got home, Carmen feverishly started getting ready. She was very nervous. Three maids were running around helping her. Your skin is so beautiful. What do you use to take care of it? Emma asked. What every French woman uses, even Marie Antoinette. Two teaspoons of cognac, one teaspoon powdered milk, one egg white, and the juice of one lemon. Well, I'll use that, too, said Emma while one of the chambermaids started combing her hair to begin fixing the crown of her hair for the evening. Don't let me forget to take my fan unlike the last time. That is a very important accessory. Are you familiar with the language of the fan, Emma? Emma could barely stand on her feet by the time they arrived at the opera house that evening, and her dress wasn't too comfortable either with its tight style. Carmen though, was anxiously searching in the crowd. There's Emmanuel. Carmen exclaimed joyfully as she feverishly fanned herself with her fan. It became more clear to Emma that Carmen was using her to protect her good name and for her to accompany her sometimes on a shopping excursion. But it didn't particularly bother Emma that Carmen was using her for this, because she really didn't want to go back to being a governess in that awful haunted house. And perhaps this way, if she goes out frequently with Carmen, she would have more opportunity to meet someone. Two good-looking young gentlemen were coming their way. The French aloofness and arrogance was still so foreign to Emma. These two were the same sort of vehicle gentlemen. Ladies, could we escort you to your places? Asked one of them as they politely bowed. Oh, but of course. Thank you, said Carmen and immediately put her arm through the gentleman's arm. Emma just smiled at the other man who stretched out his hand toward her. He was very good looking and she was so excited that maybe finally she might be able to meet a mate and perhaps it could be him. Maybe they could get to know each other and they would like each other, and then something would begin to take shape. She started to gain confidence which grew on her. She wasn't able to say much of anything because of her excitement. She was starting to have big plans and weaving dreams, but unfortunately, didn't really know what to do with the situation at hand. As they were walking down the stairs looking for their seats, Emma was so dizzy from the exhaustion of the day as well as all the excitement, that she missed a step and turned her ankle and would have fallen if she had not quickly grabbed onto her escort. 
Emma felt very awkward and was embarrassed by her clumsiness, which Carmen's giggling didn't help. But she saw that the two young men were amused by her accident. The young lady is embarrassed, said Emma's rescuer smiling. She was indeed very embarrassed, but tried to hide it with her not too genuine smile. She took her seat in a chair while holding back tears. It can't be much worse than this. She has to face the fact that this just isn't meant to be for her. How in the world could she find a suitor this way? It's about time she forgot this foolishness, because it seems, this is her fate. She was thinking about all of this during the entire opera performance. No matter how much she wanted to, getting married was not going to happen for her. Nobody wants a girl like her who is so clumsy and quiet, and where would she ever find someone who would accept her and love her the way she is? Especially not a genuinely romantic and noble knight who is every woman's dream and who is Emma's dream. But this will remain just a dream because even if she were to meet a man such as this, she would no doubt ruin the whole thing and let an opportunity pass her by. This searching for love is completely hopeless. And Wagner's opera is just awful, and Emma didn't like it much at all. In the meantime, she noticed that Carmen, who was sitting next to her, was winking now and then at Emmanuel in a flirtatious manner. She was envious of them. How lucky they were that they both felt a passionate love for one another. She couldn't imagine how happy they must be now, and she will never know what this kind of happiness is like, notwithstanding the fact that there is nothing she would like more than to experience this. And on top of everything else, she felt very ill at ease with what had happened in front of so many people almost falling down. Anyone who saw it will surely now be gossiping about it. What an embarrassment. She was kicking herself wondering how she could be so pathetic and ridiculous, she didn't even know the gentleman's name yet, and there she was already thinking about their wedding. The turning of her ankle was perhaps a warning from the heavens that first, she should at least know the person's name, before she thinks of marrying him. Emma could barely sit through the performance and at the end of it, an acquaintance walked over to them. Oh, Eugene. I'm happy to see you again. One is always happy to see a relative, isn't that right? Carmen amiably greeted Eugene de Montmorency. I'm happy too, ladies. Truly, it's always a pleasure meeting with relatives and with a beautiful woman, too. Eugene said flattering the ladies. I happened to see that you had a little accident. I hope you didn't hurt yourself. Oh, thank you. You're very kind. Fortunately, I didn't hurt myself. I'm so clumsy, Emma said shyly, but she really appreciated Eugene's thoughtfulness which she had not counted on. Thus far, she had received more kindness from him than anyone in all of France. Of all the people she had met so far, he was the only one in whom she had discovered any human warmth. If all of you would allow me, may I take you home? As Eugene offered his carriage. Of course we accept. Carmen exclaimed once in the carriage, Emma was so exhausted that she fell asleep. She was pleasantly surprised at the informality with which she was able to chat with Eugene Montmorency, as if with a friend. She found him to be a very kind man, but she didn't understand why he was so interested in her. Maybe he was just laughing at her, or maybe he actually likes her. She had to admit that after an evening like this, it would feel great to Emma to know that there is a man who is capable of accepting her in spite of all her clumsiness. She now realized how rare this was to be liked even if you're not perfect like the gentle ladies that she was educated to be. How are the colony wars back home, Emma? Eugene inquired. The truth is, it's been a long time since I heard news about this. I haven't received any letters from back home in some time, Emma apologized and could hardly wait to finally lay in her bed and not have to talk about things to do with the war. Last I heard, there was quite a bit of trouble with the locals revolting, and they're quite strong so they had to provide more military force. It's possible that in the end they'll lose the whole colony. Oh, Eugene, before I forget, I planned a picnic with Emma for tomorrow. Please join us. Carmen cut in luckily for Emma, who could barely keep her eyes open. 
I would be happy to accept the invitation, said Eugene. Emma slept so soundly and so long the following morning that when she awoke, not only was her breakfast already sitting next to her bed getting cold waiting for her, but also a letter that she was happy about, and even more so, when she saw that it was from Clara. Curiosity was driving her crazy to see what she had written. Hi Emma, I hope you're enjoying yourself in France. It's been so long since I've heard from you. It would be so great to get together again. There are so many things I want to tell you about. First of all, I have good news, actually two pieces of news. The smaller bit of news is that I found a very effective diet and I've been successful in losing weight. You could say that I'm almost attractive, though not entirely. The other news you won't believe. I'm engaged. Oh, Emma, I'm so happy. I met him at Esther's wedding. He's her husband's good friend and business partner. He's actually a lawyer and comes from a very good family, although you know that this doesn't concern me all that much. So, everything is perfect even though I had given up on this many times. I heard about Susie, too. She finally married Brad. They say she's become good friends with the Countess and they spread ill-intentioned gossip about everyone, but the word going around about her is that she is having an illicit affair with the factory owner. Poor Brad is head over heels in love with her and Susie is leading him around by the nose. I hope all is going well with you. Right soon. Love, Clara Emma struggled to hold back her tears. As she read Clara's letter, feelings were churning around within her. She was happy for Clara's good news, but also envious. She felt sorry for Brad and was angry with Susie. But at least she had a little taste from home that can stick with her while she is far away in a foreign place. She didn't want to feel this way, in fact, she would never want to wish ill on anyone, but she didn't understand why nothing good happens for her, why can't she get what she so longs for? What is she doing wrong? Why does it happen for others? These questions kept popping up within her again and again. These things that come so naturally to others bypass her. She'd like to reply to Clara, but doesn't know what she could tell her. She feels so at a loss with things not working out for her and has no idea what direction her life is heading. She doesn't feel at ease with where she is now and can't even remember the last time she was happy. But she doesn't know what to do because she just feels that the one and only way out of this undesired situation for her is love. Because without it, no matter where she might go, she would never find her place anywhere. Coming to this conclusion saddened her, because it very much looks like she can't have what she would like. Waiting and surrendering to the given situation isn't going to work in her life. For some reason, this is her punishment. It was a beautiful sunny summer day with a light breeze blowing. Carmen and Emma found themselves in a clearing on the side of the woods in an ideal spot for a picnic. Arriving a little late in joining them was the older but always charming and very kind Eugene de Montmorency. From a distance, his build was still quite attractive like a young man, and the sign of his aging was only evident by his graying facial stubble and around his temples, which actually was an advantage for him. To Emma's great surprise, the three of them spent a very pleasant afternoon. They were very impressed with Eugene's adventures traveling around the world, and listened to him with genuine interest. This was the first day that she spent really enjoying herself. This was because she had finally found a person in whose presence she wasn't embarrassed or self-conscious, which was more than likely due to his age and certainly his calm nature. He had a calming effect on Emma and he gave her a sense of security which she would not have in the company of a younger man. Emma finally felt free and didn't at all feel the urge to be demure, or to be someone she wasn't, and her tongue actually loosened up. She talked a lot about her home and her school. They laughed a lot, although Eugene didn't have a huge sense of humor as he was almost too kind-hearted, and he was too much of a gentleman to laugh at others. But Carmen made up for him. Thanks to her they weren't lacking in scandalous stories. Emma was laughing hard once again as she used to do in the past when she was with Anita and Alex, but that was so long ago. Eugene paid attention to Emma's every single word with a smile, 
not being able to take his eyes off her, as if being totally enchanted. At first, this bothered Emma, but then she was impressed by that. Carmen also quickly noticed Eugene's feeling of adoration toward Emma. This is why when they started off for a walk, she always hurried ahead of them so they could talk amongst themselves. As a genuine French gentleman, Eugene used this time and didn't prevaricate much. Emma, you are so beautiful, a true beauty and so natural, began Eugene. Oh, thank you. Emma blushed profusely and was very embarrassed. No you aren't even aware of this. I am 46 years old and I've experienced many things to this point, but I have never met such a pure and delicate beauty. Thank you for the compliment. Emma felt very awkward at this point. You are the most perfect woman. Besides the fact that you are beautiful, kind, and have your heart in the right place, you are so lovable. Eugene continued. Emma was speechless as they walked quietly side by side while she kept her eyes downcast looking at the ground the whole time. I really enjoy being with you. Do you feel the same? Asked Eugene. Yes, me too. Emma blushed even harder and could not believe that she said such a thing to a man. I would like to ask for your hand in marriage, Emma, Eugene posed the question. What? Emma still couldn't find the right words. Or do you think that I should first speak with your father? I don't even know. Emma stammered. Come here. Look at how many swans there are at the lake. Carmen exclaimed cutting in as she enthusiastically hurried over to them. I have to get going ladies. I'm leaving on a business trip tomorrow. Thank you for your hospitality, Eugene said in farewell. Emma, think about what I said. I'm coming back in a month and you can wait until then to give me an answer, he said to Emma. And with that he left. All right. Have a good trip. Emma said by way of farewell, and could hardly wait for Eugene to finally leave so she could recover from the shock. Well, don't tell me he asked you to marry him. Carmen asked elated. Yes, he did. Emma answered modestly. This is wonderful news. Do you know how lucky you are? He's influential and wealthy. Carmen said rejoicing. And what are you going to say? She asked with uncertainty. I don't know yet, Emma replied confused. What? Are you kidding? Do you have any idea what an opportunity this is? Carmen chided her. But what about love? Emma continued unsure. Emma until you become a real woman, love won't find you. You have to mature for that and become a woman, and you can only become a real woman by a man's side. You can be that at Eugene's side, and you will find who you are as a person at his side. You are very fortunate. Eugene is a good person. Carmen said trying to win her over. Emma did nothing else for a whole month but list the pros and cons. She also thought about what Carmen had said. Pros and cons aside, this may be her last chance to get married, and not only that, but she wouldn't be marrying just anyone. She decided that she wouldn't wait any longer for love. She was very scared, but she has to say yes. She's going to say yes, there are no more excuses. She has to make peace with her fate, and she has to accept that life doesn't work the way she had imagined. She knew this logically, but her heart didn't. Her heart was too innocent and naive for this rigid reality. One month later, she became Eugene's wife. It was a wedding with only close friends and relatives held in the chapel on the family estate. Only Emma's parents and a few members of the Montmorency family were present. She felt as if she were at a funeral service. She had a hard time making peace with the situation. She felt as though she had rushed things and should have waited for love. Standing in front of the altar she felt that she had made a big mistake. She dreaded the unknown, and just like all changes, she had difficulty with this. She could barely choke back the tears and was shrouded in self-pity. She was resentful toward the whole world, very agitated and angry that it didn't come together for her. She simply couldn't make peace with the situation. 
she plummeted into lethargy and couldn't handle the fact that reality was this rigid and that there is no romance in it. Real life is so far removed from her world. But Eugene handled the situation as a wise and mature man, he was patient. While Emma was constantly crying during the first months of their marriage, he showered her with gifts. But this wasn't the key to Emma, although she did begin to feel better from day to day. If it would help you, feel free to go to tomorrow night's carnival ball with Carmen, her husband offered. Buy some new dresses, Eugene prodded Emma. Since she married, she fell into total self-pity and didn't often step foot outside of their luxurious house. She didn't really find joy in anything. But now she liked her husband's idea and she went shopping with Carmen which she enjoyed more now than at any time before. Not only because her husband was so wealthy that she could have purchased the whole store, but because people finally took notice of her. She was no longer insignificant which she began to gain strength from, and she started to see her situation a bit differently. She has a rich and influential husband who is a good person, and being by his side, she can do whatever she likes. If she thinks about many other women's circumstances who also married without love, but in a much more financially disadvantageous situation with a man who in addition to all this, has a strict nature and smothers them, she can count herself fortunate. She is lucky that she found such a wise man. As Emma realized this, her soul was more at peace and she didn't cry anymore. She started to accept it. She felt sorry for Eugene that perhaps she had hurt him with her foolish behavior, but this made her respect him even more. This bubbling up inside was doing good for her and it was refreshing, especially as everyone bowed out of courtesy and stood aside out of respect as Emma de Montmorency neared them. She felt better about herself than any influential woman in Paris. She attended ball after ball with Carmen, and she herself hosted many balls. This is how she compensated for what she couldn't have, and this became her driving passion, beautiful dresses and balls. Sometimes she even accompanied her husband on business trips which she also very much enjoyed. This is how she finally was able to suppress the constant sense of lacking which caused her so much sadness. But enjoyment of all the dazzle only seemed to last for a while. The magic of all the beautiful dresses and the ball soon dissipate. It's all just superficial enjoyment and Emma knew this, too. At one of the balls, Emma caught a glimpse of a young couple on the dance floor. As she watched them, her heart hurt with the old wounds breaking through, and everything she had tried to bury within her broke apart. They were so happy and so in love and completely oblivious to everything around them. She couldn't take her eyes off them and found herself being very envious once again. But she didn't tear up and didn't cry, hiding her feelings. No one could tell what was going on inside of her. But it was always present, the huge sense of lack, hurt, and emptiness. These were all there inside of her, and she could never figure out how to have control over it in her life. What could she do to finally make it stop? In the meantime, Carmen was enthusiastically making her way over to the daydreaming Emma with the latest gossip. Guess what I saw today on the street? Carmen asked. What? Have you heard of the suffragettes? Heard of what? You know, about voting rights. They're battling for women to have the right to vote. Oh, yes. I've read about them. Now one of them, Hubertine. Hubertine Oaklert, is demonstrating for a tax strike. She's determined that she's not going to pay taxes until she can vote. She's walking the streets of Paris with signs and telling every woman she comes across to support them. Isn't that crazy? Carmen related the story in astonishment. If you ask me, they're not going to get far and they'll only have people laughing at them. How is it that their husbands aren't beating them for this? And I just remembered. Did you hear what a great hero your country is celebrating? No. What kind of hero? In the colonies. They almost lost the war with the locals, but there was a brave young soldier, who took it upon himself to deliver food to the enemy camp in exchange for a peace settlement all by himself. 
Since the locals knew that without donation of food they wouldn't be able to keep going much longer, they were willing to come to an agreement. They couldn't get by on their own anyway. Have you ever been there? Good grief. It's a very backward region. Just awful. There's more. So, this young soldier became a national hero and they have already awarded him with the rank of general. And so young. Now every marriageable girl is dreaming of him. Apparently, he once had a fiancé that he loved very much, but she died and after her death, he became a soldier, and went far away to try to forget. So romantic. Carmen related ecstatically. Yes, very moving. Lucky is the woman who can capture the heart of a man like this. But how can a woman do that? Emma wondered. I don't know. A famous and celebrated movie star is capable of getting anyone. There's Marguerite Bellanger who won over the Emperor, Napoleon III himself. Emma was in a new phase of sorrow in her life. Her husband, Eugene, was ill quite a bit during the winter and this weighed heavily on Emma. She was afraid and sorry for him while at the same time didn't want to lose his steady support. She once again pulled back from being around people, and found her temporary joy in reading. She also read many of the suffragette magazines. More and more, she felt as though she has to do something, too, and she has to find her own way. She secretly gave financial aid to the suffragette women's movement, and when she found out that they put many suffragette protesters in jail, and endured merciless food deprivation, she decided she would pubically stand by the movement, much to the great astonishment of her sophisticated circle. The women wrote many articles and also about the suppression of children, and she even spoke out against this in person at one of the meetings. She became very dedicated toward the cause, listened to many women speak who were in adverse conditions, and cried throughout. She thought that her problems were dwarfed by comparison. She was ashamed that she was so weak and that she was only ever concerned with her own problems. Perhaps she had to experience this in order to appreciate her circumstances, and to better value and accept her fate, she was led in this direction by chance. This road that she must walk, she must also do something. What she was most sensitive to was not only the oppression of women by their husbands, but the children. She dove into charity work with great resolve and enthusiasm, and more and more people recognized her on the street, but people in the artistocratic circles did not look upon this with favor. Emma was glad for her popularity, and it was flattering to her that they liked her. But she also received much criticism, and she had to acknowledge, that publicity comes with envious people saying negative things. It didn't make matters easier that the movement suddenly took a more radical turn and there was too much disorderliness. One group of women regularly broke out store windows and also the faction's windows, and interrupted party gatherings. They didn't consider their demands seriously anymore, and their public nuisance caused many of their supporters to turn away from them. Emma was also disappointed, and didn't know how to lead in these cases, and she certainly didn't know what she could do to not become a victim of gossip. Her husband had become even weaker and she could no longer depend upon his support. Eugene's influence could no longer help in her goals. She felt more and more that she had to admit failure, even though she had finally felt as if she had found her role and this calling would help her get through everything. But after Eugene's death, even this changed and she no longer felt this way. Everything passes and everything changes, and she was still bent on finally finding her place, but she had to admit that nothing lasts for a long time. There is nothing that would make her happy forever. After all this, Emma felt she couldn't stay here and she decided she would leave Paris. She was never truly happy here. She will now do what she really had wanted to do since first arriving here, and she would finally move home. She would find a new way for herself back home. As she had heard that the capital city was now celebrating its jubilee, she thought that before she went home, she would visit the place where almost two decades ago, she stepped through the gates of St. Helens. At first, her heart was bursting with joy when she arrived, as she saw the pedestrian walkway and the old places where it had been so long since she had been there, 
but they still were so alive in her memory as if it had only been last year that she studied here. It was as if she had never left and had only been dreaming, and now she woke up. She found herself in a nostalgic mood recalling friends she missed so much, and the feeling she had back then when she started her studies here, that all kinds of miracles could happen. So many opportunities that were before her that have now passed and were gone. The opportunity for that much coveted great love is past, nothing waits for her anymore. But she still hopes. Emma tried gathering her thoughts and tried to find her new place, her road without love. She believed it would be easier to handle and resign herself to it as an older and mature woman, but sometimes she still fantasized about it. No matter that she is already an adult and well-known, she would have liked for someone to love her just once for who she always truly was, a bashful little girl, who is at a loss for words when she is around the man she loves. This is still the only thing she needs. But she also has to accept the fact that no matter how much she resents herself for this, it's the way she will always be, and she realized that it wasn't her that needs to change and use all kinds of methods of seduction, but it's enough to find the man who will discover the road that leads to her, and will patiently wait until it opens up and will accept her with all her flaws, clumsiness and all. But it may be too late for this. It could be that if she had realized this sooner, and didn't marry Eugene, but would have waited patiently, then true love might have found her. But now it's too late. It doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't matter that she was widowed early, she has no more opportunities. But just like always, it's so hard to resign oneself to this and to accept it. She felt comfortable in her new home. After Mass in church, Emma always smiled to herself as she walked by the St. Helen School. It felt good to her to have people so curious about her. She enjoyed this situation and she liked the fact that she may be their role model. But when she saw Adam again, she became very confused. In spite of struggling against it, the old little girl appeared. Adam, the famous general, the hero, who appeared in her dreams, the one she rejected and broke his heart. He is the man that she always longed for. She so blindly clung to her imagined dreams that she gave neither time or the chance to get to know him better. She rejected him and he escaped, and everywhere she went, she waited for her desires to be fulfilled. She just wasted her years there in a place that she never enjoyed and with people she never really liked. Emma was crushed by what a huge mistake she had made. She could only hope that Adam would forgive her as she would never rest until then. In every occasion in church, she pleaded for Adam's forgiveness, but she couldn't forgive herself. How blind she was and stubborn. She let the opportunity slip by and didn't even notice what was right in front of her nose, what life was offering her because she was unwilling to leave her dream world. Her romantic dreams were exactly what had soured her life and presence. She has to let go of all her dreams, wishes, and in fact, all of her thoughts. She has to live without thoughts and to be in the here and now, to see, feel, and live. In order for Emma to live like this and to enjoy the present, she decided to leave the capital city and return to her hometown. Warmth flooded her heart when she saw the house where she grew up and she felt relief that here she can once again be a young girl. While walking in town and to her huge surprise, Emma ran into Anita and Alex. Well, Emma. You are beautiful. Have you come home? Anita marveled. Emma was surprised seeing Anita and Alex who had gotten a bit older. Alex even had a sizable paunch, but he still had the old charm. Yes, home again. I'm happy we ran into each other. Emma said and who now was not looking for the right words in confusion, but instead because she felt so distant from them and truthfully, didn't know what they could talk about. So many things had happened over so many years, where would she begin? Have dinner with us tomorrow. You have to come, I'm so curious. We heard that you became a suffragette, Anita exclaimed. Yes, a lot of things happened. And with you. Emma asked modestly while being filled with pride. We're fine. We have three boys. We live a quiet life. In any case, 
you just have to come tomorrow. Anita said with a lot of enthusiasm. Yes, come Emma. Alex also chimed in, who until now had been quietly staring. All right, I'll be there, said Emma as she climbed into her carriage. Emma was very happy to determine that she no longer felt anything toward Alex. He had no effect on her whatsoever. Many years had passed by and so many things had changed. Alex could no longer charm her. At the same time, she was happy that she could rekindle the relationship with her old friends, and they will have fun together like they did long ago. Finally, after such a long time, she can once again be in a cozy environment with friends. After a long time such as this, the first meeting is always a little bit awkward, because you're not sure if you have anything to say to the person, but if the friendship is genuine, then you'll find common ground after the first few minutes, and you can continue where you left off. It took Emma a very long time and a lot of suffering before she realized that she would be making her life easier if she accepts, whether she likes it or not, that everyone is where they need to be. If we can't do anything to change our fate, then let's try to enjoy that which we have. Desires and dreams only ruin the whole thing and deceive us. Emma went to her friend's house for dinner in a good mood. It was apparent that Anita and Alex were a little excited and anxious that they had such a noted person as their guest and they wanted to please her. Emma enjoyed all this and it felt good to have her old friends appreciate her, although she didn't really understand why, because deep inside she was still the same young girl they picnicked together with by the lake not so very long ago. Emma was relaxed and enjoyed herself while they chatted sitting around the dining table. I'm so amazed at you, Emma. You were always so brave. Anita said. What? Me. Emma said not comprehending. First you left to go to the capital city to study. Then you had a suitor and you had the courage to say no to him, and then travel all by yourself to a foreign country. I never would have been able to do those things, said Anita. Emma listened to Anita in amazement. She never would have attributed these things to herself such as being brave. It is true, that she did move to the capital city and to France in spite of dreading it, but she didn't at all think of herself as brave. In fact, it was just the opposite when she turned Adam down out of cowardice, because she felt she wasn't as strong as other women in that they were able to marry without being in love. Thank you, Anita. That is nice to hear. It's really nothing. I'm very proud that my girlfriend became such a distinguished lady. Congratulations on the three boys. Motherhood must be a very beautiful thing, as Emma changed subjects. Thank you. It is a beautiful thing, but it's also very, very hard. It comes with a lot of worry and constant anxiety about them behaving properly and that people wouldn't speak poorly of us. And we have to say no to so many things. People like to judge others, Anita revealed. Emma was glad to hear Anita being so honest, but it surprised her to know that she too had unfulfilled desires in her life, which was something she would have never thought of. She always believed Anita to be so fortunate. The thing that every young girl longs for happened quickly for Anita, marrying her love and starting a family. It seems that everyone agonizes over something, it's just that Anita knew how to conceal this well. Have you traveled a lot, Emma? Inquired Anita with curiosity. Yes. I've been to India several times. I've also been to Italy and Greece. Greece is beautiful, but Italy was a bit disappointing. It must have been so beautiful. Where is that turkey? Anita asked getting angry as she rang the bell hard, but there was no answer. Anita stood up and walked out of the room. Emma and Alex remained alone in the room, which Emma wasn't too happy about. The situation was quite intimidating. Awkward silence followed. Up until now, Alex hadn't said anything and just smiled in a low-key way. You're very beautiful, Emma. Alex said and which Emma could hardly believe. Thank you, but it's not appropriate for you to say such a thing, Emma said, paling at Alex's statement. I'm glad that you're here. You know, I always had a special place in my heart for you. 
you're such a lovable, sweet girl. It always fills me with joy to see you. It's good to see you, Alex continued. Thank you, said Emma totally dumbstruck. She didn't know why Alex was saying these things to her and she was angry about it. Your husband was lucky, Alex finished when Anita returned to the room. Oh, I'm so ashamed that we're making you wait like this. Excuse me, Emma, but we have to wait a bit for the turkey, said Anita a little bent out of shape. It's no problem, Anita. I'm not even that hungry, Emma said reassuring her. She was very upset by what Alex had said to her. And she felt sorry for Anita too, that her husband would put her in such a situation. But she finally knew what Alex thought about her which was something she was always curious about. But it doesn't matter anymore. Alex is the past, and this is good closure for Emma. She was glad that it finally came out, but nothing more. This was immense for all the sorrow. She was comforted by the thought that Alex had this opinion of her in spite of the fact that she was never able to show him her true self. It was precisely for this reason, because she wanted to be good enough so badly, because all she longed for was to be loved. In spite of what happened, during dinner Emma was relaxed, but she sensed some anxiety in her friends, particularly Anita. Emma, the truth is that we would like to ask a favor of you, Anita started to ask with some difficulty. Our middle son is about to begin his studies, but the tuition is quite high, and I am more than happy to help. Emma cut in wanting to make Anita's request easier. Alex was looking down intently with his face getting redder. It was clear that he was very ashamed of himself. Emma was thinking, if only she would have seen her great love in a situation like this sooner. Now she felt some pity for Alex. She wouldn't have been able to look at him as a man anymore, even though he had stolen her heart for such a long time, as well as her mind and her whole life. But Emma now felt satisfied. Not only because the people she was so jealous of because of their love long ago are the very ones who are now jealous of her and are amazed by her, but because she can finally handle things. Instead of suffering, she finally chose happiness, because she realized that this was her choice all along, and only ever depended on her. After that evening, Emma woke up feeling freed and cheerful. But she couldn't laze about for too long, because the aged Mrs. Durkin walked into the room with a bit of a frightened look on her face. Emma. You have a visitor. Come down to the drawing room quickly. Mrs. Durkin informed her as Emma nervously jumped out of bed. But who is it? The general, whispered Mrs. Durkin. What? Emma almost fainted when she heard this. Her heart was filled with joy and fear all at the same time and she almost started crying. Emma got dressed in a hurry with the maid's help. She was very excited and her heart felt as if it would jump out. She couldn't even imagine why Adam would come here and what she will say to him. Now she has the chance to finally ask for his forgiveness, and she can only hope that Adam will forgive her. Emma walked into the room with her legs shaking and her voice was barely audible. The man was now standing in front of her. The man who up until now only existed in her dreams. The man who was attractive, successful, and besides all that, he was a gentleman, determined and self-confident. He stood proudly and unblinking, straight and tall with his hands clasped behind his back. His looks demanded attention. There was nothing showing on his face. I hope I'm not bothering you, he said breaking the silence. No, of course not. I'm happy to see you, Emma said with a shaky and quivering voice. I heard that you came back, and I vowed that if you ever came back, that I would give you this letter that I wrote many years ago and that I never mailed you, Adam said as he thought a little. The last time we met you said you weren't ready for marriage. Please, read the letter now. With that, he extended the letter to her and that Emma opened it with shaking hands. Dear Emma, I don't know what this strong pain is that I'm feeling in my chest, but I have felt it from the moment I saw you in the tailor's shop. The calmness and kindness that radiates from you is what my heart needs. My soul is somehow always joyful when it sees you. 
I have never met such a lovable creature as you, and since you say that you are not ready to get married, so I will wait for you until you are ready. I will wait for you, because you are who I need. I remain adoringly yours, Adam Emma read the letter with tears in her eyes, and as usual, could not find any words to say. She was touched, and would never have thought that her girlish self that she was always so upset about, would have such an impact on Adam. She was grateful in her heart and relieved, as if fate was now placating her for all the hurt and pain that she had been carrying until now, and which now broke out of her in sobs. I am not a man of many words, Adam began. I wrote this letter a long time ago before my father died and I joined the military. But I didn't send it because, as he grew quiet for a moment, to be honest, I thought, what if I do find a girl like you, he said as he smiled. I heard that you got married, as he became more serious. And although I tried, I've never had anyone who affected me as you did. That's why I thought it was worth my asking once more if you are now ready to get married. Emma was just gasping for air and wiping away her tears. She could hardly believe her ears, that a man like this that she couldn't even imagine to be more perfect in her dreams, is now standing here before her and telling her that he found no other woman besides her that he would want to marry. Even though he could have anyone, yet he needs her. Emma could not stop sobbing and the words had run out. Adam walked over to her and tightly embraced her. Emma felt great relief and peace which is what she had always longed for. Finally, everything was as it should be. Everything happened the way it was supposed to, and everything is fine just the way it is. Emma is still frightened by the fact that someone who is real is capable of loving her. She had been chasing hopeless love because she really wasn't ready for the real thing until now. Reality is much more beautiful than her dreams. It's just that her time came later than for others. It took a longer time for her to find her place, but that time comes at some point for everyone. She now has her worthy partner that she always wished for and who was always there. But if it hadn't turned out this way, then Adam wouldn't have become a national hero, a flesh-and-blood dream knight in shining armor.